Thank you, councillors. Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions that we make here today. Amen. We acknowledge this country and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as traditional custodians, their language, songs and dance. We pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. May we continue to peacefully walk together in respect and in caring for this country and one another. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open. Are there any apologies? No apologies. Thank you, councillors. Confirmation of minutes, please. Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,666th meeting held on Tuesday 23rd of November 2021 be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the minutes of the 4,666th meeting of Council held on 23 November 2021 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The eyes have it. Councillors, we have uh, two public participants today. Uh, I'd like to call on Dr Jody Clyde-Smith, who will address the Chamber on investing in sporting infrastructure in the uh, West South West Corridor. Thank you, Dr Clyde-Smith. Billy will show you to the chair. You can stand or sit according to your preference. And your five minutes starts when you turn on the microphone there. Thank you. Uh, Mr Chair, Lord Mayor and Councillors, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm here with a, what I hope is going to be a value proposition, which is to grow the synthetic turf facilities for field hockey in the southwest and western corridor of Brisbane. And with that, I hope also to suggest that we look to present a one-stop sporting complex for families in Brisbane in, in this particular region. So field hockey in Australia, there's about 300,000 people playing hockey. It is gender equitable, it is family friendly. There are players from the age of five to 85 playing hockey. And of course, it's also the other thing that's important is income spread. Um, so people, despite incomes, can play hockey across all income ranges. The important thing with hockey is that as you develop in the sport, you need to be able to move onto synthetic turf infrastructure in order to be able to play serious competitive hockey and certainly if you're looking to play at the state uh, commonwealth or olympic sports so it is an olympic sport and of course as you probably know we've got high performance facilities training in australia already over in western australia um, although that's relocating in brisbane we have five and a half thousand people playing hockey we have four synthetic turf facilities in the brisbane lga we have a couple on either side of the lga as well now, what we have is that these synthetic turf facilities are largely in the north and in the east. Southwest United Hockey Club, which is what I'm representing here today, is based in Graceville, so we're in the southwest. And when we want to ask our players from the ages of 12 to 13 to think about playing competitive hockey at the, at the, uh, at the higher levels, we have to ask families to travel from the southwest to the east of Brisbane to be able to train at the State Hockey Centre. So the consequences of that is that we will lose people, we will lose children playing hockey because families can't commit or they can't afford the time or they can't afford the cost of the extra, extra commute. Or they stop playing hockey or they only play it in grass fields. The other one is that they end up playing in the Ipswich competition. So we're losing players from Brisbane to other LGAs. This is an enormous opportunity for us to actually look at growing the sport in, in, in the Southwest Corridor. If we've already got five and a half thousand players, we can certainly get more. The other thing I would say though, is that what we're here today, or what I'm here for today, is to actually look to ask Brisbane City Council to help us identify a site for a synthetic turf facility. Although I'm representing hockey, these fields can actually be used as dual purpose. So they're used for soccer. Um, they can be used to support AFL, rugby, union, uh, lots of other different sports. They can be built on top of car parks, so you're actually max max maximising the footprint of the land in which you're basing something. 
The other thing too is I'm not talking about an Olympic facility. This is not a legacy infrastructure that I'm asking that we look to invest in. What I'm trying to find is a metro facility that we can actually grow this sport. We can look to invest in sports in the southeast Queensland region, that we can look to use infrastructure to grow um, opportunities between other sporting associations in the southeast. The obvious example being Ipswich and Brisbane. So I believe the other thing that we need to be able to do to support families is not to ask them to have to travel all across Brisbane to support their kids during the week training sports. We should be able to offer them dual facilities, the one spot where they can go and they can watch their kids, their three kids, trying to play for soccer, hockey and AFL in the one space. At the moment, we don't do that, we travel everywhere. And what I'd like to be able to suggest is that if we invest in these sorts of things, we're promoting something that actually builds community cohesion, social inclusion, and builds resilient, healthy um, families and communities um, that also leads to well-being. So we have been busy in this space already. We have spent some time talking with councillors who have been enormously supportive of what we're trying to achieve here. And what we'd like to be able to do is work with Brisbane City Council in partnership. We have no issues in finding the funding. Um, I myself am a grants writer, I'm very good at it. Um, we know there are funds for this, we know we can leverage, we've been speaking to state, and we're speaking to federal, we've been speaking to the Brisbane City Divisions. So we would hope that you'd be interested in, in supporting us in this opportunity, um, and we hope that you're interested in being able to achieve a vision of greater sports opportunity, greater inclusion for the southwest and the western corridors of Brisbane. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Your time has just expired, so well done. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, I'd like to respond. Councillor Davis, Chair of Parks. Well, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you so much, Dr Clyde Smith, for coming in. It is very clear you're very passionate about your sport, and I can share with you that my husband, John, has been playing field hockey for about 40 years, so I understand your passion um, for the sport. And uh, I understand that you have seen, uh, had a conversation with a number of our uh, councillors here, uh, including Councillor Hutton and uh, Councillor Adaman, and I think from nodding over there, Councillor Johnston, on this matter. Uh, when it comes to sporting facilities, uh, under my portfolio area, which really looks after the park space, uh, it's, it's a combination effort between uh, really myself and Councillor Howard, where she looks after sporting facilities. But I really do appreciate you coming in with, with a plan and a vision for us to consider in the future. And although you spoke about uh, this facility not being an Olympics uh, facility, um, we're all very excited about the Olympics here and providing um, opportunities for our up-and-coming future Olympians. But of course, that can go across all sports uh, and uh, you know, competing interests for, for, uh, for particular sports in particular areas. Uh, when we normally uh, start to identify uh, areas or, 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 or parkland for the future, it's through the local government infrastructure plan. And what that looks at is the population growth um, of areas so that we can consider putting in infrastructure uh, for, those, uh, for those growing areas. Uh, so that is very much a part of the consideration when we start to look at future parks, uh, which may be uh, or include sporting, sporting facilities. But I really do want to thank you for providing us with your thoughts uh, and your vision. Uh, and um, I look forward to um, maybe seeing you on the north side of Brisbane uh, on one of the hockey fields uh, that, uh, uh, that my husband's uh, hockey club plays on. But thank you so much for coming in. I appreciate it. Thanks, Councillor Davis. Your material is being placed on the desks of councillors, Dr Clyde Smith. Thank you very much. Um, Billy will see you out. Um, we also have speaking today Dr Ronald Gardner, who is outside waiting to come in, uh, who will address the council or the, the chamber on the Brisbane Metro uh, and in particular the Adelaide Street Tunnel Metro buses and Metro vehicles. Thanks, Billy. Thanks, Dr Gardner. You'll have um, five minutes once uh, the microphone's turned on. Um, yep. oh, thank you very much. Oh. 
Ladies and gentlemen, councillors, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. Um, uh, you all have received from me in early November uh, a document. Well, you, you won't have printed it off, I'm sure, unless you've got lots of paper. About 20 page document, which was not only a, a criticism of the Brisbane Metro project, but uh, outlined an alternative which I commend. Uh, very strongly to, to the council. I should mention that I, I've been not exactly friendly towards this project since its inception. Um, as I'm sure the, some of the staff involved will be aware. Um, I, I, I guess most, most disappointingly, let's put it that way, I, I attempted on two occasions earlier this year to get from the project director uh, a summary of the arguments as to why putting a tunnel and its portal into Adelaide Street was a better uh, solution to a problem. The problem doesn't actually exist yet, but it will. Uh, but why is that a better solution than moving the tunnel downstream a little bit, putting it right beside the one that's there already, namely the access tunnel to the Queensland uh, underground busway station, Queen Street uh, underground busway station, uh, where it would consume, I guess, about 20 meter width of Redcliffe Place, which is not a particularly well utilized space at the moment. Um, uh, and uh, on two occasions, as uh, I put this in writing to the project director, on both occasions he declined to give me the, the rationale, as it were, for one of these options rather than the other. And on the second occasion, he more or less put it to me that as far as he was concerned, he really didn't want to discuss anything about Brisbane Metro with me anymore. We had enough. So that was the end of the discussion. Um, I did attempt earlier this year to uh, get the, the state minister involved, the minister for the local government, um, because I discovered reading the relevant background that he had, has the authority to overturn decisions of local authorities, and I asked him specifically, would he overturn the decision to put this tunnel and its portal into Adelaide Street? And then the other one, which is closely linked to that, was to um, essentially ex exclude general traffic from a, a large chunk of North Quay, the uh, two being interrelated, those two ideas. Anyway, in due course, I got uh, letter back saying no, uh, he w basically he wouldn't do that. His advice was that he had, there, there were no grounds, I think with the term he used, no grounds for overturning these decisions and this, that the advice he had received from his officers was that in fact these were matters for the, the city council uh, to determine, uh, which I must say I found rather remarkable. Um, but anyway, I thought that they were very clearly planning decisions over which the state government uh, should have exercised some authority, as it did over the question of the underground busway station to service the cultural centre. State government made its views very clear, it would seem, on that. Uh, but on this occasion, they weren't prepared to intervene. And I, I, I'm, I'm dismayed by that. Uh, I'm, I feel that the state council, the state government has not done its duty, but I'm more concerned that um, uh, representat representations that I've made to the project director to try and find out why. Why is uh, putting this hideous tunnel into the river end of Adelaide Street, why is that preferable to tucking it in beside the one that's there now, which most people don't even know exists? It's really hardly got any profile at all. In, in, installing it would be much, much easier than um, putting one into Adelaide Street, which is going to cause, well, estimated two and a half years uh, of, of that happening. Uh, now, the, the, just one other point I want to make uh, in, in my very limited time. I understand that, that the University of Queensland recently took exception to having something equivalent to something like three ship shipping containers of electrical uh, engineering equipment dumped on its campus. The, the, this being the, the flash charging system for uh, to allow metro vehicles to be to have their batteries recharged uh, at, at the end of what is the, the line, if you like, um, one of the, the two lines uh, that uh, Brisbane Metro follows and terminates at the University of Queensland. Well, not, un not unsurprisingly, the University of Queensland decided they didn't really want these. And so I understand that the, the solution to that that the council has come up with is that the, the three containers worth of equipment will now go across the 
Eleanor Chanel Bridge somewhere into Dutton Park, do a certain amount of damage there, no doubt. But uh, then, then the. Dr. The, Gardner, it, it, I'm, I'm sorry, your, your time has expired oh, at that okay. point. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Murphy, Transport Chair, would you like to respond? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'd like to uh, thank you, uh, Professor Gardner, for coming in today to speak with us about Brisbane Metro. I um, understand that you're a fellow of the Australian Institute of Physics uh, and remain passionate about Brisbane's transport future uh, in retirement. I, um, I know that your critique of Brisbane Metro uh, has been published on uh, the Labor think tank website, the TJ Ryan Foundation, which was established in 2014 by the then uh, leader of the opposition, Anastasia Palaszczuk. But we certainly appreciate the passion, uh, your passion, because on this side of the chamber, we understand that critical analysis of major infrastructure projects is really important. It's what challenges us to do better, and ultimately, uh, it allows us to deliver a better outcome. And I'm very proud of uh, this project's journey because we've now landed on a cost-effective solution that will now offer a new transport option for Brisbane, and one that will have significant flow-on benefits for other travel networks across the city. And the project is called Brisbane Metro to reflect the turn-up-and-go style of service that will be offered. Professor Gardner, I appreciate uh, that you believe articulated buses should be used instead of Metro's trackless trams, but I remain certain that trackless trams will deliver the most benefit for our busways. Trackless trams are, of course, an emerging technology around the world which allows cities to provide light rail-like performance at a fraction of the cost. HES are one of a number of manufacturers which are now in this space, and when we tended in 2019, provided the only vehicle which could meet our exacting specifications to work on the busway. We agree with you that articulated buses are indeed a great asset to our fleet. We already have 70 of them, and we will continue to purchase more. But our trackless trams provide even better capacity for turn up and go services. And if you put 60 trackless trams up against 60 articulated buses, the trackless trams are able to carry an additional 2,400 passengers. We work together closely with HES to develop a highly sophisticated design which will feature a turning radius of just 23.8 metres wall to wall, which outperforms even our rigid buses. These vehicles are used in European cities where ancient roads tend to be smaller and lighter, so we have no concerns with them manoeuvring on Brisbane's busways whatsoever. We will certainly look to add more articulated buses to our most popular bus routes, but the true value of Brisbane Metro is that it gives us the capacity to move an additional 30.4 million passengers per year on the South East Busway, and without Metro, there are no opportunities to increase capacity. While we would love the state government to extend Brisbane's busways, unfortunately, we seem to be the only ones of providing any kind of investment in the busway network at present. We are proud to be working with HES in Switzerland and Volga and here in Brisbane on the trackless trams, and we will not be cancelling the pilot vehicle contract. We're equally proud to be working with uh, Athiona and Arup to deliver the major infrastructure components for the project. Professor Garner, I appreciate your suggestion for Council to defer and to relocate construction of the Adelaide Street Tunnel. The Adelaide Street Tunnel will be a critical connection for both metro and bus services between Victoria Bridge and King George Square Station. It will free up congestion bottlenecks and it will reduce the number of buses travelling at surface level. If we were to use, for example, uh, articulated buses without that dedicated connection under Adelaide Street, that would simply mean running more buses along CBD streets and through the Queen Street busway station, which is already under a great deal of pressure and congestion. While I understand that you believe uh, a tunnel would be better located adjacent to the portal of the Queen Street bus station. This would impact on Redcliffe Place, and we don't support the loss of this important public space. We are also tunnelling underneath Adelaide Street because we miss hundreds of building footings and foundations that we would need to undermine at a much greater depth should we choose an alternative alignment. The Adelaide Street Tunnel provides a common sense connection off Victoria Bridge and directly into King George Square busway station. We've moved to the mining tunnelling methodology to reduce the construction impacts, but important to remember that we're building much more than just a tunnel here. Finally, um, Professor Gardner, to your suggestion that Council redesigns the cultural centre station with two uh, inner platforms between two outer platforms with a radio system in place advising the driver which zone to stop at. It's important to remember that Council agreed to construct a surface solution at the cultural centre station to move the project forward with the state government. That was actually a precondition of moving forward with them on the project. I'm sure that you can appreciate that this is a highly constrained environment with the bus station located at QPAC between the Q and the Queensland Museum, so extending platform lengths uh, is 
uh, the most achievable outcome. We've modelled this very extensively and we do believe that we have a very good at-grade solution which addresses congestion at the station and enhances passenger experience. You'd be pleased to know that we are procuring a Brisbane Metro management system to bring together all the IT components relating to bus operations, infrastructure and vehicle scheduling in order to support efficient operations and provide an improved passenger experience as well. We work very closely with uh, stakeholders in the cultural precinct on the design of the station and we look forward to construction starting next year. Professor Gunn, I thank you again for your time today and reassure you that through the development of this project, we have explored countless options and opportunities and we continue to reevaluate and challenge our design and delivery approach at every step of the way. I assure you that our commitment to delivering world-class public transport and I have full confidence that our highly skilled planners and engineers uh, have delivered a solution for Brisbane Metro that will work for generations to come. And as I've said uh, on this project before, from the beginning, doing nothing is not an option. Thank you, Mr Gardner. Thanks, Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Dr Gardner, for coming in today. Uh, councillors, we move on to question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or a Civic Cabinet Chair of any of the standing committees? Councillor Adaman. Yeah, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, this morning you announced that Brisbane commuters will receive free bus travel throughout the two weekends before Christmas. Can you outline for the Chamber how this initiative is not only a win for our public transport commuters, but also giving a Christmas boost to our retailers and restaurants? Lord Mayor. Thank you uh, to Councillor Adaman for the question. And it is good news because we know that uh, there are two critically important things at the moment. Uh, one of them is getting people out and about, uh, supporting local business in the lead up to Christmas and enjoying all the great activities that we're putting on for people, uh, whether it's the City Hall light show uh, that's on uh, during December each evening every 15 minutes, uh, whether it's the Lord Mayor's Christmas carols or the many uh, free or low cost events that we've got, uh, the Enchanted Gardens, Councillor Davis uh, and many other things that are happening, but also coming in to the city uh, to support local business. They have been really struggling uh, throughout this year with foot traffic down uh, in the Queen Street Mall significantly. Uh, we're still at 63% uh, of the pre-COVID levels, although that number is rising. And uh, uh, certain people have told me that uh, on Friday evening, we saw a big boost to the foot traffic as a result of the, uh, the, the combination of our Black Friday sales and the switching on of the Christmas tree. Uh, so we had a good lift in the foot traffic happening, but we want to see that grow even more. And so we're looking at opportunities to, to achieve a second aim as well, which is to encourage people back onto public transport. Now we know that at the moment, uh, our bus usage is down by about 38% compared to pre-COVID levels. And we're seeing that flow through into uh, congestion on the road network. So today the RACQ talked about travel times on our road network. And what was their suggestion about improving travel times on the road? The RACQ, this uh, was an interesting one. We need to do everything we can to encourage more sustainable transport practices like public transport, walking and cycling. Oh, well, that's good, because that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, and so this is exactly what we're doing uh, with the lead up to Christmas as well, with Friday, Saturday and Sunday, two weekends in a row, uh, uh, festive or free festive bus fares for Christmas. And so we'll see people travelling anywhere across the city on a Brisbane City Council bus. And that includes all the uh, blue and gold buses, plus the city gliders as well. Uh, and you can travel for free anywhere you want to go on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, this will cost uh, approximately $900,000 and it is fully funded by Brisbane City Council. Obviously it would have been nice to get the State Government come to the party, but uh, I don't hold a lot of optimism uh, these days that they come to the party on anything at all, except if it's some kind of political wedge. Uh, so we're seeing uh, councils stepping up, doing the right thing to get people back on the buses and back in to our uh, retail areas, supporting local businesses at a critical time. It is critical that a lot of these traders have a good, strong Christmas to make up for what has been an appalling year in many ways, and we're keen to support them. So whether it's the free festive fairs, or whether it's the fantastic Brisbane app, or whether it's the 
local buy initiative, uh, we are actively supporting our businesses across the city. We're also investing in village precinct upgrades as well uh, in a number of locations across the city. And it's just part of the overall agenda that we've got to make sure that Brisbane is Australia's most small business friendly council, but also our support of sustainable travel means, whether that is public transport or pedestrian and cycling through our green bridges and bikeway program, through our investment in uh, the Brisbane Metro project, which is just a fantastic project, uh, and uh, other initiatives to encourage sustainable travel. And whether it is encouraging e-transport, such as e-bikes and e-scooters. Uh, we are making sure that we uh, target across these travel means to keep uh, a lid on traffic congestion, to encourage people on public transport, and also to support our local businesses. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. My question is to uh, the Chair of the Finance Committee, uh, Councillor Cunningham. Councillor Cunningham, time and time again we see this LNP Council wasting huge chunks of this city's budget on cost blowouts. The Kingston Smith Drive upgrade accrued a cost blowout of up to $194 million. The Indrapilly roundabout has already blown out by $60 million before any work started. The Brisbane Bendy bus project blew out by $300 million before it even started. That's more than half a billion dollars in cost blowouts on just three projects. That's enough to pay for 85 years worth of curbside collection. Is this gross mismanagement of residents' money the reason this LNP mayor cuts basic suburban services and jacks up rates? Councillor Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you to the Leader of the Opposition for the question. Mr Chair, I'm not about to be lectured on finances and how to manage a budget from the Labor Party. The same Labor Party who are renowned for their big government approach and big spending sprees. I absolutely reject the premise of his statement. I won't even justify it by calling it a question, Mr Chair. Residents of Brisbane know this. That's why they overwhelmingly trust us to manage a $3.6 billion budget of Australia's largest local government, and we saw those results at the last election. It's because they have nothing to offer, Mr Chair. They have no real policy agenda. They resort to coming in here and creating fear and spreading smear. Responsible budgeting means we reinvest the dividends into providing infrastructure and services necessary to provide an even better Brisbane for the residents who have voted for us. Through the pandemic, we've been able to provide extra support to local businesses and community clubs while maintaining this record infrastructure investment. And I would point to the results from the QTC that show that we have a strong outlook. We can do all this by ensuring that Brisbane remains in the black rather than foistering the costs and consequences on to the future generations of our city. We are the only team with experience to deliver for Brisbane residents. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. Uh, my question is to the Chair of the Transport Committee, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Murphy, Council has been undertaking a comprehensive review of the ferry network since May 2021. Can you please tell the Chamber about the new timetable and services improvements that will come into effect next month and make ferry travel in Brisbane even better? Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Mackay, for the question. The Schrinna Council is investing record amounts in public transport, and as part of this commitment, we've just completed a review of Brisbane's <laughs> ferry network. Our goal is very simple, Chair, to make Brisbane's ferry network even better and to make ferry travel easier and more enjoyable for more people. The network has seen some big changes over the last few years with new terminals, new vessels and changed services. We know our River City has evolved with new nightlife precincts like Howard Smith Wharves, an expanded suite of lifestyle and leisure opportunities and the exciting honour of becoming an Olympic city. The people of Brisbane have changed too as a community. We're interested in more greener forms of transport. Now is the perfect time to make improvements to the ferry network just before Christmas and in time for the opening of Howard Smith Wharves and South Bank terminals. Now, the ferry network review has been an enormous undertaking involving four rounds of community engagement and over 8,000 pieces of feedback from Brisbane residents. Through consultation, we asked how, when, where and why people were using our ferry network and what would make ferry services even better. 
we got some really positive feedback that indicated 57% of people were satisfied with existing ferry services and 55% of people like to hop on board a city cat or a ferry for leisure or sightseeing. Frequency of services and quicker journeys were two of the strongest areas for improvement that came out of the feedback. 24% of respondents placed a high priority on faster journeys with fewer stops, and 32% they would use a city cat if it operated at higher frequencies later into the evening. We've listened to the community. I'm proud to say that the next month we'll be launching a new timetable with enhanced services to deliver the ferry network that Brisbane wants and needs. We're focused on delivering more services that operate later into the evening so people can enjoy our city's nightlife and leisure precincts with the comfort that a ferry or a city cat will get them home sooner and safer. Chair, let's talk about what's changing for our city cats, the icons of Brisbane that carry commuters to work each morning and equate many travellers with our incredible River City. We're delivering even more city cat trips with 59 extra all-stop services running Monday to Friday. The 15-minute frequency for weekday all-stop city cat services will also be extended later into the evening until around 9 p.m. In addition to improved all-stop services, Eastern and Western Express services will be simplified and enhanced with the timetable better aligning to customer demand. Express City Cat services in the east will run every 15 minutes from an Apollo Road to Riverside and peak times during the week to provide a high level of service for the many commuters that love to jump on a City Cat for work. And on weekends, we'll be extending the 15 minute frequency of City Cat services until midnight on Friday and Saturday nights. This is a 12 month trial of what we're calling uh, Night Cats. Uh, to boost Brisbane's nightlife and economy, supporting Brisbane residents and visitors to enjoy more of what the city has to offer later at night. Our ferry services are getting just as much love in the revised network with the even better City Hopper and Cross River ferry services. Residents will now be able to make their way to Howardsmith Wharves on a kitty cat, either through catching a City Hopper or the Cross River service. The City Hopper route will now service North Quay, the upgraded South Bank Terminal, Maritime Museum, Riverside, Holman Street, Howardsmith Wharves and Sydney Street, running at a 30 minute frequency. We've added in Howardsmith Wharves as a third stop to the existing Riverside to Holman Street Cross River service, which will also run at a 30 minute frequency, which means Kangaroo Point residents will have kitty cats arriving every 15 minutes at Holman Street and will have access to the north side of the river for the first time. Now we're adding in uh, Howard Smith Wharves as a, um, sorry, I should just say, Chair, just like the city cats, we'll be extending the hours of operation uh, of the inner city ferry services a bit later into the evening on Fridays and Saturdays so people can enjoy eating out and drinking into the evening at Howard Smith Wharves and Eagle Street. The Bulimba to Tenerife Cross River Ferry Service will also be enhanced with a simpler timetable so that residents can turn up with greater confidence of when the next ferry ride will pick them up uh, and a regular frequency of services in the peak direction. The Bulimba to Tenerife Cross River Services will also be better integrated with the City Cats and the City Glider Bus Service at Tenerife. So, uh, the Shrina Council is proud to be implementing this new and improved network and I have no doubt that we will have more people travelling by river and making the most of what Brisbane has to offer as we head into the silly season. The new timetables will come into effect on Monday the 13th of December. TransLink has published the revised timetables on their website so travellers can jump online and start planning their journeys now. The upgraded South Bank terminal will open for use on Monday the 13th of December and the Howard Smith Wharves terminal will open around the middle of that same week on approximately the 15th of December, weather permitting. Mr Chair, in closing, I'd like to thank the thousands of residents who had their say through the network review process. Changes to public transport should aim to benefit as many people as possible and this can only be achieved through the meaningful community consultation that the Shrina Council has undertaken when it comes to the ferry network review. Thank, Thank you, you Chair. Councillor Murphy. Murphy, further questions? Councillor Three. Thanks, Chair. The question, my question is to the Lord Mayor. Um, Lord Mayor, you're no doubt aware that more and more cities around the world are adopting speed limits of 30 kilometres an hour in recognition of the fact that lower speed limits can improve safety and convenience for um, active and public transport users and in turn can um, help encourage a shift away from car dependence. Um, cities like Paris now, I think, have gone almost entirely to 30 kilometres an hour, with the exception of a few main roads. I'm interested to understand how supportive are you of 30 kilometre an hour speed limits in denser inner city neighbourhoods and what additional evidence or information would you want to see in order to consider supporting the trial of generalised 30 km an hour speed limits for local and neighbourhood streets in the Gabba Ward or, for example, a suburb like West End. Thank you, Lord Mayor. 
Okay, so uh, that is um, an interesting question because uh, I was uh, the chair responsible for the introduction of the 40k an hour limit in the CBD when we were the lead city in Australia to introduce that limit. One of the things that we see here though is that nothing you do is ever enough for the Greens. Um, it's, you know, never mind that 40k's has been incredibly successful in improving the safety of the CBD. Uh, we were seeing uh, before that time, uh, people literally getting killed on CBD streets uh, and the safety record has uh, improved significantly. But when you hear a push for 30, what you're hearing, read between the lines, is they really hate motorists and they want to punish them and they want them out of their cars, which is Greens policy pretty much everywhere in the world. Um, and so whether it's a socialist mayor like the socialist mayor in Paris uh, or Greens councils elsewhere, it's a classic sign you've got a Greens Council when they go for 30k limits. Now, the interesting thing is that was a Labor election policy at the last election. So what does that say? I don't know. Um, socialism, they dabble with socialism. And I think we'll see more of that in the lead up to the next election. We'll see the Labor-Green Alliance coming out. Uh, but uh, I do not support 30k limits in the CBD. The 40k limit is appropriate. And it's interesting because order, Chair. you see Council that uh, you've asked the question Lord Mayor, already and I'm answering it. Sorry, yeah, it was more about the inner south side and suburbs like West End. But I believe the Lord Mayor is answering the question, Council 3. Uh, I do not support 30k limits um, in the CBD uh, and uh, I'd be interested to know why it's okay for children to benefit from a 40k hour limit but other places deserve a lower limit. Aren't children our most vulnerable road users? And 40 k's is an acceptable limit for school zones. And so 40 k's is an acceptable limit where you see uh, areas of high pedestrian activity. Uh, but look, you know, if you really hate motorists, um, then you go for 30. So uh, I won't be supporting 30. Um, it would really have to be a situation um, like Burnett Lane where you're actually having a shared zone where you've got um, pedestrians walking on the road and motorists driving through very slowly. You'd have to see that type of limit, like a 20k limit through there or a 10k limit. Uh, but on the general road network, no, I won't be supporting 30. Thank you for the questions. Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Chair. My, my question is to the Chair of the Economic Development and the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, last Friday night, the Lord Mayor officially turned on Brisbane's Christmas tree, kicking off Christmas festivities for 2021. Could you please update the Chamber on what festivities residents can expect over the next couple of weeks? Councillor Adams. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Hutton, for the question. I know the presentation today was about Christmas in the city, and I know it's not the Olympics, but it is also very important for the economic development of our city, and that is why we had uh, Juliet from the Brisbane Economic Development Agency today to go through the committee on all the exciting things that are coming up for Christmas in the city. And that's why I thought today, despite our gloomy weather, it was an important time to make everybody realise that it is the season and it's time to start advertising what is going on in this fantastic city over the next month. There is only 26 days until Santa drops by and there is a lot of stuff jam-packed into the city over those 26 days. Um, as the Lord Mayor mentioned last week, a little bit of gridlock in the city as he officially turned on Brisbane's Christmas tree to start festivities, lined it up with a Black Friday uh, retail event as well. And we had around two and a half to 3,000 people came into the city to watch the turning on of the tree. So that is a very welcome number after the difficulties of the last Last 18 months. And to keeping with our clean, green and sustainable administration, the tree is powered entirely by solar, the biggest solar-powered Christmas tree in the Southern Hemisphere. This year, the tree was assembled by a local Brisbane company who had the opportunity to put the tree together for the very first time. Another fantastic example of our local buy policy working for Brisbane businesses. And these are the types of contracts that we want to see and we are seeing in the awarding of our tenders. With so, such an outstanding tree, there's also some outstanding facts there too. Six tonnes, 22 metres tall to the top of the star, solar powered th with three kilowatt panels installed on the roof of the King George Square deck. There's over 130 decorations, including chrome baubles, gold stars, candy canes and red bows. 8,460 multi-coloured LED lights, 
to hang on it as well. So if you haven't been in to see it in the evening, we might get a time at six o'clock tonight. Um, however, please tell your uh, residents to come in and your constituents to come in and spend some time in the city because as of tomorrow, the Enchanted Garden will be on show from Roma Street Parklands from the first day of summer again, which looks like it's going to be a bit gloomy, but that's not going to make a difference for an evening showing of the Enchanted Garden. 62,000 tickets have already been sold, and this is an event that gains in popularity, popularity each and every year. 8,000 square metres of lighting throughout the gardens, in the trees, through the shrubs, all of the plants. It is absolutely a sight to behold and always features very heavily on Facebook and Instagram and other social media, which is exactly what we want to see. We want to be known for fantastic opportunities in the Christmas season to come and visit us, whether it is uh, across our state borders after December 17th and internationally if they see it for next year as well. Our deconstructed parades are continuing this year, pop-up activations and Christmas theme events right across the Queen Street Mall and uh, Edward Street from the 3rd to the 24th. Um, everything from carolers, acrobats, stilt walkers, roving Christmas characters and elves. The annual light show projected from the 10th to the 24th on City Hall by Gold Lotto once again. Another beloved family tradition after nine years of this operating. This year the Christmas classic is The Night Before Christmas which will be narrated by Robin Bailey as the visuals are projected on the building every night from 7 o'clock to 11pm every 15 minutes. Another major event is the Lord Mayor's Christmas Carols taking place on the 11th of December and as you heard from the Lord Mayor, a time to get on your free festive public transport and come in and see the Christmas carols. I think tickets go on sale tomorrow. This year it's being produced by Naomi Price and the Little Red Company. An upcoming Brisbane Events Company, which we're very glad to see the new look, which is going to show a cast of local legends. Kate miller Heike, Shepherd, Troy and Jem Casadaly and Marcus Carawa. A reflection of the performance quality this year is that Channel 9 is actually broadcasting the entire show on Sunday the 19th of the 12th. The Parklands are putting on show as well, outdoor cinema at River Quay, the family cinema at 6 o'clock, the adult version at 8.15. There is so much to see and do. Don't miss out. Right now the Queen Street Mall is getting busier and busier, which is what we want to see. 63% of pre-COVID levels, but as we said last Friday, a huge boost on the biggest retail event now of the year, bigger than Boxing Day as well. And that is what it is all about. It is about making sure that our businesses in the CBD are being supported, that we are a place to encourage people to come and play, eat and shop, because we are the most small business-friendly council in Australia. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Finance Committee, Councillor Cunningham. As we've just heard, over three projects, Kingston Smith Drive, the Brisbane Bendy Bus Project and the Indrapilly Roundabout Upgrade Project, this LNP Council has racked up more than half a billion dollars in cost blowouts. That's $554 million of re residents' money that was wasted because this LNP Lord Mayor can't manage a project properly. You could build 554 locally made electric articulated buses for the same value of that cost blowout. That money could have been used not only to boost the public transport network, but to create hundreds, if not thousands, of local jobs over that time. But instead, this LNP Lord Mayor throws half a billion dollars down the drain in cost blowouts and orders these electric buses from China. So, Councillor Cunningham, will you apologise to Brisbane residents for wasting their money and jacking up their rates to fund your mistakes? Councillor Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Chair. And uh, I'm, I have to start by thanking uh, the Leader of the Opposition for all of the questions on finance today. I mean, he clearly has an interest in finance. And I'm, and I'm pleased to be able to talk about our proud record in this portfolio because it is this administration that does have a proud record when it comes to financial management of this city. In fact, if you look at the Labor Party's record for, my, for the management of finances in this city, you'll see not one, but four rate rises of over 6%. So I'm not about to be lectured on from uh, the Leader of the Opposition about financial management. Now, when it comes... Yes, it was, Jim. 
Now, when it comes to this so-called uh, blowout of Kingsford Smith Drive, this so-called blowout, perhaps Councillor Cassidy doesn't pay a rates bill, perhaps Councillor Cassidy doesn't receive a rates bill, because he clearly didn't notice the $29 rebate for the underspend of the Kingsford Smith Drive project. The underspend of that project. So perhaps Councillor Cassidy, I don't know, doesn't receive a rates bill, doesn't read his rates bill, I don't know, hasn't been listening. Um, who knows? Regardless, this administration has a proud track record for financial management of this city. Now, of course, there are changing market conditions. But we're up for the challenge. And you know why we're up for the challenge, Mr Chair? Because we are the team with experience. The easy thing to do would be to build nothing and do nothing, just like our friends in George Street. But we have a record infrastructure spend this financial year, and that spend is in our suburbs. Mr Chair, I'm happy to talk all day about the financial management from this side of the chamber, and I think the opposition has a little bit to learn. Thank you, Councillor yeah. Cunningham. Further questions? Oh, Councillor Chair. Toomey. Thank you, Chair. So, my uh, question... Excuse me, Councillor Toomey. Councillor Cassidy. Um, I would like to move suspension of standing orders to enable me to move the following urgency motion. That the Lord Mayor apologise to Brisbane residents on behalf of his LNP administration for the gross mismanagement of their money and projects. Second. Thank you. Uh, we've received a, an urgency motion for the suspension of standing orders to allow for, uh, for, to allow for an urgency motion. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Three minutes to establish urgency. Thanks very much, Chair. This is urgent because we've just heard, we've just heard from the Chair of the Finance Committee uh, of this LNP Council uh, that they refuse to apologise for costing residents more than half a billion dollars in cost blowouts on just three projects alone. And there's plenty more to count and there's plenty more to come. And every single year that this LNP administration is in charge, rates are going up, but services are going down out in our suburbs. Residents are paying more and more and getting less and less back in return. The Kingston Smith Drive project uh, cost, cost blew out on the Kingston Smith Drive project by up to $194 million. The Indrapilly roundabout upgrade hasn't even started and is blown out by $60 million. The Brisbane Bendy bus project's blown out by $300 million. Chair, that's that's over half a billion dollars in cost blowouts on one project alone. And this is urgent, Chair, because that $554 million could have been used to purchase 554, 554 locally manufactured electric articulated buses. Yeah, yeah. This is urgent because that $554 million could have been used to put a footpath on every single street yeah. in Brisbane. And that $554 million... Councillor Murphy just said they don't want it. Councillor Murphy just said they don't want basic services in their service. It's been, yeah, that's right. They're not getting it. They're not getting it from this administration chair. And he's laughing. $554 million could fund curbside collection for 85 years. But instead, what, but instead what we saw from this Lord Mayor chair were cuts to basic services because of these cost blowouts because of his hideous advertising bill. Residents expect their rates to be spent on services in the suburbs, not wasted on cost blowouts and mismanaged projects, Lord Mayor. Far too often we see this Lord Mayor botching projects and draining the budget to fix his failures. This gross mismanagement of their money has not gone unnoticed, and at the very least, at the very least today, the residents of Brisbane deserve an apology from this Lord Mayor. Residents won't get value for money for their rates until Labor is back in charge in City Hall. But for now, but for now at least, but for now at least they deserve an apology. For now at least they deserve an acknowledgement that, that this LNP administration's eye-watering mistakes are costing this city big time and they should be very sorry about that, Chair. Thank you. We have a motion for the suspension of standing orders to allow this urgency motion. All who agree it's urgent, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. No. The noes have division. it. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Strunk. Um, no need to ring the bells. So let's go straight to the vote, please. Everyone's here. Uh, 
this is a division on the uh, suspension standing orders. All who agree that this is urgent, please raise your hands and say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no and raise your hands. No. Any abstentions? Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being six in favour, 20 against and one abstention. Thank you. We continue with question time. Councillor Toomey, you had the floor. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of City Standards Committee, Councillor Marks. Councillor Marks, as a subtropical city, Brisbane is about to head into another warm and wet summer. Can you please update the Chamber on what work is being done right across Brisbane to prepare our city for the upcoming season? Councillor Marks. Thank you for the question, Councillor Toomey, and thank you, Chair. As I'm sure you've heard, Mr Chair, last week the Bureau of Meteorology officially de declared we are in a La Nina conditions. So wet and, warm weather, wet and warm weather brings lots of changes to our city. And in city standards, there's plenty of work to be done in preparing Brisbane for the summer season. One of the most noticeable changes is the grass growth. And in your own backyard, you're probably noticing, like I am, that the grass seems to grow back as soon as you cut it. The same thing happens in grassed areas like parks and roadsides right across our city, which is why this administration has committed $20 million to this important service. Once we hit the peak growing season, we schedule our regular grass cuts every fortnight, weather permitting. Um, the significant amount of rain we are currently experiencing has caused some delays to the current grass cutting schedule. Mr Chair, just as you cannot mow your own backyard in the wet, we also can't get our mowing done in the rain. And regular da downpours saturate the ground, making it too wet for mowing equipment to access grassed areas. Keeping in mind the contractors drive much heavier equipment than what we use in our own backyard much, much heavier. The residents can rest assured the teams are out at every possible opportunity mowing whenever they can. And the grass cutting schedule is now in peak delivery with both parks and roadsides on back-to-back -back fortnightly servicing. As you can imagine, the heavy rain also takes a toll on our road network, causing potholes of all shapes and sizes to appear. So last financial year, we responded to almost 80,000 pothole repairs, which is a testament to the resources we have in place to act quickly and to get the repairs done. If you see a dangerous pothole that could cause damage to vehicles or, ve or cyclists following the rainfall, make sure you report it to Council so we can restore our roads to a smooth and safe condition as soon as possible. If we don't know about it, we can't fix it. And at this point, I want to thank the Council officers that are out there in this atrocious weather. We're all sitting here nice and dry um, doing this work for us. So severe storms can start to occur in this part of the year and last right through until March. So the Shrina Council is committed to keeping the city prepared by these events through measures like trimming trees and maintaining stormwater drainage. I also like to make special mention of the officers within city standards who contribute to our city's disaster response. We have officers who proactively plan for disasters such as severe storms or flooding following the principles of prevent, prepare, respond and recover so that a city can bounce back as quickly as it can from severe events. And it's also crucial that residents stay alert and prepare their families and properties for wild weather. There are plenty of practical steps residents can take. The best start is, place to start is by removing excess leaf litter in roofs, gutters and dome pipes and ensure the trees on your own property are trimmed. I'd also like to remind residents of our green waste recycling service as now is the perfect time to make the most of the excess green waste produced by cleaning up your property. And I have to say my husband particularly enjoys the every second week when it's green bin because it means he has to mow the lawns the night before and he does it every fortnight without, without um, fail. So we have waived the establishment fee, making it easier to turn um, your property, to clean it up and to create valuable compost for gardens across the city. So I'm so proud to be the chair of this committee because as you can see, Mr Chair, City Standards is home of so many of the city's core services and it's all about maintaining and enhancing Brisbane's livability. Thank you, Councillor Marks. <laughs> Further questions? Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Transport Committee, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Murphy, just last week, this LNP administration released the findings of the Ferry Network Review. Despite repeated calls, petitions and submissions from Brisbane residents, the Northern Park Ferry was not reinstated. 
This is the service that your LNP council cut without any warning or community consultation. Today, we found out that council officers were told specifically not to consider any submissions made about the reinstatement of the Norman Park Ferry in the review. Councillor Murphy, who made this decision to exclude all submissions on the Norman Park Ferry from the citywide ferry review? Was it you or the Lord Mayor? Councillor Murphy. Well, thank you, Chair, and I thank uh, Councillor Cook for the question, but I don't know how long Councillor Cook has been a councillor in this place, um, but I'm pretty sure that the elected administration of this city is able to make decisions about the ferry network, and that is exactly what we did over a year ago when the Norman Park Ferry was cancelled. We've been very clear. It was cancelled. It was used by one passenger per service, actually less than that. It was running between Norman Park and New Farm Park more often than not, carrying no passengers. It was one of the least patronised services in this city's history. In fact, Chair, it was cancelled on no fewer than two occasions by a previous Labor administration who actually had the guts to make decisions about public transport spend in the interest of ratepayers at large. And what do we have here and what have we seen over the last 12 months from Councillor Cook and Councillor Cassidy on the Norman Park Ferry? Absolute hand-wringing, absolute um, um, just dreadful scaremongering around the fact that we had taken away such a precious service from people who clearly, over more than a decade, were not using the service. And we have this confected outrage and this fake uh, campaign that continues to run around bringing back the Norman Park Ferry. Well, I can tell you, Chair, every dollar that we would invest in bringing back the Norman Park Ferry is money that we would need to take away from reinvesting in services that Brisbane residents want to use. And Councillor Cook, I've said in this place, and you've accused me of misleading people on it, that the Norman Park Ferry would take anywhere between five to seven million dollars to rebuild the terminal alone. That's not including the operational costs. And yet the investment that we are making on an operational level to invest in the ferry network that we've just announced today, that the Lord Mayor has just announced uh, this week, is $2.6 million. So that is an investment that you would be asking us to take from the people of, city, of the City of Brisbane to invest in a service that was being used by less than one person per trip. And if that's the kind of public transport platform that you want to stand up on and wave around as you head into the next election, Excuse Councillor, me, Cook, Councillor Murphy. then go for it. I, I would Excuse be more me, Councillor than happy. Murphy. Councillor Cook, you've got your hand up. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'd appreciate um, if Councillor Murphy would answer the question, who made that decision to exclude the Norman Park Ferry? Him it, or the Lord Mayor? It was a, a long question and Councillor Murphy is answering the question. Councillor oh. Murphy. Chair, uh, I am answering the question and the reality is that Council uh, no longer operates a ferry between Norman Park and New Farm Park. The Lord Mayor and I, when we announced that decision, were very clear that it was us who are making the decision uh, based on advice from officers of the costs required to reinstate the terminal at the time and the extremely low level of patronage. Now, that was not an easy decision to make, but it was a decision that was based on patronage, not based on politics, and the decision will not change. It will not change. We cannot be more clearer than that. We do not want public Murphy. transport Council to make a profit, but it does need to have people using it for us to be able to Excuse support Excuse me for a Councillor Murphy. Councillor Cook. Further. Yes, Mr Chair, uh, he still hasn't answered the question. It's uh, not about when it was cut. We know that the entire LNP administration is responsible for that. It was who made the decision to exclude yep. the Norman Park Ferry from the Ferry Network Review. I, I believe Councillor Murphy is answering the question. Chair, the reality was terminals, uh, terminals were excluded from the scope of the review right from the very outset. We always said that new terminals were excluded from the scope. We were looking at current services and how we could better augment them. The only new terminal that was coming into service that we already knew about was Howard Smith Wharves and the refurbished South Bank 1 and 2 terminals. So, Councillor Cook, if you'd bothered to make a submission on this, if you bothered to read the web page that explains the scope of the review, you might have learnt that. That was literally on Council's website. When it comes to the Ferry Network Review, who went to make a submission, you would have read, this is what's in the scope, this is what's outside the scope. So, you know, I'm disappointed, but I'm not surprised that you haven't bothered to participate in the process uh, again. Uh, and you're coming in here and you're asking questions oh, and you're making spurious one, points. Excuse me, Councillor Murphy, one last time, Councillor Cook. Uh, 
Mr Chair, thank you. And I did make a submission uh, if Councillor Murphy had bothered to look at the submissions around the Northern Park Ferry. So I did do the consultation. Uh, so I'm just concerned he's misleading the Chamber there. But again, who made that decision around the terms of reference? Him or the Lord Mayor? Councillor Murphy, I think you have, you have been answering the question. Do you want to add to your, your, your response? Look, Chair, I, I can't help that Councillor Cook doesn't like the answer to the question, but I have provided uh, the answer on many, on many occasions. Councillor Cook, you're more than welcome to um, blame the Lord Mayor and blame me for the decision, as you have done since the very start. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter what I say in the chamber. What, if what, you know, uh, so so um, Councillor Cook will say uh, what she needs to say out there in the community. Uh, and that was the case uh, just the other week, Chair, when uh, one of the ferries doing the Cross River Murphy, service... Councillor Murphy, your time has oh, expired. Thank Further you, questions? Councillor Landers. My question is to the Chair of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, Councillor Howard. Councillor Howard, late last week we announced the new class of emerging musicians to undertake our popular music program, The Cube Effect. Can you outline how our brightest musicians benefit from training and mentoring as part of this program? Councillor Howard. Well, thank you, uh, Mr Chair, and through you, thank Councillor Landers for the question. And I know that she has a keen interest in how the Schrinner Council supports our creative sector and our emerging artists. So since 2015, Brisbane City Council has delivered The Cube Effect, a contemporary youth music program that provides performance, promotional and professional development opportunities to emerging and professional young Brisbane musicians aged 12 to 25 years. Now in its eighth year, the program creates pathways for young artists and focuses on retaining talent within our city. It accomplishes this by providing real opportunities for young people to access council programs, contribute to our city and achieve their future aspirations. The competition showcases and promotes Brisbane's young and emerging musicians and builds sustainable partnerships between council, the music industry and young and emerging artists. Since its launch, the Cube Effect has fostered a platform for Brisbane's young artists to take their careers to the next level. This year, after assessing a pool of more than 60 qualified applicants, we have announced the finalists for the Cube Effect 2022. 24 Brisbane-based artists have been selected as finalists for the 2022 program, which will run over six months from December 2021 and enhance the skills and career opportunities of all those who are part of the program. From indie pop and surf rock to folk, hip hop and electronic, the Cube Effect finalists for 2022 represent Brisbane's diverse music scene and the incredible talent our city is famous for. When it comes to the training and mentoring opportunities, there are several ways in which the Cube Effect finalists are supported. As part of being selected as a finalist for the Cube Effect, the 24 finalists will receive one-on-one -on -one mentoring with some of Brisbane's most talented and experienced music professionals, live performance coaching, recording studio time and coaching, experience filming a music video, and marketing, branding, and public relations coaching. These really are some invaluable ways that our Cube Effect finalists are supported to develop their musical talents, helped in no small part to the dedication of the musical professionals that offer their time and support to Brisbane's young and emerging artists. Industry experts and world-renowned musicians such as Powderfinger band members Ian Hogue and John Collins will play a role this year in supporting our Cube Effect finalists as expert panellists in the program. In addition, Cube Effect alumni Hope D will also be a part of this year's expert panel after having completed the program herself in 2019. She's an amazing artist, having recently taken home prizes in the 2021 Queensland Music Awards, and she speaks very highly about the positive impact the Cube Effect has had on her musical career. When asked about the Cube Effect, Hope D has said, the legacy of participating in this program is ongoing for me. Through the Cube Effect, I had the opportunity to meet so many industry people and participate in professional development that I otherwise would not have had access to. The mentoring and workshops helped me to refine what my goals and priorities were and attain some practical knowledge on how to pursue them. Hearing such positive feedback, along with seeing the talented artists supported by the Cube Effect program, go on to national and international acclaim is something that the Schrinner Council is tremendously proud of. 
Another positive outcome of the Cube Effect is seeing finalists perform at events and venues across Brisbane and to have their creative talent recognised on a national level. While the past two years has been particularly challenging for the arts and creative industry, it's very heartwarming to see and hear Cube Effect alumni performing across a number of different platforms over the past 12 months. As an example, seven Cube Effect alumni performed as part of Brisbane Festival Street Serenades program this year, those being Betty Rays, Evangi, Fresco Kyoto, Hello Jane, Luate and MVP. When the decision was made for the City of Brisbane to proudly host the 2032 Olympic Games, it was the Cube Effect artists uh, O'Bailey, Kai-Fi and Tripster performing on the, for the crowd at South Bank. Now, regarding events in the heart of Brisbane's entertainment precinct, Fortitude Valley, we've had a number of the Cube Effect alumni perform at both Big Sound and Valley Fiesta over the years, always putting on new and exciting performances for the crowds. In addition, a total of three Cube Effect alumni placed on Triple J's Hottest 100 this year, often described as the world's greatest music democracy. It's always wonderful to hear about the successes of our Cube Effect artists and the impact this program has on the lives and careers of all those involved. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Your time has expired and that ends question time. Uh, Lord Mayor, Establishment and Coordination Committee report, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 22nd of November 2021 be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor and seconded by the Deputy Mayor that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday, 22 November 2021 be adopted. Uh, Lord Mayor, any debate? Uh, point of order. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. I would ask that item F is taken seriatim for debate and voting purposes, and I would ask that items C and D are taken seriatim for debate and voting purposes. For debate and voting? Yes, C please. and D? And yes. for F? Yes. Thank you. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Before I move on to um, other items, I um, just wanted to make an interesting observation about um, the question time. Uh, time and time again, we see the Leader of the Opposition making statements and not uh, actually asking any questions. Uh, and time and time again, he gets owned by Councillor Cunningham and owned, and, and just like Councillor Cook got owned by Councillor Murphy. I really. Like, I really don't see where they're going with any of this. Uh, to talk about, to talk about uh, imaginary cost blowouts, for example, Kingston Smith Drive, where the project came in under budget by 15 million, yet um, just up the road in their own state government, happening right now, we see things like a $1.2 billion increase in Cross River Rail. $1.2 billion increase. So the cost overrun in Cross River Rail could fund pretty much the entire Brisbane Metro project. That's just the cost overrun. And that's what we know of right now. And so, uh, you know, and that's not the only thing that's happening up the road. Um, we discovered just in September that the Coomera Connector project blew out by $600 million, $600 million for one project. And it's interesting because um, when you hear what Labor says in this place, um, they claim that this is mismanagement. But what does Minister Bailey say about that? It says here in, the, um, in a local media article in the Gold Coast Bulletin, the state government blames increased costs on the construction boom, which has spun out of the pandemic and has led to shortages of building materials, which is being blamed for the blowout. And it's a quote from Mr Bailey. We have been caught in the middle of an unprecedented boom in investment in infrastructure projects across Australia. And so uh, if you ask the state government why their projects are increasing in cost, oh, it's just a big boom. It's part of a big boom. And we're having supply issues. Building materials are hard to get. And you know what? Those points made by Minister Bailey are actually legitimate points. 
but it seems that they're not legitimate when it comes to Brisbane City Council. And so you can see the double standards and hypocrisy here. Um, but the reality is almost every single project, large and small, is under pressure at the moment. And it sometimes comes down to the availability of really basic things. It might be the availability of timber. It might be the availability of steel. It might be the availability of tradies, which are incredibly hard to find at the moment. And so all of these things are putting significant pressure um, on a range of projects at all three levels of government. And so the opposition could try and play politics with this sort of stuff, but the reality is uh, every level of government is facing challenges. Uh, but I then go back to the Kingston Smith Drive uh, project where the project was delivered under budget by 15 million and yet Labor Party keeps saying again and again that it was over budget. It's just wrong. It's just plain wrong. It was a fixed price contract. We always made that clear. And it came in $15 million under our budget. But, you know, anyway, they'll keep saying what they say, uh, just like we see Councillor Cook continuing to say whatever she wants to say, regardless of what the actual facts of the matter are. Now, when it came to uh, the issue of the Norman Park Ferry, um, Councillor Murphy answered the question three or four times. And we've been very upfront with the people in that part of Brisbane saying, we're sorry, but the Norman Park Ferry is not coming back. We've been very, very clear, it's not coming back. And I mean, I don't know how clear we could be about this. We've made a decision, we stand by that decision, it was the right decision. And as Councillor Murphy pointed out, that it, the decision was based on the people of Norman Park voting with their feet and not using the service that they had. It was as simple as that less than one person per trip. And so uh, now to suggest that there's somehow been a change of our position, no, nothing's changed. We haven't changed our position. Uh, we made it clear. Uh, but what we've been able to do is because we're not uh, putting good money after bad in a service that nobody uses to upgrade a ferry terminal that nobody would use, we're able to invest more money into the network. $2.6 million into extra services per annum that we've just announced. And so we've been able to do that in the areas where people will actually use the services to boost services, an extra 45 regular services a week, uh, the new night cats. Uh, we've seen uh, a new terminal that will come online in Howard Smith Wharves and be connected into the ferry network. And we're seeing uh, the upgraded terminal at South Bank uh, nearing completion as well. So two new terminals coming online, new services, extra services, better frequency, all based on the feedback of the people of Brisbane. So uh, we will continue to make uh, the sometimes challenging decisions that we need to make to get a better outcome for the people of Brisbane. And it, that also includes stepping up when the state government fails. And that is in areas like uh, the public transport free bus travel initiative. Uh, they could have done that themselves, but they didn't. And so we're happy to step up and lead the way on these sort of things. Just like we're happy to step up on Brisbane Metro and lead the way, and we're happy to step up on the ferry network and lead the way. And so uh, we do have a very clear position, which is to continue to increase public transport services, to continue to invest more in uh, sustainable travel options like new green bridges and uh, bikeway connections and e-mobility and all of those things which uh, the people of Brisbane are jumping on board with. At the same time, we'll continue to upgrade to make sure our road na network is safer. And uh, the Indrapilly roundabout upgrade is one of those examples. And then the flow on uh, Indrapilly, uh, sorry, Mogul Road corridor upgrade. Uh, a big benefit at, of that upgrade is increased safety for motorists and pedestrians and cyclists. And so that will uh, help deliver a better outcome, uh, not in, in just in terms of the capacity of the network, but also the safety of the network. And so uh, we will, continue to be focused in a laser-like way on improving things, on making things better. Uh, and that's uh, the essence of what we continue to do. Yet we see Labor uh, as an opposition uh, floundering around with no direction, um, making statements rather than asking questions. And, and we see them uh, continuing to uh, say things that are just not backed up by the facts, things like uh, about what they say on the Kingsmith Drive project, which is just 
plain wrong. But guess what? The people of Brisbane know it's wrong too because they got the discount on their rates. And I've got to say, the feedback about Kingston Smith Drive has been wonderful. Wonderful. And, and Councillor McLaughlin, I know you had some challenging times during construction, uh, but the reality is it's been a fantastic outcome. And wouldn't you believe it wouldn't be possible to have the Olympic Village at Hamilton North Shore if we hadn't upgraded Kingston Smith Drive? And so uh, that was a project that showed foresight and has enabled an amazing uh, opportunity for that part of Brisbane, but also serves as a wonderful gateway uh, into the city. Moving on to the lighting of council assets. Uh, this Wednesday, we're lighting up City Hall in red and green for, what's the colours of red and green? Christmas, um, <laughs> the festive season. And so maybe that too, maybe that too. Uh, and by the way, that offer to join the LNP st still stands, <laughs> councillor coming. Uh, now, has someone got a membership form handy? <laughs> Quick, print one off now. Um, I think we'll let that offer go for the last two meetings of council um, as a good standing <laughs> offer. Uh, Councillor Cumming, uh, it's for the festive season, season and maybe also for your local club. Uh, so we'll be lighting up um, the city assets tomorrow night, um, City Hall in red and green for the festive season. Uh, Wednesday also marks World AIDS Day. And this day aims to raise awareness in the Queensland community about HIV AIDS, uh, including the need for support and understanding of people living with HIV AIDS, as well as education and prevention initiatives. Story Bridge and Victoria Bridge, uh, Radcliffe Place sculptures and Tropical Dome at Mount Cuthu will be lit up in red on Wednesday to show our support. Friday is International Day for People with Disability, and uh, that's held on the 3rd of December each year and it's a day aimed at increasing public awareness and understanding and acceptance of people with a disability. Uh, this year's theme is seeing the ability in disability and it aims to challenge the perceptions and common stereotypes of Australians living with disability. To show our support, we're lighting up the Tropical Dome, Victoria Bridge, Story Bridge and Radcliffe Place sculptures in blue, green and orange. Lord Mayor, your time Friday. has expired. Move for an extension, seconded. We have a motion for an extension of time for the Lord Mayor, moved by the Deputy Mayor and by Council Landers. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. Lord Mayor, further 10 minutes. Now, moving to uh, the items in front of me. So I can deal with item A, B, E. That's correct, Mr Chair? Yes. A, B and E? Okay. Uh, item A relates to the SCP for grass cutting. This administration continues to invest record amounts into grass cutting uh, to make sure we provide a higher standard of service for the people of Brisbane. And in fact, uh, it was over successive budgets uh, that our side of politics increased the level of grass cutting across our city. Uh, now, the only way or the best way to see how that standard exceeds other standards is to go uh, and see what it's like on a state government controlled road. Um, you, will, you will see um, the clear difference in the standard of service um, between what we provide and what uh, the state government provides on their roads. Uh, and there's cer certain parts of Brisbane where that's very, very clear. What we're doing now is making sure we uh, go out for a contracting plan to maintain more than 73,000 hectares of land across the city. And that includes both parkland and roadsides as well. And um, this financial year alone, we've committed more than $20 million uh, to uh, making sure we keep the grass cut in our much loved public spaces and roadsides. This SCP will seek a panel of suppliers for the maintenance of grass right across our city. And as I said, both in parks and on roads, uh, we have an incredible amount of green space across the city in more than 2,100 parks uh, and also 5,700 kilometres of roadway across the city. The tender will seek submissions from both commercial operators and social enterprises to make sure we're supporting a range of suppliers in our community. Uh, the other thing that's interesting and new in this particular submission is the opportunity to gear up electric grass cutting equipment um, and electric mowing equipment. And I know Councillor Marks will speak about that a little bit more. Point of order. <coughs> Point of order. Councillor Johnston. Will the Lord Mayor take a question? Lord Mayor, will you take a question? No. So with the, um, 
with the development of electric uh, grass cutting technology, um, you know, we see more and more people using electric mowers in their own backyards. Uh, and there's also uh, emerging and improving technology when it comes to the, the more commercial types of grass cutting equipment that are electric. And um, there's some benefits there. There's some benefits in terms of lower noise levels, and there's also some benefits in terms of uh, the, the level of pollution at source that is caused by this equipment. Uh, we know that um, uh, certain types of grass cutting equipment can um, uh, put out um, some emissions in terms of both noise and pollution, uh, and the electric equipment is a, a good alternative, and we're looking at exploring those opportunities, particularly in some of the inner city areas uh, where there's more of a sensitivity to noise related issues. Uh, so uh, we have a tender process that will be completed in two stages, open market assessment to gauge suppliers who may be interested in submitting a tender uh, and nominating their capabilities, and then tenderers will be shortlisted in this process but not required to agree yet to contract conditions. The second phase will be that the shortlisted respondents will be asked to submit a formal temp tender which includes firm pricing and methodology. Uh, the estimated expenditure is uh, up to 84 million over the potential five year period. Item B is the uh, annual credit review of Brisbane City Council undertaken by the Queensland Treasury Corporation. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, we continue to have a strong credit rating from the QTC, which has been an ongoing thing uh, and something we should all be proud of. Uh, because uh, there's a couple of things you should know. Not only uh, do we have, uh, if not the strongest, amongst the strongest ratings of any council, uh, we are one of the few councils that actually uh, puts our credit review on the record. Uh, if you ask other councils to show, uh, to show you their credit review, you'll have real trouble finding where that document exists in the public realm. Um, and so uh, we will continue to practice the principles of responsible financial management and to make sure that we're using our balance sheet effectively uh, to invest in the future of our city by building infrastructure, but also by investing record amounts in the suburbs. Uh, this year alone, uh, more than 80% or 86% of our budget was spent in the suburbs of Brisbane. And so uh, we're proud of that and we will continue uh, to do that and responsibly manage our city's finances as we have continued to do consistently. The next uh, item was E, was it, Mr Chair? A, uh, yes, item E. That's right. Uh, this one is um, the uh, update to the Health, Safety and Amenity Local Law, uh, commonly known as HASSL. Uh, so this is the uh, version which uh, is the 2021 version and replaces the 2009 version of the local law. Now, when HASSL was first introduced, it was um, uh, delving into areas that Council previously hadn't uh, before, and they were very much about giving Council a little bit more uh, oomph when it came to dealing with suburban amenity issues. And um, this was based on clear feedback from the community that uh, there were issues in their uh, local neighbourhood that uh, under the previous laws, Council didn't have the ability to address. Uh, and so in 2009, uh, with the first health, safety and amenity local law, uh, we got uh, the ability to deal with some more of those suburban amenity issues uh, on a proactive basis. And so uh, that's been a positive thing, uh, but this is about some further tweaks to the legislation uh, in, in order to be responsive to the needs of the community. Uh, in the new law, there are several key changes that are designed to help make our city cleaner, safer and more livable. Uh, the new law will help us uh, get to work cleaning up our city by bringing in provisions for abandoned uh, shopping trolleys, graffiti removal, and the distribution of uh, when people are putting um, print materials onto the footpath rather than into the letterbox, um, which obviously uh, is, a, is a form of littering. We've also expanded the list of unsightly objects, materials, and vegetation, uh, not only to uphold the amenity of our city, but to make sure it's safe for all residents. New require, requirements around the construction of electric fences will also contribute to the safety of our city, as well as the provisions for camping on roads, maintenance of swimming pools, wading pools and ponds. And we've also removed 
the regulatory framework around abandoned vehicles from another local law, uh, as these requirements contribute to keeping our city uh, clean and safe and are much better in line with the aim of the hassle. So uh, requirements have been moved from another local law into the hassle. Um, so just to clarify what's happened there. We also have uh, listened to the people of Brisbane when it comes to their desire to uh, fire up the braziers and fire pits at home, particularly during winter. And um, after a trial uh, that started last year and has continued on, um, we've uh, allowed that to continue going. Uh, and obviously putting some requirements around it in terms of safety, uh, smoke nuisance and having uh, clear requirements that if you're um, going to take advantage of the opportunity to have a fire pit or brazier in your backyard or on your property, uh, that you need to do so in a way that doesn't cause a nuisance to those around you. Uh, if you are causing a nuisance, then this is where um, the hassle law kicks in. There's um, provisions to make sure that those things are dealt with. Uh, the commencement date on this new local law is the 1st of February 2022. Public consultation was held between 17th of June and 7th of July. 72 submissions were received, 60 of those were on fire pits and 11 were on camping on roads. Uh, nine state government submissions were also received. Uh, so I commend these three items to the Chamber. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Further debate on items A, B and D. Councillor Cassidy. Thanks, Chair. Can I just ask that item A be taken seriatim for voting, please? A seriatim for voting, yes. Yes, thanks. So just starting on A, the um, significant contracting plan for grass cutting services. Okay. Uh, I found this on the web for open for voting, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Google. How, re how responsive. <laughs> So sorry, Chair, sorry, Councillor Cassidy. So, Chair, this work should and could be done more in-house. This is an $84 million contract over the next five years, uh, and uh, cutting grass in public places, whether that's parks or on um, footpaths for um, those that, uh, that need it most, is one of the most basic and ongoing services that a council can provide out in the suburbs. Uh, and um, having this kind of work done uh, through an arrangement of secure in-house work uh, would, would create hundreds of permanent in-house council jobs. It would give hundreds of families a secure income for years to come. Uh, but uh, again, we see this LNP Mayor wanting to contract, contract out these basic services to the lowest bidder, casualising Brisbane's workforce even more. And this leads to insecure employment, poor working conditions and increased risks for workers here in Brisbane. And speaking of risks, when you look at this contract, it is plagued with them. There's a high risk that tenderers won't have the right mowers or equipment. Does that sound familiar to anyone in this chamber? Uh, the LNP have a track record on awarding contracts to contractors that don't own any mowers and then have to sub out that work to other subcontractors and making that work more insecure uh, and making those outcomes worse for the people of Brisbane uh, and those workers, of course. There's a significant risk of unsustainability uh, pricing and even a risk that there will be a poor quality of service, and that's a no-brainer, uh, given this LNP administration's track record uh, on these contracts. And all of this could be avoided, Chair, if this work was brought in-house and Council hired permanent uh, employees to complete this work. And given we know this is ongoing, given we know that there is a schedule for grass cutting uh, in every public park and in every suburb, this is something that can be planned for and managed internally. Queensland Treasury Corporation's uh, credit review. Uh, this is, of course, a credit re review that is based on information that Council tells the Treasury Corporation. So this LNP administration provides certain information to the Q Queensland Treasury Corporation and they provide a review on that information that is provided to them yes. by this LNP administration. Uh, and the positive outlook that the Lord Mayor talks about uh, is based on this LNP Council's ability to jack up rates uh, and cover the enormous waste of ratepayers and residents' money. Now, we know that this LNP administration has a track record of jacking up rates year on year to cover their mismanagement, and that's uh, why the Treasury knows they are capable of doing it. They have a track record of doing it, therefore the Treasury says you have a proven, you have a proven track record of increasing rates to cover your debt, to cover cost blowouts on projects as they come, 
and they know there are cost blowouts coming and they know that they have the ability and the track record to jack up rates to cover it. And it does mention there that there is, council has a large and diverse rate pay base and that is the favourable fa factor in its credit rating. So all this, I thought there was uh, uh, an interjection for me, but um, Councillor Allen is giving Councillor Cunningham some notes to, 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 to speak later. Yeah. You have the so floor, all, Councillor Cassidy, please so use all it. Councillor Schrinner sees when he sends out rates, bills, chair, are the dollar signs for more self-promotion so at residence point expenses. Of, point of order, point uh, of order Chair, just, uh, just for my own understanding, um, I was of the understanding that item B was being taken seriatim. No. A, B and E together for debate. Thank you. A for seriatim seri seri for voting. I, miss, I misheard. Thank you. Yeah. And despite this so-called strong credit rating, uh, Chair, the LNP Mayor didn't offer any financial support to the people of Brisbane as they navigated the worst of this pandemic. In fact, he did the very opposite. He froze the, w the wages of council workers. He cut grants to community funds. And he refused our calls on this side, Labor's calls, to support small businesses through repeated lockdowns this year and cut basic community services yep. like curbside collection. Yeah. So it's all well and good to have a so-called shiny credit rating based on information that you provide the QTC yourself. But if you're not willing to use it when the chips are down and the people of this city need help, then what kind of leader is this Lord Mayor Chair? On Clause E, the health, safety and amendy local law. And this local law includes changes to various things, but uh, mainly, apparently, it's about the introduction of fire pits. Uh, and this is a local law that this Lord Mayor Adrian Schooner wrote on the back of a napkin and introduced uh, initially without any prior thought or consultation. Uh, and we're led to believe that the initial consultation was done in the form of a Facebook poll. So this LNP Mayor's idea of genuine community consultation is a Facebook poll. It's interesting to note that when I went and looked at the file, as I would expect it would be an extensive file yes. about changing a local law. Uh, there is nothing about that Facebook poll on file whatsoever. So the official reason for introducing the local law remains an official mystery. So the record for time and memorial now going forward for the reason for these changes to the local law, particularly around fire pits, uh, initially, and the consultation around them does not exist on file. So the Lord Mayor went out and said he'd done, he had done initial consultation, he'd listened to people of Brisbane through a Facebook poll, but that is, that is nowhere to be seen. Uh, that does not exist anymore, Chair. Uh, and which is an unacceptable, unprofessional and disrespectful way um, uh, to treat the people of Brisbane, I think. But then again, what have we come to expect from this LNP administration who ignores, berates and threatens residents who speak out against their rulings in here. Of the 59 properly made submissions regarding fire pits, 59 were against the local law to allow them, uh, and some of the peak health organisations who have weighed in included the Lung Foundation of Australia, the Centre for Air Quality, Energy and Health Research, Clean Air Winham, which we heard from, I think it was last week, Environmental Health Australia, Clean Air Australia, and Asthma Australia. Asthma Australia stated they had numerous members of the public contact, the, contact them about increased asthma symptoms due to the relaxation of enforcement on fire pits and braziers last year, and that local law hurts the most vulnerable in our community who are already dealing with the effects of COVID-19. The Lung Foundation said fire pits and braziers create an unacceptable public health risk and the proposed local law fails to comply with the stated objective to protect the standards of community health and safety. Uh, there have been a number of submissions made directly from residents as well that are on file uh, and in the papers we have before us today. Uh, some are concerned about the inability to regulate the types of materials that people are burning and how the, uh, the effects of smoke may be exacerbated in densely populated areas, and others worry about their children's chronic health issues being made worse by smoke. Residents with asthma and other lung conditions are seriously worried as well in their submissions. So it's all very well to introduce uh, fire pits into this local law off the back of a Facebook poll, but what we want to know and the assurances we're seeking is how does the council intend to regulate these backyard fires in the real world? In the real world, not just, not just in comments that the Lord Mayor says in this chamber today and says that there are regulations in place in this local law, but how will this actually be regulated in the real world? So how will a council officer investigate a smoke complaint and deem it to be okay or not? 
uh, in the real world on the day that they attend a backyard fire. Uh, what is the minimal flame height and how, does council how do council officers uh, expect to be measuring that? Uh, what are they being given in terms of those tools? Uh, how will the smoke nuisance be defined in a way that can be quantified and measured by compliance officers? Council officers can't control the way in which the wind blows, of course. Uh, will council officers run around putting out fires if the next door neighbour suffers from a lung condition? These are genuine questions. How will the complaints system work? Complaints for lighting fires and backyard burning increased by 30 per cent uh, in the 1920 financial year of this, uh, of this trial. Um, how are those complaints addressed? We are, that's not clear yet. And so there are many, many unanswered questions around the practical applicability of a local law like this going forward. Uh, we understand fire pits are popular uh, and their use has exploded, uh, but the regulation does need to be tight and the parameters in which our council officers work need to be very clear for their benefit and for the benefit of residents right around Brisbane. So we see time and time again uh, this LMP Mayor uh, and his administration are very arrogant around so many things like, like rushing out to announce something new to get publicity without actually doing the homework uh, to ensure that the right decision is made for the people of Brisbane. And we saw that yesterday. This LMP Mayor put up a Facebook post confirming that the local law change had happened yesterday before it even came to a council for a vote or any debate here in this chamber chair. Councillor Cassidy, your time has expired. Point of order moved for extension. Second. Extension of time for the Leader of the Opposition has been moved by Councillor Griffiths and seconded by Councillor Strunk. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Cassidy. Well, thanks very much, Chair. So to rush out and announce something like that publicly um, is indeed a very arrogant way. And it, it, worries, it worries you to think that this was all concocted um, to get the Lord Mayor some attention uh, and some publicity, because yes. at the time that people sort of realised, you know, during 2020 that these things weren't uh, legal and they weren't regulated, the Lord Mayor thought he saw an opportunity to get some publicity out of this, so jumped all over it. Mm -hmm. And he's done it again yesterday without following the proper processes uh, through here in, in City Hall. So that, that just confirms, Chair, I think that the Lord Mayor doesn't care much about the democratic process um, of council when it comes to these things. And it's just like, just like there's countless examples of that, rushing out e-scooters, the Bendy Bus Project, the Green Bridges, uh, the list goes on in announcing these things before they're properly thought out and before they're properly planned. Uh, so this no, new local law m needs to be subject to constant reviews to make sure it stays in line with community expectations, particularly around regulating something that can cause harm and danger to people. And I understand the intent, and I'm sure that the city legal office and council officers that have, who have drafted this law have, would certainly have tried to take that into account. Uh, but as these things evolve and as the effects of um, fire pits and their use ongoing uh, in an ongoing way, uh, that needs to be constantly reviewed and not, not uh, in the time frame that we've seen previously from 2009 through to 2021, this needs to be done much more, with much more regularity. Uh, so we, that, that is, that is the, I suppose, the parameters in which we will be supporting this local law uh, and putting all that on record. Uh, that this is, this is a big change in council regulating something that can be harmful and dangerous uh, and that needs to be subject to, to um, genuine feedback from the community in an ongoing way and, and constant reviews of that um, as well. We do, see, we do see in this local law as well the regulation finally of electric fences. Uh, in public places, and we all remember. I think it was last year. Uh, council, this is the this is the um, clean up that mess from Councillor Owen section of the local law, where that um, that electric fence out uh, in that community there zapped uh, that little girl. And the response we saw from the local LMP councillor could have been killed. That person could have been killed. And the response we saw from that local LMP councillor in this administration was arrogance once again to blame to blame everyone else, to blame, to blame people for uh, coming into contact with those, uh, with those dangerous devices that should never have been allowed, should never have been allowed to be bordering a public park. Uh, so council you know, continues to ignore these problems, continues to neglect the suburbs, and then has to come in and mop these things up uh, uh, after the fact and much after the fact. Uh, so that's, uh, it's good that that's finally being tidied up. Certainly shouldn't, uh, shouldn't have taken uh, some bad press. Uh, and some almost, some almost fatal outcomes 
uh, to make sure that that was tidied up in this local law as well. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Further debate on items A, B and E. Councillor Davis. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mr Chair, and I rise to speak on item E, the proposed Health, Safety and Amenity Local Law 2021, and specifically um, to the amendments relating to fire pits and braziers. And uh, can I start by assuring the Chamber that uh, our council officers are quite capable of doing their job. Uh, a toolkit is currently being um, developed, uh, noting, of course, that this local law doesn't come into effect until the 1st of February, uh, so they'll be uh, quite able to go out uh, if there are complaints received uh, through the call centre and be able to deal with those issues. Uh, Mr Chair, the Shrinner Council is committed to making Brisbane suburbs even better and uh, last year during the COVID lockdown residents were looking for more things to see and do closer to home uh, and in this case literally in their own backyard and the Lord Mayor understood this and we as an administration understood this and that's why we decided uh, to take a more common sense approach to the use of fire pits as part of a three month trial in 2020. And after the trial concluded, we reviewed an enormous amount of feedback. We had 6,000 responses on Facebook, over 1,000 letters and emails, and nearly 2,000 petition signatures. Uh, Mr. Chair, the feedback was overwhelmingly in favour of allowing backyard uh, fire pits and braziers to continue. We received over 96% support for allowing fire pits from over 7,000 respondents on Facebook. We had nearly 2,000 signatures on council petitions, both for and against fire pits, and nearly 95% of the signatures were in favour. Even in the emails and letters, of which there were over 1,000, over two-thirds um, of those received were in favour. Uh, so following that strong support for the trial, we announced that the relaxed restrictions would remain in place until the review of this local law had um, been completed. Under the previous local law, backyard burning of any kind, apart from the specific purpose of cooking food, was not legally permitted except in rural areas. Uh, under this amendment, residents in suburban areas may have small, safe fires in a fire pit or brazier raised off the ground for purposes um, of heating or, of course, for social gatherings. Um, the local law also uh, does not permit the use of unsuitable containers, such as reused chemical drums for backyard fires or for the fire to have direct contact with the ground. Uh, through the public consulta consultation, Council also received submissions from residents and organisations in regard to the impacts of smoke. Council has made it very clear in the local law that where smoke is causing an impact to residents, Council will investigate and take the appropriate action. To reduce smoke, residents are encouraged to use dry, clean, untreated wood or smokeless fuels such as gas, ethanol or charcoal. And Council will continue to monitor any smoke complaints as received in accordance with the Environmental Protection Act of 1994. Importantly, as we head into summer, fire pits and braziers must never be used when a fire ban has been announced by Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. Council's website features tips on how to maintain a safe, uh, and uh, fire with minimal smoke impacts and a good neighbour letter to assist residents in talking to their neighbours about fire and smoke. Council also encourages cons uh, constant adult supervision of fires and that all fires be extinguished with water to protect children. Um, I was very pleased um, that Council was able to work with Kids Safe Queensland to co-produce um, a video to provide residents tips to keep children safe um, around outdoor fires. Uh, we've also included child safety advice in fact sheets also available on our website. Mr Chair, we've worked hard to strike the right balance with this local war and we look forward to residents being able to use their fire pits and braziers without um, causing effect and nuisance to others. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Further debate on items A, B and E. Councillor Johnston. Yes, um, I was hoping that Councillor Marks was going to stand up and uh, speak to this item. She, yeah, yeah, well, she said she was going to earlier, but um, hasn't done so yet. Uh, now, um, I'd, I'd like to speak on items A, B, and uh, E, and I'll start with items uh, item A. Um, the Lord Mayor has left the chamber, so he's not here for debate on the own portfolio responsibilities, um, and that is a, a regular occurrence um, in this place. He can't even be bothered to stay in the chamber for the first part of the meeting. 
Um, he refused to um, answer a question earlier today. And um, the question oh, that I have... Point of order, Mr Chair. Yes, uh, Deputy Mayor. To the items A, B and yes, E before Councillor us. Johnston, can you return to the agenda items before us, please? The agenda items are that the Lord Mayor of the City has presented a report and then abandoned it. That's what happened. That's happens. not on the agenda, Councillor yeah. Johnston. You know the rules. Well, technically... Please talk to, the, talk to the, what's on the agenda, please. It, do, it does say that in here, and the Lord Mayor did move the motion, so you know I understand. You think he's irrelevant, <laughs> Councillor Johnston. Um, but anyway, the Lord Mayor stood up earlier today and refused to take a question, and I actually have, I think, a pretty genuine question um, about item A, um, and it, it, it's a very unusual thing, and it has been in previous um, uh, mowing contracts. But why are mowing contracts let by ward? Why are they let by ward? What's the point? We don't operate by ward in terms of how this council's managed. Um, Councillor Marx has gone to great effort to completely dismantle how this city operates in terms of its operational uh, services across the city. And yet, for some reason, this council is selecting mowing contractors on the basis of ward. Not region, not suburb, not district, not geographic features but by ward. So it's a genuine question. Why is that the case? I know this is problematic because in my ward we have very difficult areas to mow and we don't get a lot of tenders coming forward to mow those areas. And I think it was the last time that mowing, it's about the fourth or fifth lot of mowing contracts that have come through um, since I started as a councillor, um, that we don't get um, many bidders to mow in my ward. That's a noted risk in this contract. Um, it, it's actually listed as a medium risk in this contract that we may not get tenderers to come forward and mow. So um, my question to the Lord Mayor is um, why aren't we putting forward geographic areas that are related to each other that make sense in terms of the areas that need to be uh, managed as part of the tender? Why are we offering up wards? So, um, you know, in some areas that means that there might be a mowing contractor on the eastern side of Ipswich Road in Annerley, but it's a different mowing contractor on the western side of, of Ipswich Road, Annerley. Um, many other, so Oxley's divided into four, into four um, uh, different councillors, Councillor Hutton, Councillor Griffiths, uh, Councillor Strunk and myself. Now, Councillors can't direct the mowing contractors on what to do. So again, the legitimate question is, why are mowing contracts being let by ward? It's an irrelevant um, delivery mechanism from a council point of view. I, it's a genuine question. I would really like someone to tell me. Um, why is it not suburb? Why is it not area? I mean, we've even abolished the areas. There's no north, south, east, west and central anymore, so they're gone. There's only north and south. So why aren't there mowing contractors on the north side and mowing contractors on the south side? I'm very interested in why this parameter has been chosen. And my fundamental concern, which is a concern that is identified in the procurement process here, is that this leads to some mowing contractors picking and choosing wards that are easier to mow because they're flatter, they have less complex mowing needs, and the wards with really difficult and complex mowing needs um, don't, get the, um, don't get the support that they need. Um, and that is a, that's a very genuine problem that's happened over many years in this place. So the Lord Mayor's absent. He wasn't willing to take a question earlier. I think it's a very genuine and relevant one. Um, I, I doubt anybody else here knows. I doubt he knows anyway. But I'm going to put on the record, there's council officers listening up at Brisbane Square, I'm not allowed to direct a, a council mower on what to do, so why is the mowing contract being let by ward? Perhaps Councillor Marks will attempt to answer uh, when she stands up. Um, I don't have any confidence that council will get this right. The big problem with how council's been managing mowing contracts over the last few years is um, reducing the price. That does not lead to a good outcome here. Now, I appreciate that Councillor Marks has been listening over the last couple of years to the concerns that I've raised, and I thank her for that. 
Um, but for the 14 years that I've been here, the single biggest ongoing problem at Council is its failure to maintain roadside mowing and parks um, to a decent um, standard and a common standard around the city. It is a fight every time um, to get areas properly maintained, and that includes um, managing weeds that then expand out in an area, and then the mowers don't um, mow because there's weeds, and then council doesn't remove the weeds, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until 10 to 12 metres of parkland is lost. And then it becomes a really expensive exercise for council to retrospectively fix it. And that's the problem that I've been dealing with as long as I've been here. So now the Lord Mayor's come back into the chamber, I'll put my question uh, just again to him. Councillors can't direct um, mowing contractors on how to mow. So why do the terms of this council procurement process for mowing, uh, why are they being determined by ward? This has been problematic in the past. Council does not operate on a ward basis. Um, as the Lord Mayor would know, um, Council's gutted um, asset services. There's now only a northern management team and a southern management team. Um, so why is there this idea that somehow mowing contracts have to be determined by ward? The whole idea of what we've been told by this inept administration over the past year is we are transforming council. We want common standards of management. Um, we want to see the same thing happening in this area as that area. Yet here they're letting one of the biggest and most important everyday contracts that we have by ward. Why? Maybe someone will know. If not, um, and I suspect you know the Lord Mayor. <laughs> The Lord Mayor of the city couldn't even be bothered to answer a question about that earlier, and it's a pretty genuine sort of question. Um, the credit review, well, you know, when, when you give your figures to your banker that are prepared by your banker and your banker gives you a tick of approval, I don't necessarily think that's something to be proud of. Um, Councillor Cun Cunningham is still fairly new in this place, um, but the LNP has been in charge of the Lord Mayoralty to, since 2000, and well, she's not here either. Um, it, it, the, Lord, uh, the LNP have been in charge of the Lord Mayoralty since 2004. By the end of this term, that will be 20 long years. Not once, not once has this administration reduced rates. Last year, there was a pause and it was a delayed increase, but rates still went up last financial year. Not even during the floods did this council um, even leave rates the same? They went up. And what this LNP does, uh, administration doesn't tell you every year at budget time is what they set the cap at. They tell you what the average rates rise is, but the cap under this LNP administration has been 6 or 7 per cent for years and years and years. 20 years of rate rises. And the councillor for Cooparoo Ward, who's been here for five minutes, stands up and says, 24 years ago rates went up. I think she needs to look in her own backyard first and just remember that her team have been holding the financial levers of this city for 20 years at the end of this term. And every single one of those years, including in times of natural disaster, the LNP administration have put rates up every single time. That's why they're getting the tick. The health, safety and amenity local laws, and I might need an extension if I can, please, somebody. Um, the health, safety and amenity local law uh, is um, really problematic for, for us today. Um, there, are, there were 60-odd... Um, 62 submissions opposing fire pits um, in response to this. Um Councillor Johnston, your time has expired. Point of order, move for an extension. An extension of time has been moved by Councillor Griffiths and seconded by Councillor Second. Strunk for an extra 10 minutes for Councillor Johnston. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. No. The no's have it. Division. Division called by seconded. Councillor Johnston and seconded by Councillor Griffiths. Ring the bells.
The motion is that Councillor Johnson be granted an extension of time. All in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Those opposed, please say no and raise your hands. In, any abstentions? Clark. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The venue being seven in favour and 19 against. That motion is not carried. Further debate on A, B and E. Thank you, Chair. Can I start by saying, can we take item E for seriatim for voting purposes, please? E seriatim for voting. Yep. Yes, please. So, Mr Chair, I rise to speak on both items A and E. And despite being a chair of, oh, I would mate. suggest, one of the biggest portfolios in council, I still only get 10 minutes to speak, so I'm going to try and get through everything that I need. So, as I spoke earlier about the grass cutting and the central role it plays in our city's maintenance and preparation, especially in the summer months, we have over 2,000 parks, um, uh, grass cuts in suburban parks and sports fields are at the top of our priority list. So this item is about the significant contracting plan which we will seek tender us to join a panel of suppliers for grass cutting. We currently use a panel of both commercial contractors and social enterprise providers to service all 26 wards and this new contract will be no different. I do have some concerns, though, through you, Mr Chair, about Councillor Cassidy casting aspersions on the work ethics of our current mowing contractors and social enterprise organisations. And I would suggest, hopefully, that nobody is listening into the debate today because the, the councillor for the opposition, through you, Mr Chair, has already decided that their work is substandard and they haven't even applied for a tender, which I think is pretty disgraceful. So, but the key difference, as the Lord mentioned, on the value of this contract is the value we will place on electric order, equipment Chair. as we look towards the future. Councillor Cassidy, point of order. Claim to be misrepresented. Noted. As we look towards the future of cleaner and greener vehicles across our city. So with the development of electric equipment, tenders will be strongly encouraged to show how they plan to transition towards electric mowers, snippers and blowers. And I think you can all safely say as councillors, we do get many complaints about the noise the blowers make in our um, local suburbs. I also was fortunate enough to have a trial, a visit to a trial site where the, they used an electric mower um, on site versus the standard mower and the difference was quite remarkable. So I'm very keen for contractors to start using that new equipment if and where possible. Um, as far as the item E goes, Mr Chair, we often talk in this chamber about Brisbane's enviable lifestyle, our subtropical climate and wonderful green spaces. So this administration is dedicated to making the Brisbane of better, tomorrow is better than the Brisbane of today and this is what this new local law is all about. As mentioned by the Lord Mayor, this particular local law was um, amended back in 2009, and I just want to take this opportunity at this moment to um, thank all the officers in compliance and legal who have spent many, many hours on this local law rewrite. As the Lord Mayor has already mentioned, the countdown is on for Brisbane uh, 2032, and there's no time better now to start preparing our city for this once-in-a-lifetime event. But I would like to talk in more detail about some of the key changes that the Lord Mayor referenced moments ago. So many of the changes are designed to help make our city cleaner, and this includes introducing more responsibility on shopping centre owners and operators to manage and collect shopping trolleys. The new law ensures that abandoned tro tro shopping trolleys in the surrounding neighbourhood are retrieved in a timely manner. We're also tackling litter that appears in our street from unsolicited advertising the material. And the new provisions make it an offence to distribute materials in a manner that potentially causes litter. So from what I'll, to clarify that there, it's about the cadastral sorry, cadastral boundary of private property. So it allows us as a council to develop guidelines for industry as advertisers, publishers and distributors all have a key role to play in tackling behaviour that impacts the amenity of our suburbs. So the idea being people who are delivering um, anything through to people's houses and that if it lands on the footpath or the roadway that's considered littering, it needs to be delivered within the boundaries of the private property. Graffiti is another area addressed in this local law and we are amending provisions to require the timely removal of graffiti on private property, particularly when that graffiti is deemed offensive. We also having additional regulation on rubbish bins that will keep our city standards high. 
Residents will benefit from new requirements on preventing odour from both residential and commercial bins, as well as greater certainty over what constitute an appropriate period to present your bins for curbside collection and bring them in again afterwards. So this is if you've got a commercial facility who may only have one or two rubbish bins, but their need is out to three or four, we actually can make, have a conversation with them and make them get more regular or more um, rubbish bins on their site to deal with the issue. So at the moment, as far as the rubbish bin bringing them in, it's now defined as any time during the day immediately before the time of collection and at the end of the next business day after the time of the collection. So the days of residents, um, particularly out my way, uh, putting rubbish bins out and leaving them out there all week and just never bringing them back in from the curbside um, will be over. Um, the changes also transfer council's abandoned vehicle provisions from what we call PLACA, the Public Land and Council Assets Local Law. Um, so that'll bring it now into this local law. So while no changes to the provisions are proposed, during the review we identified Hassel as a more suitable location as a key issue in amenity and community safety. So at that note, Mr Chair, this local law is also aimed at making our city safer residents. Um, residents will be better protected by additional requirements on electric fences as well as the maintenance of ponds, swimming pools and prevent stagnant water. Um, on the issue of electric fences, um, we did look about removing all electric fences, um, but we did get confirmation from the state government that we couldn't do that because apparently there are some places that the state government um, runs that they do need electric fences for, so um, we're letting them keep their electric fences. But we are working to make our city safer by also introducing important exemptions to general provisions against camping on road and sleeping in vehicles. Now this is very important that we need to understand that this is very, quite clearly. So officers always try to approach every situation with common sense and compassion. They now have the express exemptions for reasons of personal safety, fatigue management or otherwise emergent circumstances such as homelessness or domestic violence something that was not there before. I need to make that very clear. Please do not misunderstand what is intended here. But we also want residents to be safe in their own homes and communities, so we have expanded the definition of unsightly objects to better address amenity and safety issues. Mr Chair, as my role, in my role as Chair of City Standards, I'm passionate about how we can best maintain our city and keep it clean and safe. The new amended uh, provisions help to protect our community's health and safety, advance the amenity of our city suburbs and ensure that we keep Brisbane beautiful for generations to come. Thank you. Councillor Landers. Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Second it. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the meeting adjourn for a period of 15 minutes which commences when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you. See you back here in 15 minutes. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr Chair. And I rise to sorry. speak about... Yeah, I had a misrepresentation, Oh, Chair. sorry. Not after. Not, I thought we did it after. I thought... Well, we went to, we went to afternoon tea after Councillor Mark's finished. Well, j thanks very much, Chip. Very right, Councillor Cassidy, your point of misrepresentation. Very briefly, I think Councillor Mark perhaps might have been confused I, about what I said and what Councillor Johnson said. What I said uh, was no reflection on the work um, that contractors had done. Uh, it was a reflection uh, on the casualisation of the workforce by contracting out these contracts rather than having them in-house. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Councillor Griffiths, A, B and E debate. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr Chair. And I rise uh, to speak uh, specifically on Clause E, the Health, Safety and Mendy Local Law particularly as it relates uh, to the burners. And um, I suppose I, I want to get up here. I think um, Councillor Casti has covered a lot of the points for the opposition. 
um, in relation to this, but my concern uh, is with the number of complaints that Council did receive in relation to this particular trial. And my understanding from the investigation work I've done is that in 2019, the number of complaints we received before we went to trial in relation to smoke affecting residents was 597. But in the 2020 calendar year, there were 1,040 complaints with regards to um, smoke and its impact on, on residents. And in, then in this financial year, there's been, uh, in 2021 uh, calendar year, there's to date been 565 complaints. So virtually the number of complaints in the year of the trial almost doubled. Um, and I don't think the administration has actually given us much of a breakdown on those complaints. Um, why was there such a huge number of complaints? Why did it spike so much? And what did these complaints, who are they from? What were they about? And we know that we have a number of uh, organisations, a number of health org organisations who are actually representing their residents and saying, yes, our residents, uh, people with asthma, um, people with other health issues are severely affected by this. And I don't think we've heard from the administration how they've dealt with this, how they've analysed this, or actually given us any real information uh, so that we can actually debate properly on this. So I'd ask the Lord Mayor, Lord Mayor, can you give us some more information in relation to that spike? So 2019 calendar year, 597 complaints. 2020 calendar year, which is the year of the trial, we had 1,040 complaints. And to date, this, fun, uh, this calendar year, we've had 565 complaints. So obviously, complaints are still going up uh, despite the trial being uh, undertaken. And I would have thought that a good trial would actually look at this information, a good trial would have an explanation of these complaints and what these complaints relate to, and then how we're dealing with them. And obviously, we aren't dealing with them if we've still got that same level of complaints. Um, I would also ask uh, that you give us a bit of an explanation of the analysis of that, uh, just so that it assists us in our understanding and, and um, the Chamber's understanding in relation to how we deal with this in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Griffiths. Further debate, A, B and E. Councillor Cunningham. Yes, thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on item B, the credit review of Brisbane City Council undertaken by the Queensland Treasury Corporation. I spoke about this in the chamber last week, as you'll remember, but again, it confirms that Brisbane's credit rating for the ninth year in a row, the ninth year in a row, is strong. This administration's track record of strong financial management and the continued investment and successful delivery of major projects is a key factor in our rating. Now, the opposition will think that the only way to manage a budget is to jack up the rates, but there is a thing called responsible budgeting. It's called making the tough decisions. And when you're in government, you have to do that. But I guess the opposition councillors wouldn't remember what it's like to be in government. On top of that, Mr Chair, we provided two rounds of rates relief last financial year, which means the average rates payable was lower than the previous year. Now, I'm going Councillor to repeat Johnston, that please. very slowly, OK? Repeating very slowly. No increase in rates payable. And this was made possible by an underspend in Kingsford Smith Drive. An underspend at Kingsford Smith Drive project. Mr Chair, the QTC effectively agrees with us, citing Council's large and diverse ratepayer base and, quote, demonstrated capacity to deliver and manage large infrastructure projects while maintaining adequate capacity to service forecasted debt levels. The strong rating category indicates Council's ability to meet its financial obligations in the short, medium and long term. QTC indicates that the capacity is not likely to be affected by adverse changes to business and economic conditions, including unforeseen financial shocks. Mr Chair, the financial position of this Shrina Council is a product of many years of hard work. It is not a given that we will receive this rating every year. And as conditions change, we need to be careful that we, uh, we can continue to work hard and maintain a strong rating. It's a testament to this administration's financial management 
and it's an ongoing commitment and one which will continue from both this Lord Mayor and this Finance Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cunningham. Further debate, A, B and E. Councillor Adaman. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I rise to speak briefly in support of item E, the amendments to the city laws, particularly in relation to littering in our suburbs uh, with advertising materials and community newspapers. As I indicated in this chamber before these amendments were put out to consultation, for reasons I don't really understand, littering is a bigger problem in my ward than it should be. These amendments go a long way to addressing this issue. Hopefully the days of advertising materials and community newspapers being strewn over our footpaths will soon be a thing of the past. Uh, Councillor Johnston, please. These amendments are about eliminating eyesores such as this. Chair, as you know, we're an Olympic city now, and as such, the eyes of the world are upon us, more than they have ever been. How we are being perceived is important for our long-term economic and tourism opportunities. Collectively, we need to take pride in how, how our city looks, and as an administration, take action where necessary, as we have done here against offending litterers, to ensure Brisbane is a cleaner city. The onus will now be on the producers and distributors of these materials to show the same pride in our community and respect the wishes of the majority of our residents. The amendment to the city law stipulates that distributors are required to either place their material in letterboxes or within the property boundary. My hope is that they will place their materials in letterboxes rather than take the easy hurl and hope option. Chair, I'll be keeping a, brief, a, a watching brief on how these amendments will work. A good start will be the reduction in the number of complaints about littering to my ward office each month. I hope this will be the case, and I urge the Chamber to join me in supporting Ida Me to ensure the Brisbane of tomorrow is, an even better, is even better than the Brisbane of today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Further debate on items A, B and E. Councillor Three. Thanks, Chair. I uh, rise to speak primarily on item E and uh, comment briefly on the, the penalty for sleeping in cars. I, I do understand the comments Councillor Marks made and I, I appreciate that the, uh, the new local law is in some, some sense as an improvement because it at least includes those specific exemptions. But I, I do remain concerned that um, that offence of sleeping in, the car, sl sleeping in your car still allows council officers a lot of discretion. Um, and we don't know for sure exactly how that discretion is going to be exercised on the ground. We can have a rough idea, managers can ask questions, etc. Um, but there is a little bit of ambiguity around that. Uh, I think, though, the, the deeper concern I have is simply that the offence isn't necessary. It's, it's trying to solve a problem that's not there and, in so doing, creating a larger regulatory burden for council officers and also a higher risk of criminalisation for vulnerable people. And by that, I simply mean that there are already other offences for littering, there's offences for um, relieving yourself in public spaces, there's offences at, at council and state level for causing noise nuisances, etc. So whatever problems that this process of having a fine for sleeping in your car is trying to solve can already be, be addressed through other council local laws or other state government offences. And so this to me seems a, an example of excessive and, and unnecessary over-regulation, where council has introduced an additional, or is kind of reintroducing an additional local law that doesn't actually need to be there on the books. The concern, of course, is that even with those exemptions, there will be some people who will uh, be hassled or may even be fined for sleeping in their car in, in situations where they don't need to be. So, I, I do still have strong concerns about that aspect of the local law. More generally, I, I note, and this actually came through in some of the commentary from the state government on the local law as well, that the, some of the offences are very broadly drafted and, and in general seem to allow council officers a lot of discretion, and I won't go through a lot, a lot of the specific examples, but the drafting is quite broad, and I, I understand the legal arguments in favour of broad drafting. Um, but what, again, that tends to do is give individual officers on the ground uh, a lot of discretion and, and there can be a high degree of subjectivity in terms of how these offences are, are enforced in practice. And that raises the usual concerns about um, people of different backgrounds or people who um, might be a bit more marginalised not being able to articulate their rights as clearly. And 
Um, we see this, a similar thing with the public land and council assets local law. Uh, you have these offences in, in both these local laws that uh, are so broad that if a council officer really wants to find someone for something, they can find a way to do it. Um, but often the, yeah, I think that ambiguity can cause a lot of issues for, for residents, particularly residents who are more concerned about knowing exactly where they stand with council on some of those issues. Um, which I guess brings me to the fire pits and, and, and braziers uh, in introduction. I guess I, I realise it's been a trial for a little while now. Um, and again, this, I think, offence is, is a little broad and I personally am a bit worried that the enforcement and investigation burden on council could become quite high. It won't happen immediately. It's something that will creep up over a couple of years. But as the costs of disposing waste lawfully through other means get higher, there will be more people who will be tempted to burn waste in their backyard under the guise of a backyard fire pit or under the guise of, oh, we're just having a little, little, little fire in the backyard to warm ourselves or to cook some um, food or whatever. The, challenge for officers will then be that they're getting called out to all sorts of fire complaints and some of those will be legitimate complaints, some of those will be perhaps illegitimate, but in general it, it would seem a little bit of a, a backward step to open that space up for council to have to spend a lot of time potentially enforcing whether or not people are having a, a backyard fire in a fire pit for a legitimate purpose versus just burning off rubbish because they don't want to spend money on taking it to the dump, etc. Um, I have lived in a couple of cities where backyard burning of various kinds was common, and, and it does at high volumes have a really significant impact on air quality. And um, personally, I really love a, a, a little fire in the backyard, and I love campfires. And um, I'm not personally dogmatic about this, but I do wonder a little bit how this is going to work in practice. I was concerned by the comments Councillor Griffiths raised that there have been an increase in complaints about the use of backyard fires uh, since the trial began and I acknowledge there could be a range of variables impacting that but what really troubles me most of all is that we did have some submissions from a range of expert what, what might be called expert advisory groups um, and, and they seem to quite strongly indicate concerns about this proposed change. At the same time, we had a pretty high volume of submissions expressing opposition to the change. So we have um, kind of specialists or expertise groups raising concerns. We have a really high propor proportion of um, public submissions raising concerns. And weighed against that, the administration is saying that there's strong public support for the change. And, and there may well be, but I, I, to be honest, I just don't think we have enough data to say that confidently. And it was interesting to see a lot of reference made to some of the Facebook posts. Uh, I pulled, put up one from the Lord Mayor where the question is, should the safe use of fire pits and braziers be continued in Brisbane? Um, and a lot of support via that Facebook post, undeniable, like um, probably almost a factor of 10, 10 times higher support than opposition. But if I were to put up a Facebook post and say, hey, everyone, do you like 30 kilometre hour speed limits, yes or no, and got a really strong show of support via that post, the count, some of the councillors in this chamber would stand up and say, but Jono, that's no way representative of the sentiments of the city of Brisbane as a whole. Um, you can't rely on a Facebook poll as a reliable and re representative indicator of general public sentiment. And in my own consultation processes, I don't do that. I do use a lot of online polling and online decision making, but it's not based strictly on Facebook. We use systems that are widely promoted through a range of mechanisms from newsletters to emails to um, various social media platforms. We don't just run our con con online consultations solely on Facebook. And I'm not suggesting that that's what council has done entirely. I acknowledge there's been multiple pathways for feedback. But I mean, the Lord Mayor's online uh, so Facebook pre presence is what, 16,000 or something like it's it's not huge in a city of millions of residents it's a fairly small proportion of the citizenry as a whole um, and certainly I, I I don't want us to get into the habit of equating uh, uh, arguably uh, a Facebook 
post that's probably a little bit subjective in terms of how it's worded. I, I don't think we should start to use one off or a couple of Facebook posts from the Lord Mayor as being a reliable indicator of public sentiment on an issue. And I'm, I'm not saying that to like throw stones or to be excessively critical, but I just would caution against the administration saying, hey, because a lot of people like the Facebook post, that means there's public support for something. Because if, if we start lose it using that logic, then um, there are a lot of changes that I've been proposing for a while now that the council really ought to be bringing in because, um, yeah, anyway, it's, I think it speaks for itself. But I, 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 I'm not necessarily debating the premise that there is strong public support for fire pits and braziers. And personally, when it was first proposed, I was like, oh yeah, that seems like an okay idea. And it was then, only then when I started to engage with the specific concerns raised by expert groups um, and right, raised by individual residents who were making evidence-based su submissions that I started to second guess that an initial support and I started to question it a little more closely. And I think this raises an important um, distinction between so-called direct democracy and deliberative democracy. And what the mayor sort of did with his Facebook post could be described as an example of direct democracy where relatively little information was provided to the public um, and a question was posed, should the safe use of fire pits and braziers be continued in Brisbane? Um, and on that basis, seeking feedback. When we have expert groups and, and independent advisory groups saying, actually, it's not possible for fire pits to be used in backyards safely because of their air quality concerns. So the very premise of the question that the mayor put to the public via social media was wrong. Um, and so I, I guess there's kind of an interesting question there about how much information do you give to the public before you open things up for a direct vote. And certainly the kinds of consultation we run when we run on online polls, we take the time to make sure that residents have plenty of information available and that expert evidence is gonna be considered and incorporated into decision making before inviting people to cast a vote rather than something that is too simple or too short or um, masks the nuanced impacts on minority groups. Thanks, Councillor Three. Further debate on A, B and E? Any further debate on A, B and E? Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. <clears throat> um, just dealing with the last one first, um, the issue of hassle, in particular um, the issue of, of um, backyard fire pits and braziers. Um, it's interesting because Councillor Shree was talking about direct democracy um, and the, um, the different ways to do that. Um, we're very clear that we consult people, we listen to people, but we're elected to make the decisions. If you want to outsource your decisions, then you shouldn't actually take a seat in this chamber. If, if you can't make decisions based on what you know and, and your uh, various means of listening to the community, then you shouldn't be here. And so people that want to make those type of um, policy decisions based on direct democracy, um, well, then there is no role for elected politicians. Um, so uh, the reality is um, we listen to the community in various ways, um, but also we know that um, uh, the um, opportunity to provide submissions was there for people. Um, not, not, I'm not talking about any kind of social media poll, but in terms of actual submissions during the formal submission period. Um, and. Um, uh, a range of different people and organisations um, uh, made submissions and that was also taken into consideration. Uh, but the reality is, um, if you have a look at the complaints uh, that, or, or the requests through the Council Call Centre and various contact channels that were made in relation to smoke and backyard burning, it was a trial uh, that started on the 1st of June last year and you remember um, this is when lots and lots of people were at home. Um, this was, you know, the first year of COVID. Everyone was at home. Everyone went out to Bunnings. Everyone bought or other um, outlets and bought, um, you know, a backyard fire pit or brazier. Um, and literally, um, there were a few days there where, like, almost everyone in the city was uh, cranking them up. Um, now, what's happened since then? is that we've seen um, the trend more normalising. We all have busy lives, um, and as much as you know, we'd love to sit around a fire, 
life gets busy and we don't have much time to sit around a fire. And so uh, in the um, emerging from COVID era, uh, we have seen, although people can still um, use the backyard fire pits and braziers, we, we never actually formally brought this trial to a close. It's still going on right now. And so if someone wants to, they can fire that up right now. Now, obviously, we're coming into summer and um, you wouldn't do that during summer normally. Um, but if you look at the calendar years, so for the complaints that were received about backyard burning and smoke in 2019, this is the calendar year, so January uh, through to December 2019. This was before we had any kind of trial. 597 complaints were received about smoke and backyard burning. Now, uh, to be aware, backyard burning is illegal and it remains illegal. You can't burn your rubbish um, or assorted items um, in the backyard. You just can't do that. And the only exceptions are for people that live on acreage properties where there's um, some strict rules about burning um, in, the, in those sort of situations. And so 597 complaints were received in the 2019 calendar year. That jumped up in the 2020 year, which was the COVID situation I talked about, um, to just over 1,000, 1,040. Uh, but this year, calendar year, January to December, and we're pretty much at the end of the year, we've got one month to go. Um, the complaints received so far this year were 565. And so um, I'd suggest that given that we're going into summer, we're not going to see a great number of complaints between now and the end of the year. It would be winter normally that would see um, most of those complaints. So this year, even though people are still allowed to use these fire pits and braziers, um, the complaints so far have been less than what we saw in 2019. Um, so I think we've seen that early burst of people uh, busting out the fire pits uh, because they could and because it was COVID. Um, and, and I think a more normalised version will see us uh, at no more of a level than what we, we have been before. Um, and I think that, that's, that's a good outcome in the end. Um, so uh, we'll continue to monitor that, obviously. Um, this local law does have um, strict requirements about um, smoke nuisance and there's action that will be taken in those cases. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, but this sort of uh, allows us with now pretty much two calendar years uh, of data uh, to, make, to make an informed decision and to allow plenty of community input and feedback in, in different channels. And so we'll continue to monitor it, but I think it will be um, a, a good, sensible community outcome uh, going forward. I just did also want to talk about um, the comments that have been made on the QTC review. Now, it's interesting. If you, um, if you go to a, a lender and you're looking for a home loan, um, you know, they will give you various forms to fill out. They will ask you for various bits of information and um, you have to provide them with accurate information. And they will then make a decision on whether to lend you money or how much to lend you. And um, we've seen a couple of people now say, Oh, the QTC review is only based on what you told the QTC. Well, first of all, I didn't tell the QTC anything. I can tell you our financial team sat down with them, provided them with all the information that they need. Um, and the QTC also happens to know a lot about council's finances because they have been our lender for many, many, many years, decades, in fact. So they do know about our financial position and they've been able to track it over the years. So this insidious suggestion that, oh, um, information's been provided to QTC, but it may not be actual accurate information, just think about how loaded that statement is. What does it actually mean? Does it mean that the council officers are lying to the QTC? That's one of the assumptions you could... And like I said, I didn't talk to the QTC about their review. I didn't meet with them. I didn't provide them with any information. Neither did any of the councillors. So the suggestion that our officers may have provided information that is not accurate or somehow lacking, I think is highly offensive. And as I said, that's a very insidious um, suggestion. 
Um, and so when you, uh, when you go and borrow money from anyone, they will do their checks, they will do their due diligence, but in this case, we have been a customer and a client of QTC for decades, so they do know. They don't, they don't just need to rely on the information that we provide us, they know, because they've seen year on year our financial situation and our status. So really what we're seeing is um, what I can view as a deliberate attempt to undermine the credit, the credit review and to call it into question. That's what has been done by the people that spoke against it and made those comments. They are attempting to undermine the QCTC's credit review. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Uh, the Lord Mayor is deliberately um, imputing motive um, towards the speakers who raised concerns about this issue. That is um, inappropriate behaviour under the uh, meetings local law, and he should withdraw from making those unfounded assertions. Councillor Johnston, I don't believe there are unfounded assertions being made by the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor. I think it's pretty clear, based on what I've said and how I've said it and how I've described it, uh, what I'm talking about here. Um, it, it's, the, it's the classic case of, let's call this report into question and then be offended that you're caught out for calling this report into question. That's what's happening here. Uh, so uh, we see you. We see you. We know what you're up to. The reality is the QTC is not a council entity. It is a state government controlled entity. Uh, they are in no way either biased for or against us. They simply want to know that when they are lending money to various councils across um, the state, that those councils have the ability to uh, have a strong balance sheet, and we've been rated having a strong uh, credit rating, and the ability um, to be a good borrower. And we are, and we are. And so, um, you know, any, any attempts to call that situation into question um, is very mischievous. So, uh, I would uh, commend all of these uh, reports to the Chamber and um, uh, I'll leave my comments at that. Thank you, Lord Mayor. We now move to the votes on items A, B and E separately. So first up, item A. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. no. The ayes have it. Division. Division caused by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor uh, Cumming. Thank you. Please ring the bells. Thank you, councillors. The division is on the uh, item A in the ENC report. Item A. All in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Any opposed, please say no and raise your hands. No. No abstentions. She voted. She voted yes. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 21 in favour and five against. Thank you. That motion is passed. We now move to a vote on item B. Item B, all in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Division. Seconded. Division called by the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Hutton. Ring the bells.
Thank you, councillors. The division is on item B. All in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. Raise your hands. No abstentions. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Clarks. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 25 in favour and two against. Thank you. Councillors, now the vote is on item E. Item E in the ENC report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnston and Councillor Sree. Everyone's here. We'll go straight to the division. Item E. All in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. No. Abstentions? Thank you, Clarks. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 25 in favour, one against and one abstention. Thank you, councillors. We now move on to uh, debate on items C and D. C and D, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, on item C and D, these two are linked. Um, the item D is the LGIP um, Amendment 1B, and um, item C is the LTIP Amendment 1B. Now, we've had a number of, sort of related submissions coming through in recent times with L LGIP and LTIP um, changes. And um, this is starting the process for, or ki kicking off the process for the major amendments, which would happen next year uh, to both of these uh, processes. So council must review any L LGIP um, within five years after its inclusion in the planning scheme. The LGIP review has been undertaken to ensure the LGIP complies with these statutory requirements and is accurate, relevant and current. Due to the length of time taken to make amendments to the LGIP and LTIP, amendments are being divided into phases to ensure the plans remain as up-to-date as possible. Previous amendments to the LGIP were minor in nature and focused on schedules and maps. The LGIP Amendment 1B is a major amendment and will provide a further update to the LGIP based on the latest information available. This amendment will come before Council in 2022, prior to progressing to the State uh, for review and public consultation. Um, the LTIP uh, proposal that's coming forward is, you know, is being done in order to align both the LGIP and the LTIP processes together, so that as we're making changes, uh, we can update both plans. They are linked. Things move between the plans, as we know. Um, just to point out a couple of critical points here. Number one, uh, there will be state interest checks before any major amendments are made. Uh, there will be public consultation before any amendments are made. Uh, secondly, uh, the LTIP and the LGIP are not the only infrastructure that Council builds, and they are certainly not the only plans that we have to build infrastructure. Uh, we build uh, lots of infrastructure uh, in addition to what is in the LTIP and the LGIP. The LGIP and the LTIP allow us to uh, set aside land for future um, use, whether it be to build infrastructure or uh, for particular upgrade projects, and also to collect infrastructure charges from, uh, from developers and builders and the construction industry uh, so that we can help fund infrastructure. Now, we heard last time um, we had this discussion on this, um, the opposition leader was talking about how there's um, supposedly an infrastructure deficit and that the infrastructure outlined in um, these documents uh, couldn't be covered by the charges collected. And I then pointed out that, well, uh, that it, that those infrastructure charges are capped by the state government, um, and the state government can do something about that. But I neglected to mention at the time that there were a few things that were related to property development that weren't capped. Things like land tax that the state government gets, and things like stamp duty or transfer duty when people buy and sell properties, 
these things are capped. These things um, mean that the cash is rolling in like we've never seen before uh, from the property boom that we're uh, seeing in South East Queensland. And that money is going to the state coffers. So you can see what's happening here. The state is cashing in on the property industry big time, big time. Yet when it comes to funding local government infrastructure, oh, there's a cap. We'll cap that because we want things to be more affordable, apparently. They don't seem to worry about that when it comes to transfer duty or land tax. Uh, so um, there's a little bit of an issue here of inconsistency. Uh, and um, it'd be good to see some adjustments made to the infrastructure charging regime to reflect the big increase in costs of building things that we've seen. And so uh, that would be a positive thing. And so when we hear about any kind of uh, so-called infrastructure deficit, uh, there is a way to help address that. And that is by the state changing uh, their cap requirements and changing the formula by which these things are calculated uh, to reflect the genuine growth in the cost of building infrastructure. Uh, so anyway, those, two th th those things are just important background for these two plans. Um, ultimately, we'll be seeing the major details coming through next year, and there'll be plenty of opportunity to debate those. There'll be plenty of opportunity for state review, for public consultation, and I commend these two items to the Chamber. Thank you. Further debate on CND. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks, Chair. The um, items before us is the, are the major amendments, 1B to the LTIP and LGIP. Uh, as we know, um, we saw uh, other amendments for these two items, these two infrastructure plans, come through the Chamber last week. Uh, so the plans we passed just one week ago are, of course, already out of date. Yes. Uh, and, and we know why. It's because this LNP administration took so long to develop uh, those initial LTIPs uh, and LGIPs in the first place, cho choosing the shortest possible horizon for them, then taking two years to develop them. Uh, and these amendments to the LGIP will keep happening until 2026, uh, and the projects listed on it will keep being pushed further and further back uh, beyond the horizon of these documents, which we see, uh, which we saw at those uh, amendments that came through last week, uh, and no doubt we will see um, with these amendments as they progress as well. Uh, the LGIP uh, was supposed to be Council's infrastructure roadmap for 10 years, uh, which was the minimum horizon that a Council could choose. Uh, it took two years to put in place, so the plan, uh, the plan itself uh, resulted in, a, in an eight-year horizon. Uh, and what we see, because of this LNP Mayor and LNP Administration's incompetency, um, so much of that work uh, being delayed and pushed back and left unfunded. So in 2021, after um, uh, this process starting way back in uh, 2018, we're still seeing amendment after amendment. So the time we get um, to 2026, all we will have seen is pushbacks, cuts and amendments to these plans uh, with very little tangible outcomes, which is not a very good, uh, not a very good uh, infrastructure planning arrangement coming in to an Olympics. Uh, so the residents of Brisbane, I'm sure, uh, when they see these projects that um, need to be delivered, whether they know what's outlaid in an LGIP or an LTIP specifically, I'm sure there are very few residents that, that sit down and pour over the tables, uh, if, they could, if they could access them and read them, of course, uh, of what is included uh, in an LTIP and an LGIP. Uh, but what residents do know uh, and what they do experience is, is a lack of basic infrastructure being delivered by this administration. Uh, there is a deficit uh, in the LGIP, and that's in black and white, and that's the document uh, that this administration produces. And the Lord Mayor talks, and he talked today about it, and he's talked previously about the caps uh, uh, precluding council from reaching the required funding uh, through developer contributions, and thus ratepayers have to chip in more for this infrastructure that is required as a result of a growing city. But what he never talks about are the developer discounts that they have given over many, many years to Chinese billionaire developers building five-star um, accommodation hotels here in the city, or cashed up uh, aged care providers, or student accommodation uh, that is later um, converted into other things uh, down the track. Um, developers have received um, significant uh, reductions in their infrastructure charges. Uh, and that's a decision, a political decision this LNP administration took. Uh, it's one that uh, the Labor opposition 
um, has opposed for those particular for those particular discounts because we know that the basic infrastructure that a city requires, that communities require, that suburbs require to make them accessible for people, that make their, their streets walkable, uh, drivable, uh, livable. So they have the parks um, that are required for all those new families moving into those places, the public transport um, options that are required as those uh, people move into those suburbs, uh, and things like drainage infrastructure as well to make sure that not just our communities are livable but our homes are livable in a flood-prone city that is uh, now feeling the impacts of uh, uh, human-induced climate change. Uh, so this Lord Mayor can get up and blame as he does in every single item, everyone else other than himself. Uh, but what he forgets to what he forgets to mention is that he's contributing to that deficit significantly through those political decisions to offer developer discounts to developers that really don't need them. Uh, they are just increasing the profit margin uh, of those private companies. Point of order. Point of order. To, uh, you, uh, relevance to the setting up of the LTIP and the LGIP. Yep. Could you come back to the item before? The LTIP and the LGIP is specifically about uh, the contributions that developer makes, that developers make, to fund the infrastructure that is required as a result of development. I would have thought the deputy mayor would know that. But chair, so these these are these are the starts of of these processes um, to uh, for major amendments. They don't include projects at the moment, uh, so we'll be supporting these items uh, today, but reserve our judgment on what is included when these items come back to the council chamber. Uh, in some period uh, going on the Olympus track record, that'll be three years from now. So it could perhaps be after the next election. Thank you. Further debate on C and D. Item C and D. Councillor Johnston. Thank you. I rise to speak on items uh, C and D. And I actually agree with quite a fair bit of what the opposition um, uh, opposition leader just said. Then. Um, I read with absolute astonishment the Lord Mayor in, um, on ABC yes. over the weekend. Yes. Um, number one, I think, agreeing with Councillor Shree, albeit for different reasons. Um, but number two, claiming that uh, fees for uh, infrastructure should be raised, that they're too low. Um, yeah, I know. I know. Um, now, I know Councillor Shree's got some views on this, and that's, that's fine. Um, but the problem, as I see it, is that this administration does not spend that money fairly, effectively and where it is needed. The problem is not the quantum of the revenue raised. The problem is the political pork barrelling that's going on through this planning process. Um, now, the Lord Mayor has made a number of statements um, here today introducing these two items, and again he's left the chamber. Um, he said, firstly, that the amendments that just went through last week and a couple of weeks before that, the LGIP and the LTIP, that have just literally been passed, were minor in nature. Now, the amendments that were just passed removed all stormwater drainage that Council identified in 2000 and 2001 as being critical to support future development, which has now happened in Yoronga. In 20 years ago, Council identified it as being critically important. It was, it's been in the LGIP, it was in the PIP when the PIP got created in 2014 in City Plan, it was in the LGIP when it became the LGIP, and this administration has successfully, has, um, successively cut it. So um, the minor changes that the Lord Mayor mentions are cutting all stormwater drainage uh, infrastructure investment in Yoronga. I don't consider that to be minor. Not only that, there have been massive cuts to the LGIP and the LTIP, um, and it is just not good enough that this administration creeps along, makes changes, makes it so hard for people to even read the documents, claims they're only minor in nature when they are removing all new infrastructure. Most of the suburbs in my ward have no infrastructure listed for them. Um, ten suburbs. Uh, Oxley's got a bikeway listed and a bit of drainage. Um, you know, that, look, there's barely anything. Meanwhile, um, suburbs in my ward have been upzoned. Up -zoned. Um, half of my ward is in a future growth zone. That, that's being ignored. Um, the other side of my ward has been upzoned to medium density. 
And, and this council, the one thing they've done out of the LGIP, I think in the whole time that it's been going, so seven years, um, they've whacked a million dollars into the Arboretum out of nowhere, out of nowhere. I mean, that could have come through parks funding. Uh, it, it just, it, it, it's, it's the planning that doesn't make sense. It does not make sense. Um, uh, there have been, there's been so much development through Yoronga, uh, through um, uh, Sherwood, uh, and Corinda, um, and this council has radically changed the face of those suburbs, and yet it is not investing in the necessary infrastructure um, that is needed. And now, after just finishing the process, they go, yeah, well, well that, that, we didn't do that very well, we're, it's already out of date, we've got to do it again. So the Lord Mayor said this had to be done every five years. They're doing it every year, basically. How incompetent are these people that they can't get a proper infrastructure plan together? Um, the Lord Mayor says, oh, there are other documents. I'd love to see them. I've been calling for all the lists of infrastructure, let me tell you, and it's a battle with the CEO to try and get that infrastructure uh, listing, LATMs, intersection upgrades. Um, you know, you'd think I was pulling teeth asking for uh, the lists that are being uh, considered by council. Um, and, and the really um, you know, fascinating part about it all is you'd think maybe the transport plan would have some list of infrastructure projects in it. We all remember that plan when it got debated in here a few years ago. There's no list of infrastructure projects in the transport plan. Um, meanwhile, um, areas of this city are just being decimated and neglected um, because this administration is pork barrelling. It is absolutely spending money in LMP wards to prop up uh, their own political ambitions, and that's just uh, appalling. Now, the Lord Mayor then goes on to claim, and I quote, there'll be public consultation on the LGIP and the LGIP. Well, we know that happened last time and the time before and the time before that. Guess what happened when the Lord Mayor did public consultation? Let's say just on the last lot. Did they make one change in response to the public consultation? No, they did not. So this is what this administration does. It says we'll consult with the public. They put their, uh, they put their um, list up on the website and they say that's consultation. No flyers went out on the LTIP, um, no flyers on the LGIP. It was down to councillors if they wanted to do something. Um, you had to go and find all these documents on the website. Like, you know, it's not, they don't make it easy. And then for the people who did that, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them in my ward, what happened? Did the LNP listen? Did they say, yeah, we, we hear you, thank you for making your submission? Do you know what they said? Two words, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. No change, no change, no change. This administration has absolutely lost its way. Um, they don't understand what the meaning of consultation is. When you put out something and say, here's what we're doing, that's actually called notification. It's a different thing to consultation, and this LNP administration fundamentally does not understand the difference. So when the Lord Mayor says there'll be public consultation, um, he doesn't actually mean he's going to listen to you. What he means is that you'll make an effort to have your say and speak up for the suburb or the area that, that you live in. He'll then say, duh, duh, no change. I don't care what you think, I'm doing what I was going to do anyway. That's how this administration has acted for 20 years almost, almost 20 years. Now, the Lord Mayor also made the point that these two documents are linked, that they need to be brought forward together as a reason for doing this. Now, the LGIP and the LTIP a year plus ago were actually brought forward together um, when they were uh, initially processed. Then, of course, the Lord Mayor decoupled them. So about a month ago, um, the LTIP came through first. Um, all the submissions from my residents were ignored, no change. And about a month later, the LGIP came through. Hundreds of submissions from my ward, Councillor Shree Ward, uh, Councillor Owens Ward, um, and again, hundreds and hundreds, 429 submissions, no change. The Lord Mayor chose to separate the LGIP and the LTIP. So how can we believe a word that he says when these two things are linked? He deliberately um, decoupled them when they came through council just last week. 
So I like the Lord Mayor to stand up in his summing up, which I know he won't do, um, because you know why bother answering a question a councillor might have in this place? If it's so important that these uh, documents are linked and brought forward together, why has he chosen just in the past few weeks to unlink them? Fair question. A bit like the mowing contract question about why we let mowing contracts by ward. Um, this is our Lord Mayor. He can't be bothered to respond to a question. He can't be bothered to actually have a debate in this place. He thinks just ignoring me is the way to go. Um, but guess what? Uh, it's really not. And uh, there's plenty of other ways I can get the information if he doesn't answer. Finally, uh, funding. Um, <sighs> The Lord Mayor um, made a big point today of sort of bashing up the state government about infrastructure uh, charges, um, and he said uh, that they are cashing in. Uh, the state government is cashing in on uh, development in this state. Guess what the Lord Mayor wants to do? The Lord Mayor wants to cash in on development in this state. The Lord Mayor is out there publicly stating that he thinks development charges should be higher. That's what he said to ABC this week. Despite giving discounts over and over again to big corporations, he and so with one hand he says, well, it's all right, um, this special interest group over here will do a sweetheart deal for them and they can have a discount. And then he'll go out to the public and say, well, no, hang on a minute, those infrastructure charges are too low, so we'll put them up. Meanwhile, the money he does get in from developers, you know, around $170, $150 million a year in a good year, um, it's being pork barrelled out into wards where there's not usually the development happening. The system is broken because of the people who are managing it and stuffing it up. The system needs to run fairly. Councillor Johnston, not. your time has expired. Further debate on CND. Councillor Adam. Alan, sorry. Adam Alan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise to um, speak on items C and D and uh, add a little bit more detail to the uh, points that the Lord Mayor raised. I will start with um, item D, the Algip Amendment 1B. Um, this item relates to the Local Government Infrastructure Plan and seeks Council's resolution to amend it. I would note that the submission before us today is, in essence, a matter of process to provide the mechanism to progress to an amendment. In accordance with section 25.3 of the Planning Act 2016, Council must review any LGIP contained in its planning scheme within five years after the LGIP was after when the LGIP was included in the planning scheme and if the LGIP has been reviewed, the LGIP was last reviewed. The LGIP was adopted by Council at its meeting on the 5th of June 2018 and took effect on the 29th of June 2018. To ensure the LGIP remains compliant, Council must complete its statutory review by the 29th of June 2023. The LGIP review has been undertaken in accordance with Chapter 5, Part 5 of the Minister's Guidelines and Rules to ensure that the LGIP complies with the statutory requirements and is accurate, relevant and current. So for Councillor Candice Cassidy's benefit, due to the length of time required to make amendments to the LGIP and LTIP under the guidelines, the Minister's guidelines, amendments are being divided into phases to ensure the plan plans remain as up-to-date as possible. You'll remember the recent LGIP and LTIP amendments 1A, which came through this uh, chamber and were adopted last week, and they're providing uh, limited updates to schedules and maps based on existing information. Those amendments refreshed both documents to align them with current information and budget priorities and will commence on the 10th of December 2021. The second amendment phase, LGIP Amendment 1B, will constitute a major amendment and will provide a further update to the LGIP based on the latest information available, including new plans, assumptions uh, and related growth. The full package is currently in preparation. It is anticipated it will come before Council in mid-2022, at which point approval will be sought to proceed to the formal State Government review and public consultation in a similar way to the last LGIP amendment, and it will be open for feedback. So moving on to item C, which is the LTIP Amendment 1B, uh, once again, um, this item relates to the tailored amendment to Brisbane City Plan 2014. And once again, I'd note that the submission before us today is in essence a matter of a process to provide the mechanism to progress to an amendment. 
Last week, Council adopted limited amendments to the LTIP, which refreshed the document for greater alignment with current information and budget priorities. Again, due to the length of time required to make amendments under the Minister's guidelines and rules, amendments to the LTIP are being divided into phases. The second phase of LTIP amendments will be major in nature and provide a further update based on the latest information available. Like the LGIP Amendment 1B, the full LTIP package will come before Council in mid-2022 before progressing to the State Government for review and public consultation. However, there is an additional step required under the Act for the LTIP Amendment. Under Section 18 of the Act, Council must give notice to the Queensland Government of the proposed amendment to the planning scheme. To ensure the LTIP is amended concurrently with the LGIP, Council must seek the Queensland Government's approval for a tailored amendment to the planning scheme, so the LTIP Amendment 1B is prepared and progressed following the same steps as the LGIP Amendment 1B in accordance with Chapter 5, Part 3 of the Guideline. This will allow for the two amendment packages to be prepared, publicly consulted on and adopted simultaneously. By proceeding with the proposed amendment, the Chief Executive of the Department of State Development, Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning will be requested to approve the tailored approach. Upon receipt of the Chief Executive's response and approval, Council will pr proceed to prepare the LTIP Amendment 1B and follow the tailored amendment process as approved. Together with the Local Government Infrastructure Plan, the LTIP Amendment will continue critical investment plans in city infrastructure essential to sustaining a growing city whilst creating exciting leisure and lifestyle opportunities and an envi enviable multimodal transport system. Um, there have been some questions today about the process and unfortunately the LGIP is treated differently to the rest of the planning scheme where the LTIP sits. Under the Minister's guidelines and rules, but they both have different processes to undertake the amendments. So while we will, we will align the steps and timeframes, the LGIP will be amended under one section of the legislation, and that's the LGIP amendment, and the LTIP will be amended under another section, and it will be a major amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. For the debate, Councillor Three. Thanks, Jared. Rise to speak on the infrastructure, infrastructure plan amendments and I guess I, I want to address these comments to the, the, the most intelligent and, and free-thinking councillors in the chamber, on, on both sides of the chamber, and I guess point out that there definitely is a structural problem here in terms of how we plan for infrastructure and how we pay for infrastructure, and it, it feels a little bit of a relief to finally hear the Mayor publicly acknowledging more clearly that infrastructure charges are too low. Um, I did want to just sort of take up a, a little bit of what Councillor Johnston had, had said as well, because I think that there's a really interesting conversation to be had about how we pay for infrastructure and where the money comes from and the, where, the, where the money's going. And we've said previously, we being the Greens, that number one, developers aren't contributing enough money to cover the cost of infrastructure in general. Um, number two, there's a, a problem where money collected from developments isn't necessarily spent on improvements in the local area. Um, and, and number three, too much money is being spent on larger intersection upgrades and in, ineffective road widening projects, and too little is being spent on public and active transport, green space, stormwater drainage, etc. Um, so I think all, though, all three of those points are true to a little to a point. Um, I think Councillor Johnson was sort of articulating that the, and I don't want to put words in in her mouth, but that a big part of the problem is that there's, there's plenty of money coming in, but it's been spent in LNP wards or it's kind of been port barreled to certain parts of the city. Um, we, we actually took the time, my office staff, to do a little bit of analysis on this, and it might be interesting to other councillors in this chamber as well. We, we picked my ward and we picked one or two wards out in the Burbs. I, I think we did Baruch Ward by, perhaps, and, and we did, um, I think it was Marchant Ward as well, and we were looking at um, how much money is coming in via infrastructure charges and how much is being spent on infrastructure. Because um, now that, that after a bit of advocacy from Labor and the Greens, that um, information is actually public and you can do the analysis yourself. And when we looked at the dollar figures more closely, we realised um, that actually most areas of the city, there's, there's not enough spending on local infrastructure. It's not actually necessarily a Labor or Liberal or Greens thing. It's that 
everywhere is um, falling behind in terms of the infrastructure that's needed for growing community. And what seems to be happening is that a big chunk of the money that is collected is, is being spent on really large road projects. Um, and sometimes those have a local benefit as well, but they're often focused on moving large volumes of cars from one part of the city to another. And so I, I just want to sort of interrogate or critique the narrative that the problem is that infrastructure charges money isn't being spent in the areas where the development is occurring. Really the problem is too much money is being spent on road, road widening and not enough money is coming into the system in general. And I think it's important, particularly I hope that the Labor councillors will take this idea on in, in good faith because it's, it's an easy narrative to say, oh, the money is not being spent in the local area. And that's certainly a strongly held view by a lot of local residents and it's a popular narrative to, to run at election time. Um, but like we, we looked at our, our electorate in the GAB award. Um, quite a bit of money, to be blunt, has been spent on a couple of intersection projects. So we had $10 million spent on the uh, intersection of Montague Road and Victorian Street. $10 million, one set of traffic lights. And then we had $5 million spent on the Vulture Street Montague Road intersection. So a couple of hundred metres along the road, two major intersection upgrades, $15 million price tag. Um, remembering that for each new apartment in an area, we only get $10,000 in infrastructure charges. So for the infrastructure charges from 1,500 apartments has just paid for those two traffic lights. And forget, you know, there's no money for stormwater, park, new parkland, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, and you know, that's just that one, one little case study. But there's, it, it does seem to us that the, Actually, the, the amount of money that council is collecting in, in infrastructure charges simply doesn't come close to, to covering the cost of that, the actual delivery cost of, of infrastructure. And as I've said before in this chamber, part of the problem is outsourcing and private contractors adding in their own fat profit margins. And part of the problem is developers not putting enough money into the system. But I also wanted to highlight and critique a narrative that we've heard the mayor and the LNP run a couple of times in this chamber, and that I've also heard Labor state government ministers run at times, which is that if you increase developer infrastructure charges, that will put upward pressure on housing costs. Um, we've probably all heard that at one point or another. If you charge the developers more, they'll pass that on to the end consumer and the prices of buying an apartment or a house will go up proportionally. That's not true. That's a lie. It's a blatant lie told by the property industry. Um, they repeat it at length, but it doesn't stack up to rigorous economic analysis. We've got a few good case studies to look at in, in the Queensland context, because 10 years ago, um, the, cap, the state government brought in the cap on, on infrastructure charges. And even though that cap was brought in, and suddenly a lot of councils were able to weren't able to charge as much to developers from infrastructure charges, that had no measurable impact on property values. It wasn't like, oh, suddenly there's a cap, councils can't charge infrastructure charges to developers, the developers will pass on that discount to buyers. They didn't, the, it, it had no discernible impact. But similarly, what the, the economic modelling suggests, and there's a, an economist, Cameron Murray, is worth looking up in this respect from UQ, but there's a few others who've done similar, similar studies, is that if you increase the cost of, a, of new private development, such as by adding on infrastructure charges, um, the, the property industry and the market responds by changing their calculations of how much profit they can make from certain development sites because their costs have risen. And so if a developer says, oh, actually, it's going to cost me a bit more now to build new apartments on a certain site or in a certain neighbourhood, that puts downward pressure on land values because developers still have to meet the market in that there's, there's plenty of existing housing stock out there that's up for sale. So if you're, if you're building and selling new apartments or new houses, you can't sell for drastically higher prices than existing stock that's already, you know, maybe was built a couple of years ago and is up for sale again. So the, the really large proportion of existing housing supply out there in the market is really what's setting the price as opposed to um, the price of new housing and new apartments being dictated primarily by construction costs and land values. And so what that means is that if construction costs or project costs increase as a result of something like infrastructure charges, or indeed as a result of making it mandatory to include rooftop gardens and solar panels like we were talking about last week, if the costs of a development rise, 
and that cost is sort of a generalised cost increase that's spread across the city or a neighbourhood or is um, you know, being implemented across the entire LGA, such as would be the case with changes to infrastructure charges, then the property industry will respond by attaching less value to land because the development potential or the profit potential of those sites is slightly reduced. And that's a really good outcome. If increasing infrastructure charges means some developers are like, oh, well, we don't want to pay as much for land anymore, that puts downward value on land, uh, downward pressure on land values, which in turn makes it easier for council or the state government to buy that, those sites for public parkland and other forms of public infrastructure like land for libraries and community halls and all that sort of stuff. So there's actually a really strong benefit here to increasing infrastructure charges. Not only does it mean that there's more money coming into council coffers to pay for the stuff we need, but arguably it would also have a slight downward pressure impact on land values themselves. So there's kind of a double benefit there. And I think it's important that all councillors in this place understand that this narrative that the development industry continually trots out month after month, year after year, that, oh, if you increase charges, we'll just pass that on to buyers. It's not true. It doesn't stack up to rigorous economic analysis. There's no hard evidence for it. You can twist the numbers if you want. You can cherry pick stats and try and build a contrary argument. But the blunt reality is that in, in a system where most, private, most development is undertaken by the private sector um, and most of the housing stock is already out there in existence. It's not like we're building a brand new city from scratch. Um, developers still have to meet the market and they can't pass on significantly higher construction costs or project costs for new developments because there's still existing housing stock out there that they're competing with. So, um, I, I do hope that the Mayor has taken on board these comments as well. I've sent him articles about this. We really need to have the courage to resist these, this spin that the property industry is putting out there and recognising that in, increasing infrastructure charges will benefit everyone in the long term. It will certainly benefit the residents who end up living in these areas. It will allow us to have the money for stormwater infrastructure and new parks and new libraries and all that sort of stuff. But it will also make it for, easier for first home buyers to buy their own blocks of land because there'll be less pressure on land values, which in turn makes sites more affordable for owner occupiers and small time developers and housing co-ops. Thank you. Thank you, Council Three. Further debate on C and D? Any further debate on C and D? Lord Mayor? No further debate? Uh, councils will put uh, C and D to the vote. All in favour of C and D, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Thank you, councillors. We now move on to item F. Item F, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, as discussed previously uh, in this chamber, uh, the um, item F is um, meetings amending local law, um, which uh, seeks to do a number of things relating to uh, the way improvements to the way this meeting operates uh, to make sure that um, we're uh, operating in a way uh, that um, is consistent with the law um, and consistent with the state regulations, the law and the City of Brisbane Act, uh, but also um, uh, we're not seeing, um, uh, so we're seeing a situation where there's also an ability for family friendly hours as well, which is something that we know is, is supported up at George Street with the way that they hold their meetings. Uh, so uh, the process for this local law went out for consultation. Um, a total of six submissions uh, were received. Two submissions were from the Queensland government. Um, we uh, made some amendments based on uh, those Queensland government submissions. The amendments included deletion uh, of the concept of automatic adjournment of council meetings after a period of time. Um, obviously, this is uh, something that's come into play in recent times, um, which uh, was interesting. Uh, as you know, um, the, the previous um, requirement for the meeting to be adjourned automatically after seven hours um, was, was in place. Um, and this was to ensure that uh, council would not stand adjourned unless it is voted on by the council, um, so that it was a clear decision of the council. Uh, there was an inclusion of a motion of dissent 
for an aggrieved councillor regarding a declaration of unsuitable meeting con uh, conduct. Um, we ensured that remote participation at meetings is included in all relevant sections. Uh, amendments to the process for raising points of order have been made. Um, obviously, once again, um, we've had an issue recently about points of order, and so that's being cleared up to make sure that people, people can continue to make points of order in the way that they have always done. Um, adoption of the, uh, there's some amendments made relating to the adoption of committee meeting minutes, revising public attendance provisions to be consistent with the City of Brisbane Act 2010. Uh, amendments to ensure consistency with existing legislation and the clarification of the definition of standing rules. Uh, the main changes being put forward in this draft um, are amendments to include references to virtual meetings and electronic attendance, clarification on how the video broadcast is to be used, using the same words as the State Parliament. So here, I'm sure we'll hear that you know, this is somehow anti-democratic, but up the road in George Street, perfectly fine. Uh, we never see that kind of um, difference in approach, do we, uh, in this chamber? Uh, we've uh, extended the deadline for the receipt of a notice of motion. Uh, as you know, um, in the past, it's been um, the Thursday afternoon before, five o'clock on a Thursday before the Tuesday meeting. Uh, we've been incredibly uh, flexible here and allowed notices of motion to be um, put forward by 1 p.m. the business day prior to a council meeting. So 24 hours of a meeting, people can put a notified motion in. I think it's very fair and reasonable. Um, and that gives people more opportunity uh, to put in notices of motion. We've also amended the criteria for suspending standing rules by way of a motion to require a council to clearly establish the reason for not providing a notice of motion, i.e., if you're going to put an urgency motion, make sure it's actually an urgent motion and not just a fake urgent motion like we've seen um, for the last 18 months or so from the Labor Party. Um, motions that are in no way urgent, that are in no way time sensitive, uh, but just being used as a political stunt uh, and wasting this council's time. Uh, limiting contributions in general business to one 10-minute speech per councillor in line with our desire to have more family-friendly sitting hours. And so uh, these are the key changes being proposed and I commend these changes to the Chamber. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I rise to speak on this item, the uh, meetings amending local law. And the Lord Mayor has said this is all about how uh, council operates and it's quite clear um, he wants it to operate in a way that suits himself uh, and suits the LNP. Not, nothing to do with uh, improving scrutiny or accountability uh, for the people of Brisbane. There's nothing about a good order in this place. And the Lord Mayor, at least he's not shying away uh, from the fact uh, in his comments um, here today and previously in this place that this is all about, uh, all designed to limit uh, the ability for uh, for non-administration councillors to raise important issues here in the council chamber. So I suppose you have to ask yourself the question, Chair, uh, when you were in power... Point of order to you, Lord Mayor. Claim to be misrepresented. Noted. So you sort of ask yourself the question, uh, Chair, what do you do when you are in power but you really don't have much control yes. um, of the situation around you? And that's obviously something that this LNP Lord Mayor has been pondering for some time. Uh, he's just said, yeah, change the rules. He just said he, didn't, he doesn't like the way in which uh, councils have been using the rules of this place. They've been breaking the rules in moving those, those motions and the suspension of standing orders. Uh, there's, been, there's been no referrals to the OIA or to the department or to anyone, anyone about the use of the standing rules, but the Lord Mayor has made it very clear he just doesn't like it. This LNP Lord Mayor just does not like that kind of accountability and that kind of debate in this place. He likes to have total and utter control. He doesn't, the LNP administration don't like community consultation because residents are starting to use their voice against this LNP administration. And he doesn't like it here in the chamber when we use our voices uh, and, our, and our democratic prerogative to raise these issues here uh, in the chamber. So we don't support 
Uh, we're not going to be voting in favour of this amendment. We don't support the amendments to urgency motions uh, that the Lord Mayor has outlined. They are anti-democratic and they are aimed at stifling debate in this chamber and preventing, preventing non-administration councillors from raising important issues. Uh, if the Lord Mayor wasn't a hypocrite, he and his team wouldn't be supporting these urgency motions this session that Labor councillors have been raising, uh, thus endorsing the urgent nature of them, but then delaying them by a week or in some cases years yes. on the one hand, Chair, and then on the other hand arguing that these things are not urgent, like he That's has just done today. It's just, just last week we had a, a motion that the, uh, on, on the suspension of standing orders for a, a, an urgency motion that they supported, but, now they're, but they're saying they're not they are not urgent motions. So, so Chair, you, you, you've got to take what the Lord Mayor is saying about these matters uh, with a grain of salt. He's, absolutely, they'll take that injection, Councillor Griffiths. He is 100% a political operator. He's a political operator and has been his whole life, and he's trying to change the rules to suit himself. So in the, last, in, the, in the previous year, Labor moved 13 motions for the urgent reinstatement of curbside collection, the curbside collection service, which had been cut by this LNP mayor. And each and every time these motions were voted down by the mayor uh, and those councillors. And that was their prerogative. They could do that. And it was all well within the rules. We also moved urgency motions calling on footpaths to be fixed, local jobs to be supported and bushland to be preserved. And these people on this side of the chamber chair have the gall to stand up and say, Labor doesn't bring anything. We don't put anything on the table. Uh, well, we do. We do. Meeting in, meeting out. They just don't like talking about it because we are bringing, we're shining a light on their deficiencies, Chair. And what do you do when you don't like that? If you're the LNP, you just go and change the rules. You just go and change the rules so those things can't be discussed. Uh, as we've said, the Lord Mayor has now admitted on several occasions today and previously when this first come that the changes to these local laws are politically motivated. He has spat the dummy entirely and decided to use his massive majority in here to wind back the democratic rights of elected councillors. Uh, we'll just remind those LNP councillors, and they like the quote about it today, their massive majority here in the council chamber. And uh, Councillor Cunningham said earlier that, that the election result was overwhelming. Yes. Uh, she, she didn't point out that the LNP councillors only won 52 per cent of that two party preferred yes. vote. Yes. Uh, so you might, hold, you might hold 19 wards, uh, but you are on wafer thin margins. And when you start playing around, we start playing around with the rules of democratic debate in a place like this, which is entirely on message with the way in which you treat local residents through community consultation processes, you will be booted out at the next election. And we know this is all politically charged as well, because when you go and look at um, the initial submissions, the ENC submission uh, and all of the material on file, there is absolutely no record of why this was requested. Um, we know that the Chief Legal Officer was tasked by the Lord Mayor and Civic Cabinet to draft these changes that he was instructed um, to do um, at the LNP's request in this place, um, but there is no reason why these laws are being changed. Sure, uh, if there are definition issues and um, issues with state legislation we need to align with, we have to do that. We have to do that um, because we are bound by that through the City of Brisbane Act and City of Brisbane Regulation. But it's quite clear these political changes have been directed solely by this LNP Lord Mayor to limit debate and limit accountability uh, in this place. Uh, we also don't support proposed amendments surrounding audio and visual recordings of council meetings and their use. These changes would limit the use of meeting footage that is already publicly live streamed onto YouTube. It's happening right now. Uh, it would also give the chair of this council the ability to verbally, re verbally revoke accreditation to, the mem to members of the media at any time. Um, uh, this, this does nothing um, but limit uh, the ability for the media to hold this administration, and, and any administration for that matter, um, to account. Uh, and that's an important thing to do. Uh, so to say that these changes to this meeting's local law um, have gone too far is a complete understatement. Uh, the LNP mayor is going to extreme and extraordinary lengths to avoid accountability in this place. Uh, he doesn't like uh, the people of Brisbane seeing him for who he truly is. Uh, and in the, in the words of Lord Acton, 
uh, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we need we need some uh, very robust rules uh, and regulations in uh, in place to ensure uh, that there is sufficient accountability on the political decisions that this political administration is doing. And we have to bear in mind they, they like to go around and say they are council. Well, they are not council. Council is an organisation that is made up of eight and a half to nine thousand people plus contractors. Uh, what they are is a political administration, uh, and in this place they use their massive majority to make changes. They use their massive majority. You You've are got not the, the council, council assurance. <laughs> count Councillor Murphy, please. No, I'm standing in a council chamber. This is not the council. You are not Councilor the council, Murphy, Lord Mayor. You are the Lord Mayor. You're a, polit you're a politician. Lord Mayor, please. Lord Mayor, please. Councillor Cassidy. These are political decisions being made, and, and this, this LNP Lord Mayor doesn't like people calling him out on the political decisions that are being made, uh, and we will continue to do that, whether he is trying to stop us in here um, or not. So these, these, these amendments are anti-democratic, uh, and there's no two ways about it. Uh, we also don't support the proposed changes which give um, LM the LNP administration more ability uh, and reason to close council meetings to the public. There should be very, very, very limited reasons why council meetings should be closed to the public. These amendments propose that meetings can be closed to discuss issues such as the disciplining of the CEO or senior executives, rating concessions or even the council budget. So it's now up to this LNP administration to determine that a council meeting could be closed uh, for budget deliberations. And that's the, that they are some of the most important meetings that a council can have that elected representatives, um, political representatives making decisions on behalf of ratepayers can have, and now this LNP administration is seeking the ability to have them closed to scrutiny and closed uh, to the public. Uh, the people of Brisbane pay for us to exist. Uh, they elect us to make decisions on their behalf, uh, not just on the whim of the LNP. So they deserve to know what's going on in this place, in this council chamber, how their money is being spent, how their elected councillors are representing them. Whether it's good, bad or ugly, uh, they deserve to know. And finally, uh, the opposition does not support the politically motivated changes to limit councillors speaking only once during general business. Uh, it's another amendment deliberately aimed at gagging non-administration councillors and limiting their ability uh, to contribute in this chamber. Uh, democracy uh, in this chamber is certainly under threat from this LNP Lord, Ma Lord Mayor. Uh, and no matter how much he tries to rig the rules uh, in this place, Chair, uh, we're not going to be silenced either here in the chamber uh, or out in the community right across Brisbane. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Further debate on item F? Further debate? Oh, point sorry, point of misrepresentation. Point of Mayor, misrepresentation. Uh, Council Cassidy suggested that the change to urgency motions uh, was about stopping opposition councillors having their say. And in fact, we made it easier for people to lodge notified motions, which gives them more opportunity to have a say. Thank you. Councillor Cunningham. Yes, thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on item F. And I'll get to some of the specifics raised by Councillor Cassidy in a moment. The Local Government Act 2009 provides that the chief executive of a local government must make model procedures for the conduct of meetings of a local government and its committees, and that the local government must either adopt the model procedures or prepare and adopt other procedures for the conduct of its meetings and meetings of its committees. The Meetings Local Law 2001 outlines the standing rules and provides for proper councillor, public speaker and public attendance conduct at council meetings. Recent amendments to the City of Brisbane Act and the City of Brisbane Regulation and the Local Government Act require that the Meetings Local Law 2001 is amended to ensure consistency with the standing rules applicable to council meetings and standing committee meetings. On the 14th of September earlier this year, council resolved to propose to make the meetings amending Local Law 2021. And in accordance with Council's local lawmaking procedure, Council undertook public consultation from the 27th of September until the 18th of October on the proposed local law. This included a state interest checked by a consultation with the Queensland Government and the departments. As the Lord Mayor said, just six submissions were received, including two from the state. As a result of this consultation, a number of minor changes have been proposed, which I'll now go through. The existing provision relating to the automatic adjournment of a council meeting, which has sat seven hours, has been removed. 
This is to ensure that a council will not stand adjourned unless it is voted by the council. A provision has been included to ensure that minutes of committee meetings are endorsed by the committee members. This is to codify an existing practice. An amendment has been included to limit the purpose for which a committee chair or a chair of council can evict a member of the public. This has been limited to the same reason for removal because of a closed meeting and also disorderly conduct to be consistent with the legislation. An amendment has been made to remove the existing limit of points of order to being raised in debate only. This is consistent with existing practice prior to the decision of the OIA that you raised at the start of this session, Mr Chair. Amendments have been made to ensure exact consistency with legislative provisions and to ensure consistency across all amendments in terms of terminology. Amendments have also been made to ensure that councillors appearing by audio or video means are deemed to be present. This is to ensure consistency with the legislation. Moving back to the substantive shifts in the local law now, Mr Chair. Advances in technology and the flexibility required due to the pandemic and other reasons have led to the inclusion of references to electric, electronic meeting attendance in the local law. With another year of unpredictability ahead, we know that virtual meetings are here to stay and it is positive that it is enshrined in the local law. Another change required due to the modernisation of our council meetings is references to video recordings and the broadcast. Consistent with the state rules on the use of parliamentary broadcast, there are changes to clarify how the council meeting video can be used. Now, councillors should be free to use the broadcast to highlight and communicate matters of importance that they have raised in the chamber. However, the broadcast should not be used selectively to take councillors' order, words Chair. out Point of, of their original context. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Councillor Cunningham. Will Councillor Cunningham take a question? No, I won't, Councillor Shree. As no. I was saying, councillors um, should the video broadcast should not be used to take councillors' words out of context and to run misleading advertising campaigns. In fact, no political party should be doing that, and I'll stand by that comment and the Labor Council team have serious form in this space. We hear the opposition cry crocodile tears on the alleged death of democracy. Well, I'm far more concerned about their juvenile behaviour in manipulating and twisting the words of councillors in this place. That's what's demeaning to this chamber, and it is behaviour reflective of extreme fringe groups and those who want to move politics into a post-truth era. Oh. The changes proposed here are entirely consistent with the rules currently supported and consistently enforced by the state Labor government and the Speaker and the Clerk of the Queensland Parliament. The updated local law gives councillors additional time to provide a motion for debate. Those opposite have made all sorts of ridiculous comments about this amendment. Yet, while on one hand they have welcomed recent changes to how meeting documents and agendas are distributed prior to a meeting, they still believe they should have the right to move motions without any notice to their colleagues under the clearly false pretense of urgency. Yes, the changes mean that legitimately urgent matters, which could not have been possibly foreseen the day before, can still be debated. What we don't support is the ongoing misuse of urgency motions for political game playing by those opposite. It is completely hypocritical for those opposite to peddle lines on Facebook and to the media saying this change limits their ability to raise matters in the chamber when it in fact does the complete opposite. There is a long established procedure for placing motions on the council agenda. These amendments mean we are going even further to provide the opportunity for councillors to put forward matters for debate in a transparent manner. Now, regarding the media, there have been no changes to proposed rules around journalist accreditation. I have not heard any specific examples of issues around the current process, and in fact, no submissions were received from journalists. Once again, this is scaremongering, Mr Chair, from the opposition. Now, on general business limitations, the response from non-administration councillors has been out of proportion. 
Nobody ever watched a meeting of the Brisbane City Council and thought, gee, I wish councillors had more speaking opportunities. I can guarantee that, Mr Chair. There are plenty of speaking opportunities. Let's count them with the ENC report, eight committee reports and general business. That's 10 opportunities to make 10-minute speeches for each and every councillor, including the non-administration councillors. Yet for all the rhetoric from Labor on family-friendly hours, they refuse to back a common sense limit to, gen to limit the general business debate to one speech per councillor. Never mind the fact that in adjournment debates in the Labor-controlled state parliament, only a few limited few get three-minute speaking slots. In conclusion, Mr Chair, councillors have had two opportunities to contribute to this local law review. And where legitimate, we have made amendments based on feedback. Our bosses, the people of Brisbane, don't think this chamber should be a place for political games. It is a place of business. And the rules governing the conduct of these meetings should allow for professional and civil debate. And I would like to commend this local law to the chamber. Thank you. Further debate on F. Councillor Johnston. Uh, yeah. Um, I rise to speak on item, I think it's F, isn't it, uh, it is that F. we're speaking on? Yes, item F, the meeting's uh, local law. Um, and uh, I'll just put on the record that uh, I was one of the submitters. I'm, I'm so pleased to see that uh, the LNP councillors um, made an effort to put in a submission. They did it, uh, apart from you, Mr Chairman, who you know, didn't need to because the OIA clearly got that wrong and it was just completely unnecessary. You decided to interpret what they said and apply it erroneously, um, uh, so just unnecessary. But what Councillor Cunningham has just read out, she's read out a speech that was written for her with her head down, um, is extraordinary. So I just want to say um, a few things. Firstly, <clears throat> yes, this is Brisbane City Council, um, and guess what? The only people in this place who don't think it is Brisbane City Council is the LNP. They've taken ownership of Brisbane yes. City Council, and it's now yes. called the Shrina Council. So let's be clear. Oh, and they're all here hearing. So when the Lord Mayor hopped up here full of mock outrage about uh, this is not Brisbane City Council and had a go at Councillor Cassidy, he publicly calls this council after himself. This is how out of control the LNP have got, and this is a brand new thing that only started a few months ago. Um, so when he stands up and says, this is Brisbane City Council, um, that's not what he does every single day now. He calls this the Shrina Council. So let's just be clear. The people who are making these new rules today are not interested in open and transparent debate in this place. They are not interested in fairness and transparency. They are not interested in making sure that everybody can contribute to debate in this place. Councillor Cunningham, in her speech today, all councillors have an opportunity to speak whenever they want to speak. I tried to speak earlier today, and guess what? They voted down my right to speak. Um, so let's be clear. If the LNP have used the guillotine over and over and over in this place to deny people the opportunity to speak, their track record is about limiting debate. Their track record is about shutting down debate. Their track record is about hiding decision-making processes. That's what is going on. And these meetings, local law changes, do nothing to enhance the transparency uh, and the fundamental importance of open and transparent debate in this place. Now, I did go to the effort of making a reasonably um, detailed submission. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, there's a couple of responses on here. There's four dot points. Uh, in response to my submission, which was one, two, three, three sort of full pages. The first one is um, the adjournment, automatic adjournment has been deleted. Well, um, apparently the state government told them to delete it, so that's not even in response to my submission. Two, the minutes of the meeting, there's a new subsection um, so that the previous committee meetings have to be put to the members of the committee for endorsement. Now, anybody who knows me on any committee that I've ever been on, and Councillor McLaughlin is a prime offender here, 
um, knows that half the chairs in this place don't even put their meeting minutes to the committee for endorsement. Councillor Marx doesn't do it. I mean, you go to any community meeting in the suburbs, a PNC or a Neighbourhood Watch, first item of business is apology, second item of business is um, approving the minutes. Who gets to approve the minutes? The people who are on the committee. Except in this place, where if you're on the committee, you don't actually get to approve the minutes. The chair does it on their say-so. I mean, it's taken 14 years of me complaining about this for it to be changed. Presumably the state government told them to do that too, because they don't listen to me. The third dot point here says, um, 75 five, public and media behaviour at uh, meetings amended to remove reference to civic cabinet. That's not what I asked for. That, dot, that response allegedly to my submission is not what I asked for with respect to section 75 five. I objected to the chair having the power to let every Tom, Dick and Harry mate of the LNP into this chamber when they feel like it. So that dot point's completely irrelevant to my submission, and presumably it's been put in there to beef it out. Um, and the fourth dot point, um, that there should be a definition for standing rules. Um, and this is why there is so many problems um, you know, with these local laws, that the language has changed over time, but it's not changed consistently through the document. So basically, I'll say the LNP's not listened to my submission. Um, there's a few things I want to put on the record. Um, firstly, um, and Councillor Cunningham again, just no idea about what's about to happen here. Um, disorderly conduct is gone. There is no such thing as disorderly conduct any longer. Um, that's been a well-known and well-established process of identifying um, uh, issues in this chamber that people seek rulings on. It has been abolished. Interjecting, interjecting is no longer disorderly behaviour. It's all gone. Um, you can defame someone if you want, not disorderly behaviour. Um, the, meetings local now, the meetings local law now refer to unsuitable meeting conduct. Um, it goes on to say that unsuitable meeting conduct is actually defined in the Local Government Act. Well, no, it's not. Um, what the Local Government Act says is it's actually the Councillor Code of Conduct. No. So, going forward, I'm going to be really fascinated to see how this meeting is going to be run because interjecting is no longer disorderly. It's not even unsuitable meeting conduct. I don't know how this place is actually going to run. No, no. And whilst the chair might think he has residual powers under section 12, subsection 3, let me be clear. The decision to abolish specific disorderly conduct and to not put rules in makes it very clear that there aren't any. Right? If the court has to come back and interpret this, there's a very clear decision being made here to remove all of these things as disorderly conduct. It's a very deliberate decision. I don't think it's a good one. I think we need some general rules. Um, but there are a lot of other problems here. The LNP did not take the opportunity to fix up some other issues uh, in here. Many of them have been outlined by the previous speakers. I actually thought that this would be the opportunity to fix up question time myself. Um, I think we should limit questions to one minute and answers to three minutes. We would get through more questions. We could have more uh, interaction. Um, but no, that wasn't considered. Um, I mean, I didn't get a no change. I just got a no response altogether. So you know, that, that's really delightful. Um, you know, these these are reforms that have already happened at the state and the federal um, level. Uh, they've introduced introduced supplementary questions down there. But limiting the time uh, frame to ask a question and answer a question would have been a very good and practical improvement to this place. But no, that didn't happen. Um, there are massive problems um, here with um, uh, closing the meeting, um, and I absolutely and fundamentally do not support those changes uh, to the meeting's local law. Um, it is uh, improper that this council can close council meetings on pretty much any issues it wants now. Um, again, that undermines transparency and openness and accountability, and that is not appropriate in my view. Um, 
the process of warnings. I appreciate that there's now a system set out in the uh, Local Government Act, um, but this administration takes it further. Um, it gives the uh, Chair of Council unilateral power to eject somebody as the first response, which is absolutely not right. And I've been to the Supreme Court three times to try and stop the abuses of the chairs in this place, and it's not acceptable that it has continued over such a long period of time. This just gives more unbridled power to the Chair of Council, who acts politically um, and acts in the interests of their own party and not in the interests of fairness and transparency in the running of uh, debate in this place. Um, for many years, I voted against the minutes in this place since this change was made. Um, I don't believe that the CEO of Council and his staff should be able to change the draft minutes before we've seen them. He's been doing that for some years now, since Councillor Dick and I raised some concerns about his behaviour. Um, and it's wrong, in my view, that we don't see the draft. Um, that is just wrong. Uh, uh, there's lots of other issues here as well. Um, you know, uh, I think that there is a very big, um, uh, very big problem in allowing the chair's powers to go outside um, the running of the meeting here. There's some attempt to sort of claim he can do anything he wants under any legislation. Well, that's just not how things work. Um, it won't work. Um, Councillor are... Johnston, your time has expired. Further speakers? <laughs> Councillor Wines. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. I rise to speak to item F. Um, and I'd like to, to make a small confession. I really like meetings, rules and procedures, and I'm glad that so many other people can find the passion that I do to go to enter this debate um, and with such aggression and fervour about meeting rules and procedure. So uh, as I um, just some, some really strange comments um, a moment ago, uh, but I'd like to um, just point out that uh, section 55 6, no councillor who is speaking shall be interrupted except as provided for by these standing rules. So no interjections are still banned, I can assure you of that, but also Mr Chair, 55-6 electronic devices shall be turned off or operated in silent mode in the chamber and public gallery. So that's just one, that's a trap for, trap for young players on that one. <laughs> so um, there was an interesting question put to the group. How is the meeting meant to run without a ban on interjections? That's a fascinating question if you think about it, um, because uh, interjections are not a fundamental part of this meeting. In fact, speaking and having others hear what you have to say is the fundamental action of the entire meeting, N not interjecting through the entire thing. Um, there are, but this leads us to other rules in this, in this um, update uh, that basically bring into the local law things that are by nature conventions, things that we've often done in this place. For example, sign the book every day uh, through the budget, you know, a codification of a simple thing. Um, I am unaware of what other uh, committee chairs do, but I always move my minutes and have a vote. I now, that was now part of the rules. Um, part of the modernisation issues that we've had to make sure that people can zoom in to make, make sure that the video streaming system works. These are relatively new ideas for this council, and I must stop and insist that when all 27 of us get together, we are the council. All right, if anyone was curious about what the council is and isn't, when all of us group together in a meeting in this place, we are the council. Um, and I know, I know that, and I appreciate that... that um, Councillor Johnston. Now, strictly, the activities we just saw uh, would be banned in the future, Mr <laughs> Chair, under Section 55.5. So, the other thing that this does, so this is, this is the document here, right? So, I'll show that. So, it's, it's, quite, it's quite hefty for the comparatively minimal changes that are in it. Um, but the bulk of this document actually speaks to a change of the rules, and another, another instance of modernisation, the old rules spoke to chairman, all of, them, all of the instances where chairman exists now read chair. That actually is what takes up the bulk of this document. The other things that we should, um, and I, I, look, I support gender neutrality in the, doc, in, in the way we conduct things, I think that's an appropriate way to behave. Um, the other 
thing that puts a great deal of sort of weight into this document, why it is larger than what you'd expect, is because the uh, conflict of interest and the maintenance of good order rules that were in a different uh, part of uh, our admin um, procedures will now be in this. So it'll be one-stop shop for the chair to be able to manage the meeting with a limited, with only, with as few documents as possible, and that allows for better operation and better preparation for the meeting. So um, this, uh, while a lot of the, the discussion earlier was, I'm going to say, a touch disingenuous and hyperbolic, um, this document tidies up a lot of things and brings them into the age where we can have Zoom, into a gender neutral language. Uh, it allows uh, um, policy resolutions, uh, notified motions to be done very late. I would describe it as very late, and to provide uh, and the mechanisms to uh, to bring in urgency motions remain. Point of order, chair. Councillor Street, point of order. Well, Councillor Wines, take a quick question. Um, Councillor Wines, will you take a quick? Go on, on. Yeah, yeah, go it's on. a simple one. Um, I was just wondering, what do you understand to be the definition of political advertising in terms of the limitation on use of video footage from council? Because I honestly don't quite understand what the definition. Yeah. Would be. So I suppose what it all comes down to is. Um, is potential misuse of the film, effectively, what it comes down to. Um, so, um, some of the, the criticism that the, the, the administration has worn through this uh, debate and the interjections just made at the moment um, infer that that only that we're concerned about ourselves being traduced, uh, the film being manipulated to indicate something has happened that didn't in fact happen. And we actually saw that in the recent elections, the film of the Lord Mayor was manipulated to have him saying something that he didn't say. Now, the, that's of deep concern to me that, that a, a major political party would, would confect a quote from a leader in a campaign. And I think that we really should be concerned with confections. Um, I have no um, issue with what I say being repeated, but I do take an issue with misuse of what I say. And I think that has to be a serious consideration um, of what we're about. So I think if the objective, th there's, there's a whole range of things around free speech uh, to address Councillor Shree's question uh, specifically, um, but uh, dishonesty, manipulation and confection aren't actually fundamental, they're, they're actually fly in the face of free speech. And I think that that's something um, I hope many of us can agree on. Um, on the matter of changes to how the chair can treat the media. The only change is a renumbering. So in the old rules, you would have found it under section 55. Under the new rules, you find exactly the same words, section 75. So these things are still there. Uh, in many ways, this document, the bulk of it, um, can really be put down to codification of the rules, so they're all in one place for us, which will make life much easier. Gender neutrality of the terms within it. and. Uh, just addressing how we're meant to use and how the increasing use of computerisation and technology affects the way that we conduct this meeting. So once again, I'm very, um, very happy to see that people are so enthusiastic about meetings procedures as I am, to be so passionate through their earlier statements. I look forward uh, to these uh, coming into place so that we can have a cleaner and clearer understanding of what uh, of the conduct of this meeting, and I look forward and recommend uh, it to the chamber. I look forward to its uh, ratification later on. Thank you, Councillor Wines. Further debate, Councillor Three. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on item F. I, th I think the term Councillor Wine used was disingenuous and a little hyperbolic. Was that right? Yes. So I feel like if, if Brisbane City Council meetings were a movie, that would be the byline. Where is Brisbane City Council? Disingenuous and a little hyperbolic. Yes. Um, anyway, I, I had a few points I wanted to to raise, and um, I'll, I'll pick up on that one about the use of video footage that Councillor Wines was kind enough to answer a question on, because I, I completely understand where the administration is coming from in terms of wanting to limit or in some way regulate um, misuse of, of video footage. Um, and and I, I get that there's a genuine and perhaps sincere motivation behind that, but what the actual wording of the local law does is prohibits anything that could be described as political advertising. And the ordinary definition of political advertising used by the Electoral Commission and other government um, bodies is much broader than what we might call misuse or misleading conduct or whatever. It's, it's basic, according to the Electoral Commission's definitions, if I shared a, a, a clip from the council meeting and said, here's what a councillor said, 
and I posted that on my Facebook page, that would constitute political advertising. That would meet the standard definitions of advertising because it's, um, yeah, anyway, I don't need to go into detail about it, but the, that's, that's really, a, I think, a, a weakness of these local laws. And I understand that they were to some extent modelled on state parliament processes, but the drafting of that particular section is, is just too broad. Um, and I'm not too worried about it because I, I don't actually think the chair will have the time or resources to police or enforce this stuff in, in detail. But I do wonder whether the first time a councillor posts uh, a video from the chamber with a bit of commentary, whether the chair is then going to have to deal with a bunch of complaints about it on the grounds that it's political advertising and we're going to get into some messy territory where an LNP chair is deciding whether another councillor from another party or whatever has engaged in pol political advertising, which is of course an inherently subjective and political decision itself. So that really brings me to my broader concern with the entire um, updated medians local law, which is that it seems to be giving more power and discretion to committee chairs and the chair of the council meetings. Just as a general proposition, it seems like it is empowering the chair to um, make subjective decisions about what kind of behaviours appropriate, what kinds of um, sanctions are appropriate in terms of kicking councils out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I do think that is a that puts the chair in a precarious position where. For these meetings to be able to function effectively, we need to be able to trust that the chair is acting independently um, and is not misusing their discretion. And the more discretion you give to the chair, the greater the risk is that they'll, they'll be pressured into um, applying that discretion favourably towards the LNP in, in the case of the current council composition. And, and I don't think the administration has, has fully reflected on the long-term ramifications of that. We don't want the chair of this meeting to become a politicised role, but I would argue that um, in recent years, it already has become a politicised role, and so um, I, I think it's a mistake to allow to introduce so many sections that give the chair more discretion, particularly in terms of responding to conduct. Um, I, I remember being a little bit disappointed when, um, during the last council budget debates, I, I interjected, I think, twice. Um, probably the first time all year that I actually interjected during a, a speech, and I was I was ejected quite promptly by the chair at the time. Um, and that was an example of the chair using discretion to eject me from a meeting. Um, in, yeah, without any formal warnings, um, it, was, it was quite a... Um, a point of order. Uh, yes, Councillor Wines. Claim to be misrepresented. OK, noted. I didn't, didn't refer to any statements by Councillor Wines, but um, I'm happy to take a question from uh, Councillor Wines. The Councillor quite, uh, quite clearly point, referred point to Point of order to you, Councillor Wines. Thank, thank you. No, no, I'll be back. OK. Yeah, cool. Um, I'm, I'm not actually necessarily debating whether the decision itself was legitimate or not. I'm simply pointing out that that's an example of the chair using a lot of discretion in a context where an LNP chair um, is, is going to be perceived as acting politically uh, according to party lines, even when they might not be. Um, and I think that that's a stark contrast with the stronger conventions um, and the stronger assertion of um, the independence of the speaker that we see in parliament at the state and federal roles, and that it's often a contested space at that level of government as well. But there seems to be a, a stronger defence of the idea that the speaker of the um, chamber of the house has to act a bit more neutrally. And I do worry that um, in this chamber we've seen a lot of very partial and, and subjective decisions made by different chairs over the years, not necessarily your good self, but. Um, I, I do worry that the, the local laws won't necessarily address those concerns. Um, just turning to the, the cutting of general business, I, I think I might have been the first one who kind of worked out that you could speak multiple times, or, or maybe it was done before me. But um, yeah, but I, I, um, I think the if, if the chamber is going to a, a take that approach of saying, look, you can only speak once during general business, it will be very, very important for the chair of this chamber and the deputy chair to be a little less restrictive about what counts as relevant content during committee debates uh, or debates on reports or other items of the agenda. And I say that because when the mayor stands up and, and, and gives their um, report or when any of the committee chairs stand up, they can speak on a very wide range of topics within their portfolios. They're, they're empowered to talk about whatever they, the heck they want, can raise all sorts of issues, can if they want indirectly cast aspersions on other councils in the chamber, etc., etc., And the only opportunity for councils like myself to respond to that 
is, oh, bring it up in general business. And that's been a frequent refrain in this chamber over the years. Councillor Three, if you don't like it, just bring it up during general business. Um, Councillor Three, you're veering off the topic, bring it up in general business. Um, there comes a point where there's only so many things you can squeeze into a 10 minute speech. And so I'm not necessarily strongly or vehemently objecting to uh, limiting general business to one 10 minute set section per councillor. I'm, I'm, I think it's a bad call, but I'm not gonna die in a ditch over it. But what I do want to assert and remind the current and future chairs of this chamber is that if you're going to restrict how, uh, like how much councillors can talk about or uh, what they can talk about during general business, and that's what you're doing, you're introducing a new, quite significant restriction on councillors' abilities to raise matters that haven't been covered by existing reports, um, then you need to be mindful of that, the fact that you're introducing that new restriction in terms of how much leeway you allow councillors during debates on other topics throughout a council meeting. I thought it was very disingenuous and a little bit hyperbolic of Councillor Cunningham to add up all the, all the speaking opportunities in a council agenda when we know that those are limited to the topics of the agenda items. If I want to stand up and talk about an issue that's important to residents of my electorate or an event or um, a significant occasion or whatever, um, I've only got that one 10 minute slide at the end of the meeting. I don't have the opportunity to talk about that during the report items uh, that are happening at other parts of the council agenda. So I thought it was very, very misleading and I was surprised at Councillor Cunningham because she's usually a little more even handed, but I thought it was very misleading to try and argue that, oh, councillors already have plenty of opportunities to speak. They can speak for 10 minutes here and there and in this report and that report. Nonsense. We can only speak on the items that are being debated. Um, and so if the administration is seeking to strictly limit how much we can talk about things during general business, there are two consequences. One, we'll, be, we'll need, the, need the opportunities to respond to some of the statements that the mayor or other chairs are making during their remarks on reports. And I would suggest that there's a little bit of flexibility and discretion <laughs> that chairs ought to be applying there, because currently um, the mayor can stand up and speak about whatever he wants and no one else has the opportunity to rebut or contradict or critique the claims he makes. Um, but number two, if that doesn't happen, and if we see a very strict policing of what councillors can say, and we also um, see that hard limit on general business matters, we're going to have to have more and more notified motions, which will undermine the administration's stated goal of uh, family-friendly meeting times. And I hope the Lord Mayor is alert to this, is, is that if, if you're introducing more limits on what we can arrange, speak on during general business, we'll have to bring more notified motions. Um, I do want to acknowledge that it's a good move by the, the administration to propose a shorter notice period for notified motions. I think that will be a positive change and I really welcome that. Um, I actually share some of the administration's concerns that some of the urgency motions brought by Labor probably aren't that urgent. Um, but I, I do think the, the general, the notified motions notice period being changed is a good step in that in that regard, but on the same, yeah, by the same token, I think we should be a little nervous about the fact that limiting our opportunity to raise matters in general business just means we're going to be talking about them at other points and could actually lead to longer meetings with more notified motions. So, on okay. those grounds, I won't be supporting the, um, the new local law. It's Councillor Three, your time has expired. Councillor Wines, uh, I don't think you're mentioned by name, so I don't think you have a point of misrepresentation. Well, re re noted by position and title. Oh, uh, no, it's only by name. All right. So further, further debate on item F? No further debate on item F. Lord Mayor. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr Chair, and thank you to all those councillors who contributed on this particular item. What's interesting, we knew um, Councillor Cassidy uh, would talk about democracy and accountability um, and uh, and and make the uh, chicken little claim that you know this is oh this is some kind of retrograde retrograde step, uh, but he exposed uh, a, a serious lack of knowledge uh, in a basic fundamental principle of of what we're doing here, i.e., who the council is. Uh, he actually stated that the council is the eight or nine thousand people that work for it. Well, not according to the City of Brisbane Act, it's not not according uh, to the de democratic system that we operate under. All of the people in this chamber who are elected are the council. We are the council. 
and that is what the Act says. So page 19 of the City of Brisbane Act says, the Brisbane City Council, in brackets, the council, is the elected body that is responsible for the good rule and local government of Brisbane. It then goes on, page 21. Councillor Johnston. No Councillor Johnston, please. There's no such thing as the Johnston Council, I can tell you right now, uh, and there never will be. <laughs> the, uh, the page 21 of the City of Brisbane Act further goes on to say, the council is constituted by the mayor and the 26 other councillors who are elected or appointed to the council under this act or the local government electoral act 2011. So in other words, those councillors who are elected or uh, if there's a vacancy within 12 months of the election, those who are appointed, that is the council. Now, in the same way that the Palaszczuk government exists, that the government is not all the public servants that work for the government. The government are the people who sit in state parliament in George Street. That is the Palaszczuk government. And in a uh, situation of uh, party politics, which we have and which we've had for a long, long time, uh, since I think 1925 and maybe even beyond that, uh, there is an administration and there is an opposition. The administration, just like... Councillor Johnston, please. The, no, we are the council. All the people in this room are the council. We're not an administration. We are not administrators. We are the elected council. And Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor so Street. People on Point this of order, side Councillor Street. Street. Just having a bit of trouble here in the Lord Mayor, and would ask yes. that you call the Chamber to Councillors, order. please allow the Lord Mayor to be heard in silence. Thank you. So the people on this side of the room, i.e. the majority, are Team Shrinner, the Shrinner Council. Um, and so it's not that hard to get because you get it at the other levels of government. You just you just don't like hearing it, do you? You don't like hearing it. Uh, it's basic democracy 101. But uh, uh, let, let me put this theory to the test. Councillor Johnston, please don't make me go to the red tabs. Let me put this theory to the test. So, um, if a council officer makes a mistake, whose fault is it? Who, no, no, Councillor who's, who's Murphy, fault, please. Who, Councillor Murphy, please. Who, who does the Labor councillors blame if a council officer makes the mistake? Well, I don't think they share in any of the blame because they certainly never. They, that, that's when they don't consider themselves to be part of the council. That's the that's the administration, i.e., the Schrinner Council. So, if if someone if someone gets a parking ticket on the road, who's going to get the blame? Is it the council officer? Is it this joint body that we're talking about here? No. Um, it, it is the administration or the majority. Um, so, uh, look, even a, basic, even a basic look at what um, Councillor Cassidy has said shows that um, his view is seriously lacking or maybe deliberately so, I don't know. Um, but this claim that somehow um, debate is being limited in some way um, is just, you know, Councillor Wines, you said it, it's hyperbolic. The claim is hyperbolic because we are not changing the number of times that people can, uh, can speak on the committee reports and the submissions that come through. That is, that is not changed at all. And that has been the same for as long as anyone can remember. And in fact, there's nothing to stop a councillor speaking on every single item. There might be even one councillor in the room that speaks on every single item. I don't know. Um, but, uh, and, and it's interesting because uh, I take that interjection. She said a councillor who identifies as the independent councillor for Tennyson said, I will be speaking on every item now. Well, as if that's going to be a change. As if that is going to be a change. And I remember that same councillor has, you know, had a disagreement about something that's, ha that's been said in this meeting and she's like, I'm going to punish you guys, I'm going to speak on every single item. Remember? You remember that? Uh, like it's some kind of punishment when she speaks. This is democracy. This is not punishment. Like we, if you see speaking as punishment, you have a very warped view of this whole process. Uh, but before, Councillor Johnson said, earlier today, they denied my right to speak. And she was referring to the majority. Now let's actually put that claim to the test. 
Was Councillor Johnston denied the right to speak? No. no. She spoke for 10 minutes, which was her right. But last time I checked, she was not the Leader of the Opposition. Actually, hang on a second. Have I got this wrong? Will the, will the Leader of the Opposition please put their hand up? Point of, point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor I'm, I'm really enjoying what the Lord Mayor is saying. I'm on the edge of my seat, but there's just a continual um, drone from the corner that you've warned a few times. I, 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 Councillor Mackay, it's from all sides, dare I say, so please allow the Lord Mayor to be heard in silence. So I've always uh, made it clear that um, if the Leader of the Opposition wants extra time to speak, we always support that. That's been an ongoing tradition of this place, and we do. And, you know, it doesn't mean we like hearing what he has to say, but we support it because that's the right thing to do for the Leader of the Opposition. Councillor Johnson is not the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, so to suggest that we denied Councillor Johnson's right to speak is a falsehood, an absolute falsehood. She got the same right that anyone would get other than the Leader of the Opposition, and that is to speak for 10 minutes on an item. And so we're not changing that. In terms of uh, other uh, matters here, this issue of um, the debate of motions, uh, it's really interesting because um, what Labor councillors have done is they've tried to work out the shortest, the easiest and the laziest way of making a political point. And so what they've done is misuse this urgency motion provision to basically make a three minute statement on something because that's really all they want to do. That's, all, that's the only fire that they have in their belly. It lasts for about three minutes. And, and you'll remember there's been a couple of times where we've actually voted yes to urgency and you can see them scrambling around because they actually weren't prepared to debate the item. They weren't actually prepared to have a debate. They just wanted to make a pithy political point for three minutes and then sit down and then go, the LNP voted against uh, whatever it is that we voted against. And never mind that we were voting on urgency, not the actual substantive issue, uh, but they have they have taken the laziest route. And so, look, if you want to debate an issue, we're making it easier for you to actually debate an issue. And, and here's another thing. Tell me, are you going to get more informed debate if you have 24 hours to prepare for that debate rather than 20 seconds to prepare for that debate? Is it going to be more informed if you have 24 hours notice or 20 seconds? Tell me. I think both sides will agree that you're not going to have a particularly informed debate with 20 seconds notice. And so, and so that is not the way Australia's most professional and largest council makes this decision, based on 20 seconds, political motion, point scoring. That's not how we make decisions. If you have an issue that you really want to debate, 24 hours notice is fair enough. That gives all of us that gives all of us a chance to have a think about the issue and how we might approach it, and that's a reasonable thing in a democratic uh, situation. But then let's go further, because there were other hyperbolic claims made about, um, you know, oh, the accountability and you know the death of democracy and all that sort of uh, ridiculous, uh, untrue claim. Let's have a look at something basic like question time. I mean, the, the Labor Party has the opportunity to ask me. You know, side to side, every week they get the opportunity to ask me a question. And guess what that question is? Once again, it's like a two minute statement followed by a rhetorical question. It's a rhetorical question. So they don't actually ask a question, they make a statement. So they use their opportunity, instead of asking a question, they make a statement followed by a rhetorical question. So. And then half of the time they ask a chair rather than me. So, look, you know, it, it Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Thank you. You we'll, scripted. it. We'll now put item F to the vote. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division called seconded. by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Griffiths. Everyone who is here is here. Oh, no, we don't. Ring the bells, please.
Thank you. More councillors are now present. This uh, is a division on item F. Item F, all in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Those opposed, please say no and raise your hands. No. Any abstentions? No. Clarks. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 19 in favour and seven against. Thank you. Item F is carried. Deputy Mayor, Economic Development and the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee report, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move the report of the Economic Development and the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 23rd of November 2021 be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by the Deputy Mayor and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the report of the Economic Development and the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee meeting dated Tuesday 23 November 2021 be adopted. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. First of all, before I go to the committee report, is our Business Hub update for this week. There's only one workshop this week, and that is Make an Impact Video Content to Turn Heads, and that is on Thursday morning at 9am, which is being presented by Girl Director from CCIQ. However, we do have to see that we are having some fantastic feedback from the Business Hub. Um, Brisbane Future, Future Brisbane Events, it's a great space. You cover so many topics, very well organised. On the couch with JC, John Collins, very, very popular. Great interview, questions were well controlled, the interview was professional, the session was really informative. JC was really good, he always is when he's interviewed. And of course, they're also running the Women in Business up, um, uh, grants at the moment. So far up to date, we've had 17,700 visits to the website, 21,500 impressions, and 850 clicks on the EDM call to action. So with 475 submissions in progress, Lord Mayor, we may have to look at how we can support women further into the future with the business grants as well. With the uh, committee presentation last week, it was the launch last week of the City Centre Master Plan Stage 1, a document that has been many months in the making because we were always quite not sure how it was going to be ready to be uh, delivered with COVID as we had ups and downs over the last 12 months. But we are ready now. It is a short-term strategy because of the uncertainty going forward, but with clear and achievable actions which will help bring the CBD back to its former glory. At its best times in that former glory, the CBD was home to over 11,000 businesses and 120,000 workers. Um, the city centre is regarded as the engine room for the whole of the Brisbane and the greater region. So we need to make sure it does remain a priority in helping drive growth. That doesn't mean that we don't deliver for the suburbs, but it does have a very special place as our city heart as well. Add to that our beautiful climate and the weather opportunities and the people that are flocking to Queensland at the moment or in the very near future. And of course, now that we are an Olympic and Paralympic host city, we really do need to make sure that we are elevating ourselves to that global status which people are expecting of us. Of us. We realise this is going to be a hard task, but the city centre is a main part of that because when visitors come to Brisbane, they don't flock to the suburbs, they flock to the city centre. And hopefully they're then staying in the suburbs as well to experience the true beautiful Brisbane life. The old city centre master plan is now seven years old and it saw a number of key items delivered. Lots of connections with the river with new and upgraded ferry terminals. Howsmith Wharves has been completed. The Kangaroo Point Greenbridge is scheduled. There's been 18 new towers constructed since 2014. Queen's Wharf is well out of the ground and DA approvals for CBD office towers remain strong. So we need to make sure, based on this foundation, that we move forward with the city centre master plan. This is absolutely a very, very important part of making sure our Olympus, Olympic legacy is right. So when we heard last week about what do you think you're doing, Councillor Adams, in the Olympic and Paralympic state, um, face, this is exactly what we're doing, planning how we make sure that the legacy is set up for the next 10 years and the 10 years after that as well. We are looking, first of all, as I said, those short-term action plans. 
activation campaigns to bring people back to the city, like Christmas in the City, uh, making it easier to move around our CBD streets, flexible working places, access and inclusion promotion as well, encourage visitors and workers and students back into the city centre with maybe promotions like festive fairs over two weekends leading into Christmas. We ran one with the uh, Property Council at um, Fridays in the City during the middle of years as well, and making sure we're enhancing those river connections as well. Of course, we're continuing on Brisbane Metro and the state on Cross River Rail as well. We do need to work with the private sector to make sure we can get involved in bringing back the life into the city, and we never can underest underestimate the power of foot traffic as well. It's about illuminating the city centre, creative lighting delivered with new development and new infrastructure. It's about making walkable city streets with our um, pedestrian strategy, but also our cycling infrastructure that we're trialling and introducing across the city. It's about being a green city and through the developments, not only the green concrete, the green steel and buildings that breathe, but trees and greenery on the ground level and right across the building as well. As we set our sights towards the 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games, the time is right now to think very strategically about how our city heart exemplifies the best of Brisbane and Queensland. So the master plan is now live on the council website. It's being promoted through social channels. We will be heading out for consultation starting on the full city centre master plan early in the new year. I look forward to delivering these 15 key action items in stage one and working with everybody across Brisbane to bring the uh, CBD back to its former glory. Thank you. Further debate? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I rise to speak on the presentation about the City Centre Master Plan. And, uh, this is a very important document, uh, given where we are as we emerge from COVID at the moment. And what's included in uh, this uh, initial draft of the City Centre Master Plan uh, is certainly very telling. Uh, but what is also very telling is what, exclude, what is excluded uh, from this. And that tells a bigger story, I think, about the values of this current LNP administration uh, or lack thereof. Um, there are big changes coming to the way our city works uh, and the way in which people live in our city as we emerge from uh, COVID-19. There are immense pressures uh, on people and where people can live, uh, and uh, that housing in our city is becoming more precarious for people. Housing affordability is, a, is at a crisis level now. Uh, the most recent um, stats from the Australian Bureau of Statistics on wages show they went backwards last quarter by 0.8 per cent, but rents went up by 8 per cent um, over that same uh, period. There is a desperate um, shortage of affordable housing stock uh, right around Australia and, and particularly here in Brisbane as well. Uh, there are 50,000 people on the wait list for public housing and another half a million nationwide seeking secure, affordable housing. Uh, so you would hope, you would hope that any council document uh, in this day and age would try to help address that great challenge that our community faces, uh, because the solution, uh, or part of the solution to many of the problems our city faces now and will face into the future, including traffic and congestion, loss of green space and lack of community services and facilities where people live, uh, does relate directly to secure and affordable housing. Uh, it's all about values and priorities, Chair. Uh, and we ask, what kind of council do we want to be? What kind of city do we want to leave for future generations? And I asked about the initial consultation last week uh, in, uh, in the committee uh, and how that was conducted. And we were told that key stakeholders were engaged and were part of this process to get us to this point. We've certainly um, heard a bit of that from the deputy mayor just now and that the private sector is engaged quite extensively in developing uh, this document. Uh, however, I was uh, pretty horrified to find out that key affordable housing providers have been left out so far. Uh, and they are a very important part to addressing this problem. So the LNP administration like to talk about inclusivity, but their words contradict their actions when it comes to documents like this chair. For a city to be inclusive in this current time in 2021, there needs to be a robust plan to address housing affordability, and council should be doing everything it can and, and pulling every lever that it has at its disposal. But this Lord Mayor can't even make our streets and footpaths accessible uh, and inclusive for all residents. So what hope is there for people who are struggling to keep a roof over their head? 
Uh, seeing as this LNP administration uh, ha do not value safe and affordable housing in a document like this, uh, the Labor team has reached out to affordable housing providers to make sure that they are part of that conversation going forward for the City Centre Master Plan. We have met with some of those providers and will continue to do so because making sure Brisbane is a truly inclusive city with safe, secure and affordable housing for all is a Labor priority. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy, further speakers. Councillor Johnston. Yes, I rise to speak on the uh, City Centre uh, Master Plan. Um, look, I. I've read this report and I listened to the Deputy Mayor and I'm struck by uh, how well, word salad was the idea that came into my head. I think Councillor Adams used every word that was sort of related to this and chucked it all into the salad bowl and then mixed it all up. But um, the problem that I see with what's going on with what this administration is doing is that it's fundamentally underpinned by an outmoded concept. Um, the last two years has shown us that people are changing how they work and live in our city. Um, and everything that the LNP uh, appear to be doing at this stage is about getting them to go back to the way that they were doing it. That is, you must come back into town, you must come back to work, um, we're going to give you freebies if you come back to work. It's all of this thinking um, which, okay, there must be be an element of that that has to be considered, um, but fundamentally two years of dealing with a global pandemic, which will continue next year, has absolutely and fundamentally changed the nature of the way in which our city um, is being used by our community. None of that is recognised um, within the premise of this city centre master plan. Uh, so I, I think there's a big disconnect between um, what is happening in our culture and lifestyle in Brisbane and what the LNP are trying to do to satisfy the people who donate to their campaigns that are pro they are property owners. Um, and I think there is a problem with that. And the City Centre Master Plan has to reconsider that cultural and behavioural change in how people are working and living in this city. And, and this old school way of thinking is definitely not uh, the right way to do it. Uh, the themes that are outlined as the uh, priority actions over the next, um, uh, out, uh, next sorry, 18 months uh, are also quite interested. Welcoming, create more to see and do, adapt the modern workforce, promote, events, uh, promote access and inclusion. Well, let's start with that. It's probably two months ago now that I logged a job for Queensland Walks um, because a uh, CBD footpath was blocked, fully blocked. Um, by scaffolding, and there was nowhere for people to go. Do you know what this council's done? Despite repeated follow-ups with my office, weeks and weeks and weeks later, we still don't have that matter resolved. Now, yeah, of course. Fundamentally, fundamentally, this city has failed to deal with pedestrian issues, uh, and they are exacerbated by uh, development in the city, and this administration giving their developer mates free licence to Point take of order, up Mr. a whole Chair, That is absolutely of, imputing uh, motive. Point of order, First Councillor Adams. That is imputing motive. The majority of the works in this city is Cross River Rail and Queen's Wharf. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Councillor Johnson, continue, please, but be careful about I'm sorry, was that, a, was that actually a point of order, was it? Continue. You've got the floor. Was it? Was you've that a point of order? I'm just checking whilst... You know, the meeting's local laws don't start till next week, I presume, the new ones, but in I'm just checking, was that a point of order? It was a point of order, yes. And, and you're saying that that's an appropriate point of order? Uh, please, Councillor Johnson, you have the floor. Please continue. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm, what's the point? Um, uh, the big problem... <laughs> I mean... Oh, <laughs> You know the biggest project that's actually stuffing up the city at the moment? It's their own metro. I mean, Councillor Adams, just her failure to understand what is happening in this city is quite extraordinary. Um, you know, yes, there are other projects, but the metro just shut off North Quay. It has completely shut off roads. It's, it's stopped people driving into the city over a bridge that's been there for 120 years. And guess who did that? The LNP administration. But don't worry, it's all the Labor government, state government's fault. Uh, 
Anyway, my point is that this administration is failing to make sure that pedestrians can access this city safely. Um, it's, it's failed, categorically failed. Um, I know that Queensland Walks has been raising these issues and this administration is ignoring their concerns. They've written to me again this week about it. Uh, there is uh, connected. They want to improve city cycle networks and enhance river connections and upgrade public transport. The first thing they need to do is come clean about which of the 125 bus services around this city are going to be cut, which ones are going to be truncated, and how is it going to be? Point of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Adams. Uh, relevance to the report. There is nothing about the bus network review in this report. Yes, I agree. Councillor Johnson, can you please come back to the uh, well, item before us? I'm on page. Uh, I'm on page two, point eleven, and specifically, upgrading public transport is one of the uh, themes and the key priority actions that Councillor Adams says that they're going to be consulting on over the next eighteen months. So let's see what consultation might this council be doing in the public transport space in the next eighteen months. Does anybody want to guess? What sort of public transport are we responsible for, Councillor Griffiths? Could it be buses? Could it be buses? I mean, I understand Councillor Adams doesn't like what I'm saying, um, but is she now not aware that her council is undertaking um, the metro and that part of that project is public transport? Buses. I know it's complicated for her. So let's be clear. If we're going to have a talk about how people are going to access the city and move around the city, we don't know how the metro is going to impact on public transport services. And my point here today, which Councillor Adams really clearly is not liking, is this council should come clean and tell people what bus services are going to be cut and what bus services are going to be truncated, because that is what the metro says is going to happen. Um, this, again, um, we see that council's going to light up the CBD. I would have thought we've pretty much lit up everything you can possibly light up in the CBD, and that perhaps some of the key suburban hubs around Brisbane could do with a little illumination. Um, whilst, uh, whilst this report says I think it's about half of the Olympics venues are within five kilometres of the city, that means half are not. Half are not. Um, but clearly that's not getting any uh, consideration at all. Um, we need to have a beautiful green city, walkable streets, active small spaces. Well, you know, um, we're definitely not seeing walkable streets around Brisbane. Uh, the lack of spending on footpaths is uh, quite significantly problematic. And we're unlocking the potential, facilitate growth and plan our Olympic and Paralympic legacy. Great. So I'm just going to make a few general observations here now. Firstly, the city centre master plan, uh, the current one, is now seven years old, to my knowledge. The Brisbane Olympics are in 2032, so that's 11 years away. Whatever plan that we look at now will be redundant well and truly before um, the Olympics. I understand that Councillor Adams is desperate to try and link her portfolio with the um, Olympics. But the problem is um, the future of this city has to look beyond just the Olympics. Um, it has to be uh, relevant to our community now, relevant to the issues uh, that are important to, the, to residents now, um, and fundamentally how residents use this city has changed and the old ways that this LNP administration continue to push are out of date. Oh, thank you, Councillor Johnson. Further debate? Any further debate? Councillor Adams, Deputy Chair. Deputy thank Chair. you. Thank you, Mr Chair. And uh, as I said, it is a uh, stage one of the City Centre Master Plan, which is setting the basis for where we need to go in the next 10 years. And we can't sit in our laurels. I think we've heard um, everyone from John Coast through to uh, Premier Palaszczuk and everyone in between that now is not the time to sit back, relax and think, hey, we've got plenty of time. Plenty of time. We don't. We have 10 years, and it takes a long time because let's have a look at it. Cross River Rail, 16, 17, 18 years from when it started being talked about to when it got delivered. There is no time to be wasting when you have the opportunity now to lay the ground. 
to lay down the ground rules on what we would like to see in the city. What I did find extremely interesting, though, is the Green ALP Alliance back out again. All of a sudden, the Labor Party's main focus is affordable housing, which is ironic considering the one thing that Councillor Cassidy didn't want in Sandgate was five storeys, which would have given affordable housing. So as long as it's not in his patch, affordable housing is fine. But to say that we're not speaking about affordable housing is just plain wrong. That question was not asked of me last week. It was not asked who do we speak to in the stakeholders. We are speaking to all stakeholders and I have often said in this place, in committee and across Brisbane, that there is a change coming in the CBD, and one of those changes is office space to residential, which is why these 15 actions are so important. Creating more to see and do, enhancing the river connections, promoting access and inclusion, adapting the modern workplace. That may be adapting it to loft living, to apartment living, to student accommodation. Staging iconic city events, walkable streets, activating small spaces. It's all about the look, the feel, and making sure that our CBD is the city heart, whether it's for affordable housing or penthouses, whether it's for buses, bikes or feet. And then, of course, enhancing it with the river access as well. This is stage one. City Centre Master Plan starts proper next year. I am looking forward to the many ideation and consultation engagements we're going to have over the next 12 months to hear from the people of Brisbane who are way more in touch than the last two comments I just heard in this place. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. We'll now put this motion to the vote, the Economic Development and Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games report. All in favour, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for dinner for a period of one hour, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. As we moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton, the Council now adjourn for a dinner break for a period of one hour, which commences when all councillors have vacated the chamber. The doors have been locked. All in, for in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The eyes have it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Transport Committee report, please. Thanks, Chair. I move that the report of the Transport Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 23rd of November 2021, be adopted. Second. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Murphy and second by Councillor Owen that the report of the Transport Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 23rd of November 2021, be adopted. Is there any debate? No debate. Thank you. I move the report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, we move on to the Infrastructure Committee report. Councillor Wines. Aye. Ready as I ever be. All right. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting date at uh, Tuesday, the 23rd of November 2021, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Wines and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 23rd of November 2021, be adopted. Councillor Wines, is there any debate? Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. We, the committee saw a presentation last week on the speed limit review process. Now, sp speed limit reviews, speed limit reductions are sort of an issue du jour among the, the petition process at the moment. About a third of the positions we're getting through are on the topic of speed limit reductions. I thought it was important uh, to use the committee process and the reporting process to outline to councillors how you go about getting a speed limit review and how you get a speed limit reduction. Uh, the council officers and I are working on a on a, a sort of a one-sheeter to prepare so that people know how that it works, what uh, the officers are looking for, and the um, and how best to find success. So when your residents do come asking for a speed limit reduction, what is the way that you can, uh, what, what is required to ensure that you get the outcome that they and you are seeking? So that was part of the presentation. So what I'll just do, I'll just move uh, through it a little in a little bit, but uh, we'll be producing. Um, the slides will be made available to all councillors and also, the, uh, as I say, the one-page sheet explaining how this system works will also be made available. So the first step is the need for a review needs to be identified and the council's initial investigation 
uh, will uh, include the check of the complaint history, analysing historical crash data, analyse the function of the road and surrounding la land use, check existing traffic volume, speed data and road characteristics. And if the investigation identifies that a more detailed investigation is required, they will undertake a new survey, which includes speed and volume data, and they will use the Department of Transport and Main Roads uh, speed limit review tool to determine if a formal speed limit review is warranted. Our council engage independent engineers uh, and consultants to consider formal SLRs. The application, uh, so the second step is the application of a criteria based speed limit uh, that includes consideration of shared zones, high active transport user areas, car parks, and local urban streets. Now, mind, this is once it progresses to an independent engineering investigation. Steps three through five are a, a risk assessed speed limit proce uh, process with a crash risk, infra infrastructure risk and road classification considerations assessed against the speed data speed limit with, uh, with the perception, with an assessment made of what a motorist would perceive to be a reasonable travel speed. That independent engineer will then move through and make a recommendation to the speed management committee and this is an important part of the process. This committee includes three representatives, a council representative, a Department of Transport and Main Roads representative and a Queensland Police Service representative and all three require consensus for a speed limit review uh, to be reduced, for the recommendation to be that the speed limit is reduced. All three individuals must agree and the recommendation must be made by that independent engineer discussed earlier. Once endorsed, a change to a speed limit can proceed to implementation. If consensus cannot be achieved, the speed limit review, this is an important, this is an important point to understand, if consensus cannot be achieved, a speed limit review can be referred to the speed limit review panel, which is a Department of Transport and Main Roads uh, service, uh, and it is comprised only of senior Transport and Main Roads representatives. Uh, once uh, that decisions, uh, those decisions are made, the changes, um, if they're supported, will then proceed uh, and they will occur. Now, it's important to remember that speed limit reviews, because we bring in an independent assessor, can take up to eight months and cost this council, if we advance through the whole process, up to $80,000. So I think that people should be mindful of that when they go through this process. Uh, and that we are, um, and that I personally, I take a personal position that I have a bias towards the residents and towards their requests, and I'm trying to facilitate a, a system which will assist them in uh, finding the outcomes um, that they seek. Uh, and uh, as I say, I'm looking forward to cooperating uh, with my fellow councillors to assist them in some of those endeavours. Uh, there are three petitions, two of which are about speed limit reductions, one of which about an LATM. I look forward to contributions uh, from the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor Wines. Further speakers? Councillor Johnson. Uh, yes, I rise to speak on the infrastructure report item A and B and ask that item B be taken seriatim for voting purposes. Sorry, that was D seriatim? B, B. B. Thank you. Uh, firstly, on item A, the um, uh, speed limit review uh, process that's set out here, I guess I've got one simple question for the um, infrastructure chairperson. Um, was this uh, process that you've just outlined followed um, for Stanley uh, Terrace Turinga? Um, it's fascinating to me, um, and you can choose not to answer if you don't want to answer tonight. Um, that's fine, uh, but this is a matter that I'm pursuing. Um, it's fascinating to me that um, I'm told that we can't extend school zones in, in the area that I represent. Uh, we can't have streets going from 50 to 40 outside of school zones uh, on the frontage of a school. Um, but meanwhile, I was driving through the back of Tringa the other day and, and surprisingly, there's almost a kilometre of new school zone uh, where there's no school, and it was it was quite interesting to me. So just let me be clear again, Mr. Deputy Chair. Um, my question is: Did Stanley Terrace Turinga go through this process of being assessed um, by a committee, uh, and uh, what was the outcome of that committee request? Uh, because I'm I'm quite interested um, in whether or not that process applied in Stanley Terrace Turinga. It's very clear to me that this council. Um, it's very clear to me that this council is not acting in a consistent way with respect to 
uh, speed limit review processes, and Ipswich Road is the best example of that. Um, for many years, um, I tried to get uh, Annerley Junction, uh, that key part of Ipswich Road, reduced to 40. You can see the school. You can see the school from Annerley Junction. Um, this administration repeatedly voted against reducing the speed limit to 40 kilometres an hour. You can't see a school on Stanley Terrace, Turinga. Um, there are schools nearby, for sure, but you can't see the school. But it, that's gone from 50 to 40. It took three years and persistent um, action by me, the community, and Councillor Griffiths and the state member to get um, number one the committee to assess the, the proposed speed limit reduction. Uh, and council refused to take it up, and then it came back, and then they put it back up, and it was a bit of a mess. So, um, you know, my, my concern is that there's no consistent process. And if this is the process, that's great because this will be the benchmark that I use from now on um, with respect to these matters. And I absolutely want to clarify what happened on Stanley Terrace, uh, Turinga. Um, with respect to item B. Um, this is another street where we have attempted uh, over many years to have the speed limit reduced. So the area is a, a district access road that runs between Fairfield Road. Half of it is essentially King Arthur Terrace, uh, and the other half of it is uh, King, uh, sorry, King Arthur Terrace Tennyson, and the other half of it is King Arthur Terrace uh, Graceville and Graceville Avenue. Um, part of King Arthur Terrace in the new section is 40. Part of it is 60, and the existing section of King Arthur Terrace Tennyson is 60, and Graceville Avenue is also 60. Um, this is the third petition, or fourth petition it may be, now where residents have been asking for speed limit reductions along um, these streets. They are very busy streets. Uh, they are residential streets in the sense that they have hundreds and hundreds of homes that open directly up onto these um, very busy streets. Uh, we've got four SAM signs, um, two each way, um, and it's clear there's a speed problem. Um, reducing the speed from 60 to 50 would make it much safer for everybody. It's disappointing that, yet again, the administration simply are ignoring residents' requests. Um, they are well placed to um, you know, to make views about their speed limits on their streets known. So this is an issue that's raised with me regularly at the Tennis and Residents Association. This petition uh, came from residents who um, wanted to see the speed limit reduced. Um, it is just incredibly disappointing that council uh, refuses to consider those requests. Uh, and uh, it's certainly not in keeping um, with residents' requirements. Uh, it's not in keeping with a uh, way to improve safety. Um, it's, it's really problematic, I think, um, that council, I guess, I guess the interesting part about it is that, you know, they do special deals for their own people, but then they won't do anything um, to assist in other areas simply because they don't vote LNP. That's the, that's the only way that I see it, based on what I've seen particularly happening in um, uh, Stanley Terrace, Turinga. Um, we don't really have a lot of detail about crash history here. Uh, it's, there's three crashes. Um, it says the crashes are the result of poor driver behaviour. Well, sure, that's really why most crashes happen, isn't it? I mean, I don't think that um, any crash is not the result of poor driver behaviour. Um, so there is a crash history here. Um, it's, really, it's really disappointing that Council's not acting on these residents' requests. This issue is not going to go away. Part of King Arthur Terrace is 40. Um, part of King Arthur Terrace is 60. Um, it, it needs to be consistent. Um, the speed limit needs to be reduced. Um, and I just hope no one dies, um, because we know that the big difference um, by dropping the speed limit means that the severity of accidents is significantly reduced. Um, it's disappointing that council continues to ignore residents' views, um, and I'm left with no choice other than to let the residents know that 
um, the LNP Council is just not listening to their concerns. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Any further speakers? Councillor Wines. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Chair. Um, uh, just for clarification to all councillors, the speed limit reduction or the speed limit review process I discussed earlier does not uh, relate to school zones. School zones use a separate process to identify them. Uh, now that the, uh, I raise this so that people understand that they are separate, that if a school, there are certain rules that govern where and how school zones operate, um, and that the speed limit review process acts independently and separately to the school zone uh, process. Um, now, I hear some discussion about special deals. That, that, that's, that's clearly, um, that was clearly refuted in the previous speaker, Councillor Johnston's comments when she said she was able to get a special deal for Ipswich Road Annerley, but not able to get a special deal for King, uh, King Arthur Terrace. So clearly, clearly um, the, the point, point that she order. was making that is not correct. Point of order, Councillor Claim Johnston. to be misrepresented. In the same speech, the councillor indicated she was able to secure a speed reduction in one place and not in another, then accused people who received speed reductions of receiving a special deal. <laughs> Clearly that means herself in that instance. Um, also, I'm advised a preliminary advice has been that Stanley Terrace uh, Turinga, or Stanley Parade Turinga includes a school that responded to a school zone. No, no councillor Johnson, your misrepresentation? Uh, I absolutely never said that we got a special deal um, on Ipswich Road at Annerley. We went right through this whole process of doing a speed limit review. It went up to the committee, it came back down, it went point back of order, up to Mr. the Chair, committee. This is a speech, not, not a clarification. No, I'm, I'm and that point has been made. Uh, thank you. That point has thank been made about what you're saying that, that a thank special you, recognition Lines. was given to Ipswich Road thank you, to Council. achieve the outcome she sought. Thank you, Councillor Wines. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. No, I, I, I didn't even get to speak because Councillor Wines interrupted me. Can you so keep I would concise, like please? to make my point of misrepresentation. Keep it concise, please. On, thank you. On the misrepresentation. Councillor Wines claimed I said that Ipswich Road Annerley got a special deal. Um, I indicated that we'd gone right through the speed limit review process and it had gone up to the committee and come back down and had to go back up and come back down. Yeah, understand. What he said was completely wrong. Thank you. Uh, we will now put items A, C and D. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. We will now put item B. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those against? No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Uh, division called by Councillor Johnson, and I think that was Councillor Strunk. Thank you, Councillor Strunk. Um, yep. As all councillors here in the chamber, we will now put item B. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Show of hands if you don't mind. That's okay, Councillor Cunningham. Those against? No. Abstentions? Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 17 in favour, one against and four abstentions. Okay, item B has passed. Uh, Councillor Allen, please. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 23rd of November 2021 be adopted. Second that. It's been moved by Councillor Allen and seconded by Councillor Hammond that the report of the City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 23rd of November 2021 be adopted. Councillor Allen, is there any debate? Thank you, Mr Chair. Before moving to the committee uh, presentation, I did want to touch upon a general city planning matter and in particular Council, Councillor Adams' comments regarding the City Centre Master Plan and in particular her uh, comments regarding uh, affordable housing and uh, indicating that Councillor Cassidy opposed five storeys in Sandgate Village as part of the neighbourhood planning process. However, Councillor Cassidy interjected and said, I didn't. So this is great to hear that uh, Councillor Cassidy has a position on this. 
because to date he has not submitted feedback or stated his position in this regard. So great to hear Councillor Cassidy. Now moving on to the uh, committee presentation, we had a terrific presentation on uh, Council's public art program. Um, we have a terrific collection and a valuable collection of public art that's displayed around the city. Uh, it's very pleasing to see that this public art collection is growing and that uh, Indigenous artists are being included in that. So all I would say to the Chamber is it is a fantastic uh, collection. Have a look through the presentation and it will be great to see how this uh, is enhanced over coming years. In addition to the uh, public art collection, we had a petition requesting Council alter the placement of the lift closest to the Story Bridge at Howard Smith Wharves, and I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Is there any further debate? Councillor Johnson. Yes, I just rise to speak briefly on um, item A, Council's public art collection. Um, I'm really interested in where the public art might be. In the city? Ah, I guess that's why um, Councillor Allen didn't want to elaborate. Um, there's no public art out my way. Um, and when we tried to get some public art out my way, uh, Council um, has wanted to charge $11,000 to undertake a $2,500 project. Interestingly, I have an update on the bit of public art that is being funded through the Suburban Enhancement Fund, uh, not through capital in the Council budget. Um, but uh, 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 I must thank the Queensland Ombudsman for investigating this matter, and uh, they're continuing to investigate. But Council suddenly had a change of heart as well, which is really good. Um, uh, you know, the Council's policy is pretty clear um, that, uh, unlike what they've been saying for the past nine months, to me, there is no requirement that Council's public art team must do the public art. There is no requirement. Uh, that's exactly what's been said in writing on multiple occasions. Um, there is absolutely no requirement that for small projects like this um, that there have to be multiple quotes and council has to charge fees and all the rest of it. The whole point of council's um, small procurement processes is to ensure that uh, very small projects can be done um, in a cost-effective way. Um, I, I, the last letter I got about this indicated that uh, council is charging a set fee for the delivery of public works over the value of $11,000. Now, I think that probably breaches Council's anti-competitive framework uh, because I don't think Council can charge a set fee for something. Council is required by law um, to charge a fee for service based on the delivery of that service. So the last letter I got has also been sent off to the Ombudsman and I look forward to them reviewing um, whether or not Council's breaching any anti-competitive um, uh, provisions with, response to, uh, with respect to the latest um, response that's come back. But um, over the past nine months, Council's done everything it possibly can to block the delivery of a mural on a toilet block in Heffron Park, Annerley. Um, and it's taken um, repeated complaints, uh, including to outside agencies such as the Queensland Ombudsman, for this council um, to get out of the way and allow the project to continue. Do you know the most entertaining part of this? Council went out uh, to the artist and, and the last advice to me was, we have to check whether or not the original quote from February is still an accurate quote. February, that's when the quote came in. Uh, and they went out to the artist and she came back and said, oh, paint's gone up a little bit. It'll be $2,600. This is a project that council wanted to charge $11,000 to deliver. It's a disgrace um, that this is going on. I hope that the Ombudsman's investigation shed some light on the practices of the public art team. Um, I, for one, have been appalled by what's happened this year um, for the delivery of such a small and valuable project to a park upgrade in Tennyson Ward. Um, it, it does not reflect, uh, in my view, uh, value for money from Council. It doesn't reflect um, 
the idea of trying to improve uh, and beautify our urban pocket parks. And it's incredibly disappointing that council hops up here and claims to be doing brilliant work on public art um, when that's clearly not the case in the suburbs. And even where we attempt to do it as councillors through the Suburban Enhancement Fund, this council blocks genuine and legitimate attempts to undertake public art, and that is disgraceful. Any further speakers? Councillor Allen. All right, we'll now put both items A and B. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, please, Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. Uh, Deputy Chair, I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday, 23rd November 2021 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Davis and seconded by Councillor Mackay that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability, Stain, uh, sorry, Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 23rd of November 2021 be adopted. Councillor Davis, is there any debate? Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. On Tuesday, we had a presentation outlining the progressive delivery of the City Botanic Gardens Master Plan. The City Botanic Gardens were opened in 1828 and are considered one of Brisbane's most treasured parks. In 2015, the City Botanic Gardens Master Plan was released and identified ways to best showcase the garden's heritage values and protect them for future generations. Since the release of the Master Plan, the Shrenner Council has made a range of upgrades and of particular interest to the committee on Tuesday uh, with the eight upgrades to the New Hills Avenue and Children's Boardwalks. The new boardwalks were constructed to provide access to all abilities to this significant area of the gardens. Specialised equipment and techniques were used to preserve the integrity of the root structure while safely constructing the boardwalks without disturbing the heritage vegetation. Significant upgrades were also made to the garden's irrigation system, including smart irrigation infrastructure. <laughs> This will enable the rationalisation of water use and conservation of water into the future, ensuring that the gardens remain green and healthy during all conditions, including drought. New and refurbished bench seating has also been installed throughout the gardens, including 44 bespoke design benches and the removal of 20 old benches that had reached the end of their asset life. Seven drinking fountains were also removed and replaced during the project. Deputy Chair, the delivery of the City Botanic Gardens Master Plan will ensure the river edge and outdoor spaces in the gardens are safe, inclusive and provide opportunities for recreation, reflection, entertainment and learning. And I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Is there any further debate? Councillor Johnson. Yes, yeah, so I rise to speak on item A, the City Botanic Gardens um, Master Plan. Um, this report leaves out one important aspect of um, the Botanic Gardens, which is lighting. Um, for safety purposes. And Councillor Davis is still fairly new in this place, but it's an issue I've raised in here many times, including um, when this uh, master planning process first started many years ago. Um, it's still concerning to me that lighting and safety issues are not being considered. Um, I don't know if that's just because the report um, leaves them out or that they're just not being addressed, um, but uh, lighting is a big issue. Um, I know that there are still lighting problems in the Botanic Gardens because I was at the, um, uh, the art show in the gardens uh, earlier this year and there were thousands of people wandering around the Botanic Gardens in the dark. It was dead set dark. You could not see between art installations. I had to get my phone out and turn my torch on so that I could find my way around. Um, so I am very concerned that lighting issues have not been properly addressed um, as part of the uh, process, um, and I think that they should be. Uh, we have a huge amount of people who work and live in the city. Um, we're going to have another bridge coming straight across. Uh, people use it for, as a thoroughfare to go through over, um, over the bridge to uh, South Bank as well. Um, and it is particularly concerning to me that uh, lighting to make sure we have safe and accessible pathways um, isn't being addressed and it's not even being referenced in this report. That is an oversight and it needs to be corrected. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Davis, write a reply? No? We'll now put uh, item A. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Councillor Marks, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. Um, I move that the report of the City Standards Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 23rd of November 2021, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Marks and seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the City Standards Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 23rd of November 2021, be adopted. Councillor Marks, is there any debate? Uh, just one um, presentation that we had on the spatial systems used in um, city standards, a committee presentation which was very enlightening. It was very, um, uh, there was a lot to it, and I know that the officer was a bit disappointed we had to cut some of the slides out because there was so much and there was a lot of questions um, from the committee. So I'm happy to bring back further reports on it um, as time requires, uh, as time allows next year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Marks. Is there any debate? Any further debate? No, Councillor Marks, right reply? No. We'll now put item A for the City Standards Committee report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Councillor Howard. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I move that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 23rd of November 2021, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Howard and seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 23rd of November 2021, be adopted. Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Just before moving to the report, I just want to advise the Chamber on some of the fantastic things that have been happening around Brisbane um, this week. Uh, Councillor Mackay and I attended the Brisbane Movie Makers Short Film Awards at the fantastic Elizabeth Theatre, and it was just brilliant to see um, these wonderful short films um, being presented, and uh, it's, a, it's a local group that meets in uh, Councillor Mackay's area, but it was a fantastic evening and we had awards. It was almost like the Academy Awards. We had to open an envelope and hope that we got the right, uh, the right one, and of course uh, it, it was uh, very good to see uh, these um, um, movie makers being able to have that particular showing. So that was um, fantastic. I also want to mention um, Gerard Bargo's art exhibition that uh, I attended on the weekend and uh, Councillor Shri was there as well. Again, another fantastic way to let some of our um, local artists uh, put their works on display. Uh, the Queensland Ballet introduced um, a, a ballet called uh, Dracula, which was very, very popular with young people. And so, again, you know, it's, uh, it's our local artists that are sort of certainly sort of trying to make the most of what we can, um, of what we can do with, within the, the city. So, um, Brisbane Living Heritage Network met at Magunya and had their Christmas uh, event. And again, showcasing um, the marvellous historical buildings around uh, Brisbane. And Brisbane Living Heritage Network do a fantastic job. It was uh, wonderful to have all of the organisations that are involved in that uh, coming together at what is a most beautiful um, place such as Magunya. Um, I was then off to a local community drama, which was called The Wickham's Christmas at Pemberthy. And uh, it was, again, um, a wonderful opportunity uh, for a local community um, art group to get together. And um, their performances are extra special. Um, they've, uh, they've been going for quite a number of years, but um, it's always a fun thing to, to go along to that. Um, I also went along to the big summer block party, which was uh, held in Fortitude Valley, and uh, I really want to thank Q Music. It was an opportunity for us, for, for Brisbane City Council, to support all of the artists and all of the live music um, people who are who are there. It was fantastic. We closed uh, we closed off the uh, Warner Street. And um, it was um, a, an ability for us also to um, celebrate uh, Big Sound's 21st birthday. Um, now, Big Sound is an industry festival and we haven't been able to have it for the last two years, but they're planning um, a fantastic event next year. And Q Music has partnered with uh, Council over this year to inject more than $300,000 worth of um, value to our local artists and to put on things such as Valley Fiesta, um, Winter Sounds, and then to end the, the year with this uh, wonderful big summer block party was fantastic. 
And finally, um, Mr Deputy Chair, I, I want to talk about um, the fact that um, I went along to the launch of a wonderful new song called Brisbane River Song, and it was uh, the Brisbane Sings have put it together. Um, it had uh, it was uh, launched uh, at the Grange, so uh, that was uh, wonderful. But Brisbane Sings usually brings together about 500 um, choir people, and of course, with COVID, they've not been able to do that. So they put their head together, and uh, one of their their people who um, put together, who wrote this wonderful song called River Song, and um, Kate Shermer is uh, their artistic director. She wrote the song, which is a fantastic opportunity to talk about Brisbane with its summer storms and its winter westerlies. And of course, there's even a reference to the thank you drivers. And um, everybody was just so excited about that. And um, we again launched it yet again today at the Lord Mayor's um, concert in City Hall. And I was able to pop in just at the beginning and to see everyone just uh, blown away by um, these, uh, these wonderful um, choirs getting together to celebrate all that Brisbane is all about. So I really want to thank each and every one of uh, the people who put their heart and soul into making Brisbane even more special than, than we all think that it is. So it was a, a really sort of a great opportunity today to see the launch of that River Song. So moving to the report, Mr Deputy Chair, uh, we had a committee presentation on the Carindale Library extension. Uh, the library has serviced more than 4.5 million customers since first opening 22 years ago, and it's a much-loved community facility servicing the residents of Carindale and beyond. Uh, to ensure the facilities could meet, com could meet community demand, Council identified an opportunity to acquire the building adjacent to the Carindale Library and to undertake an extension of the library. Uh, the extension has expanded uh, the footprint to, in addition to 460 square metres of floor space and includes the ongoing evolution of library spaces to meet modern needs. In the presentation, we heard about some of the interesting and new additions as a part of the Carindale Library, including the new media conversion station and the makerspace um, area. The presentation kept all of our councillors interested and informed, and many questions were asked throughout. I'd just like to thank Nina for the great presentation and to thank all of our librarians for the fantastic work that they do, and I'll leave the debate to the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Any further speakers? No one rising. Councillor Howard, I reply. We'll now put the report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Councillor Huang, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I move that the report of the Finance and City Governance Committee meeting held on Tuesday, 23rd November, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Huang and seconded by Councillor Owen that the report of the Finance and City Governance Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 23rd of November 2021 be adopted. Councillor Huang, is there any debate? Yeah, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Um, the committee, um, last week's committee, we had a presentation from the Human Resources Manager about Council's Employment Value Proposition, or EVP. And we also had a um, financial report for receivable rates payables, provisions and more, which was discussed in the committee. And I'll leave uh, debate to the chamber. Thank you, Councillor Huang. Is there any further debate? Councillor Johnson. Uh, yes, I rise to speak on item A, the employee value proposition. Um, it's come to my attention that ward office staff are being paid less superannuation than other council employees. Um, this is unacceptable in my um, opinion. Uh, it is extremely concerning um, because for many years uh, staff have uh, our ward office staff have had similar terms or the same terms as uh, council employees employed under the EBA um, but my staff in recent days have discovered that they are being paid less than other council officers this is unacceptable unacceptable our ward office staff um, act uh, as customer service employees uh, at the very coalface of council. Um, they have to deal with people from all walks of life and often in very difficult um, situations. Um, I would like an explanation about why 
uh, council ward office staff are being paid less superannuation than other council employees. Um, to me, uh, this is a slap in the face to those people who are doing a good job, uh, who've worked very hard, many of them in ward offices for a very long uh, period of time. Uh, so uh, this is an issue that my office, that my staff have been talking about it for some, for some days, and uh, it, it strikes me that um, there should not be any difference between uh, superannuation rates for ward office staff and council staff generally. Any further speakers? Councillor Huang, right or reply? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Um, what Councillor Jocelyn has said is, is actually has nothing to do with the presentation last week. However, if uh, she has any questions, feel free to write to the Chair and also you know, feel free to ask during the question time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Huang. We'll now put the, uh, the report, items A and B. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Councillors, are there any petitions? Councillor Howard. Uh, yes, Mr Deputy Chair, I have a petition requesting Council improve the intersection of Brunswick Street, Barnbridge Road and Gregory Terrace, Bowen Hills. Councillor Owen. Thank you. I have uh, 62 signed letters in support of a um, proposed memorial in Calumbar Ward. Councillor Landers, can I have a motion, please? Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration. Can I have a second? Please? Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Cassidy that all petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Councillors, are there any statements required as the result of the Office of the Independent Assessor or Council Ethics Committee order? I see no one standing. Councillors, are there any items of general business? Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I rise to speak on uh, Pratt Awards uh, dinner and also their contributions to the Brisbane's, uh, uh, to Brisbane's char charitable causes. Uh, Mr Chair, I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate Pratt and its CEO, Paul Xu, for a successful awards event and fundraiser on Sunday night. Mr. Deputy Chair, PRED stands for Professional Real Estate Training. They are a professional training organization for those who wish to pursue a career in real estate. On Sunday night, PRED held their annual awards event to celebrate and acknowledge the outstanding achievers in the industry. Lord Mayor Adrian Trina and Lady Maris have both attended, and they were joined by the former Lord Mayor Graham Quirk and Mrs. Ann Quirk as well as Sister Angela Mary of, Martyr, of the Martyr Foundation. Mr Deputy Chair, this year's Pratt Award night, Awards Night was more than just an awards event. The CEO, CEO of Pratt, Paul Xu, has designed the event to include the opportunity for their members to support three very worthy causes in our city. They are Small Step for Hannah, Law Mayor's Travel Trust, and, Martyr, uh, and the Mother Foundation. On the night, a total of $72,880 were raised to support these three worthy organizations. And, like, and I'd like to congratulate and thank Po Xu for his thoughtful kindness in including a fundraiser in the Pred Awards Night to support our local charities. And uh, yep, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Huang. Councillors, as the time is nearing eight... Councillors, as the time is nearing 8 p.m., the meeting will automatically stand adjourned unless we agree to continue the sitting. Is it the will of the Council that this sitting of Council proceed beyond 8 p.m.? All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those against? The ayes have it. The meeting will now continue. Uh, Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, and I just want to speak briefly to give a uh, vote of thanks to 
uh, my regional manager uh, for the East Region, Karen Sweeney. Um, today, Mr Deputy Chair, uh, Karen has notified uh, councillors that she will be retiring uh, at the end of this year. And um, I just wanted to pay my thanks to Karen um, for her service, certainly to the Morningside Ward, uh, but also to council over the past 31 years. Um, Karen has indicated that she is now transitioning to retirement, but um, I wanted to note that I've appreciated um, very much her uh, honesty and integrity uh, and her service to council, as well as her incredible knowledge um, of plants, uh, council processes, playgrounds, uh, you name it, and Karen knows about it. Uh, her ability uh, to give pretty frank and fearless advice on anything and everything to do with council has been much appreciated um, by me in this role. Uh, she's been an incredible asset to council and I wish her very well uh, in her retirement. I would certainly welcome her during retirement to any of my uh, bush care groups or community gardens. Um, I'm sure she still has a lot of value to add, uh, but I know that team will miss her and I just wanted to thank her before we go on the Christmas break this year. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Are there any further items of general business? Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. Um, I rise to speak tonight on about uh, four uh, events that happened uh, over the weekend or from Friday through to the weekend. Um, the first was the Sri Lankan Buddhist Monastery's annual um, cultural concert, which unfortunately was uh, cancelled last year because of, the, uh, because of COVID. Uh, the Buddhist Monastery has been in my, uh, in, in, in my ward uh, and uh, probably for over 20 years. They, they do some terrific job uh, in the community. And uh, I just like, and their, their concert actually happened at the Lighthouse uh, uh, Event Center uh, in Wilgaro Street, uh, which is uh, one of the premier uh, venues for uh, events uh, in my ward. Um, it's a terrific center that was uh, built uh, probably less than 10 years ago and has uh, all that infrastructure that you really need to uh, put on a great concert or event. Uh, there were 23 performances, singing, dancing, and theater as well, actually, uh, which was quite interesting. Uh, cultural theater can be really uh, comical, and, and it was. It was uh, designed and written that way. Um, and it was just good to see the kids being able to perform again um, in their costumes, which are just spectacular. And I said to you, I said to um, the honorary consul for Sri Lanka sitting next to me, Anton, I said, do most of the uh, costumes get imported? And he says, no, nah, they're all made local. Uh, they're all, all the materials are sourced, lo sourced locally pretty much as well. Uh, I'm sure they do import some of the materials. But uh, it, it's just really great just to see that the uh, community is able to go out and, uh, and hold this uh, annual concert that... Uh, that the general community looks forward to. Uh, Milton Dick, uh, the member for uh, Oxley, was there as well, of course, and, uh, and, and it was hosted by Pastor Joshua and his wife, Helen, uh, who um, uh, head up the uh, Hosanna Church, which actually built the, uh, built the center itself. Um, the next uh, item is the Oxley Golf uh, Club uh, opened its uh, mini uh, golf uh, course, actually, called Top Stroke. And uh, I, hadn't, I didn't know what mini golf was until that night. Uh, and uh, Milton and myself went out and uh, tried to putt around it a bit, but uh, neither of us are really good golfers. So uh, uh, we were shown up by, of course, the, uh, the rest of the patrons that were there. Um, the clubhouse also had a major upgrade. So the whole thing cost about two and a half million dollars, which is a great investment when you look at the golf courses that are uh, that were struggling or have been struggling over the number of a few uh, over the few uh, years over the last few years, um, to to find a, a club that actually will invest two and a half million dollars, and they don't have a big membership at this course, but I'll tell you what, for what they're doing, right? And uh, I just want to pay me special mention to Aaron Muirhead, the uh, the general manager, who's only been with with them for around about 18 months, and the turnaround has been spectacular through COVID. Um, and uh, to be able to accomplish all that he did with his team uh, was and was spectacular. And of course, the um, the president there, Glenn Selleck, uh, paid tribute to uh, Alan and his team because uh, Aaron and his team because um, what they've been able to accomplish. They've really transformed a clubhouse that looked very much the 70s with a few upgrades into uh, the 21st century. 
uh, and it's really good, and I'm sure they're gonna build their membership accordingly. Um, the next one was uh, a tree planting that was uh, happening by one of our bush care groups uh, in the uh, Cat Hooper Park. And the reason I wanna mention this is because John Malik, who actually heads up the, uh, the bush care group, he, um, they, they always struggle to try to find uh, enough volunteers to do uh, a large planting. And uh, it was 250 trees. And the, uh, Church of, um, the Church of God Global Volunteer Group, um, which has done a number of uh, uh, projects in my, in my ward, usually litter cleanups. And I know they've done them all, also in the ward of Runcorn and probably others as well. Uh, but this was the first tree planting they undertook as a group in Brisbane, which, is, uh, which we're very honored that they, uh, that they came out and, uh, and helped, our, uh, helped our community. Uh, they were also assisted by the Baha uh, Faith uh, Church as well. They sent along a couple of, um, well, about a half a dozen of their uh, members as well. And why I'm mentioning the Baha Faith, um, I want to make really, I really want a big, a big shout out to uh, Michael Smith, who is uh, heads up the Baha Faith Group out in my ward. They've been um, working with uh, youth and uh, uh, youth at risk now for probably about a half a dozen years. And they have about six team leaders all set up in the various parks around Inala. And they work with the, uh, with the um, refugee uh, uh, children um, that um, can get into a little bit of trouble from time to time if they're not given some, you know, given something else to do. And, uh, and so the, uh, the faith group itself actually does some terrific work. I mean, we do have uh, the Inala Youth uh, Service as well in the area, but... This, this group really works with those uh, emerging, uh, ref emerging refugee groups and the kids, and, uh, the, um, and they do some terrific work with them. I, 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 they, you know, honestly, um, I, I went to, the, um, went to a, a celebration for the, the Bob, which, is, uh, which was a, a birthday uh, for their spiritual leader um, who passed away just on 100 years ago, actually. And, uh, and honestly, the kids all got up and ran the whole thing. The adults didn't go near the microphone. The kids actually are taught how to run. And we, we had 10 readings, we had songs, we had everything. And it went for about two hours and the kids did it all. It's just amazing to see what a group, uh, what an organization like this can do with our, with our youth. Uh, and give them structure and give them purpose. So I just want to uh, make uh, I just want to make special mention again to Michael Smith and his family, who are all involved with this group. Um, they've got a big they've got a big uh, church actually just here at Milton actually, which I've I've been there a couple of times. Quite a substantial uh, facility there, but you know they're they're really hands on. They really are. So I don't know if you've got one of those groups in your area, um, I would engage them because I'll tell you what, they do some wonderful work with the uh, youth. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Strunk. Is there any further general business? Councillor Cumming. Thanks. Uh, I'll be uh, quick. Uh, I'd just like to also pay tribute to Karen Sweeney, uh, who's been uh, the manager for a couple of years of asset service, field service, whatever they're called these days. Uh, she's always been a very straight shooter, very fair, and I'd also have to say, quite frankly, it was good to have a woman in the position because there's been a f lots, lots of men over the years in that position, and I haven't been a fan of some of them, but uh, she, I was a fan of Karen's. Uh, I'd urge her to reconsider, actually, because I reckon she's too young to retire. Thank you, Councillor Cumming. Councillor Johnson. Uh, yes, just briefly on uh, council meeting procedure. Just for some of the newer councillors here, um, I've been thinking about what to do uh, with respect to uh, the LNP councillors voting against um, my request for an extension of time uh, earlier today. Um, the Lord Mayor seemed to imply in his speech uh, that I was asking for something that's not appropriate, but uh, under the rules we can ask for an extension of time. Um, and to be fair, it's you know they've voted down my request for extension of time previously, but as Councillor Cunningham and the Lord Mayor say, we can contribute uh, to uh, the debate on every item. Uh, that's my absolute intention to do so, and I look forward to discussing it next week. And I'll, I'll try and keep it up as long as I can. Um, there's a time, probably going about a, about a decade ago now, Margaret DeWitt was the chair. Um, there's a few councillors here who will remember this. Um, Councillor DeWitt used to say that I could only speak about what was in the report, 
So I took to reading the reports. That went on for about six months. So just say to the LNP councillors, the easy way to do this is you could be courteous and let me have a few extra minutes to speak about something that I want to speak about, or I'll speak about every single item, seriatim, uh, and thoroughly enjoy doing it. I look forward to the debate next week. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Any further general business? No one's standing. Okay, we'll move to item eight of the report, uh, the continuation of the adjourned motion. Uh, councillors will now move to that adjourned motion, moved by Councillor Cassidy and seconded by Councillor Cook. I'll read, I'll read the motion, Councillor Cassidy, before you rise, if you don't mind. Brisbane City Council commits $200,000 to a jointly funded precinct study with the state government and engage in a community consultation for the potential upgrade of the Banyo Rail Crossing and surrounding road network. Councillor Cassidy, is there any debate? Thanks very much, Deputy Chair. This uh, rail crossing is dangerous and a serious traffic issue for the residents of Banyo and motorists who use this section of road daily um, who pass through the Banyo village area. Uh, it's an area I'm very familiar with uh, as a north sider, and it's no secret that something needs to be done, but this LNP council continues to drag the chain. Uh, we thought last week that they might have made um, uh, a little slip up when they adjourned the motion to the following week, because what the LNP have done in recent uh, recent months is to uh, support our urgency motions and immediately delay them to the end of the meeting. And Councillor Landers, I thought she'd had a few slip-ups uh, in the role as whip, thought she might have accidentally slipped up to put this one uh, an entire week later. An entire week later. Um, however, we do we have figured out why. We have figured out why they wanted a whole week um, to debate this motion rather than doing that last week. Uh, and that's because the local LNP councillor Adam Allen. Uh, not only had to pull together a response for this debate, and certainly hope he's going to contribute to this debate so his community uh, can hear him answer some questions about it, uh, but he also needed time to pull together a fake community consultation uh, on the Banyo Open Level Crossing himself. Because it was only just this week, it was actually last night, that he sent out, we said he was going to send out letters this week to try and get some form of feedback from the community. So up until last week, or actually up until yesterday, Deputy Chair, the local LNP Council, despite running around and saying to the community and saying on, in online forums that he was personally working behind the scenes with TMR uh, to, to, to find a solution to this problem, none of that had happened. It's quite clear none of that had happened. And now the local LNP Council needed to buy himself some time uh, from last week to start putting out some consultation letters. Well, certainly, certainly say he's going to put them out into the community as well. This rail crossing, which, which crosses council roads and the road network surrounding this rail crossing uh, is entirely controlled by council, um, has been an issue for years and years and years now. Uh, and it's only now that this LNP councillor has bothered, or at least said he's going to bother to consult with local residents about it. So it's such a shame, Deputy Chair, that it takes a Labor state member, the Labor, the Labor Council, uh, on this side of the chamber, we'll take, we'll take the Lord Mayor's uh, definitions of that, the Labor Council on this side of the chamber and residents all working together to drag this LNP administration kicking and screaming to actually at least talk about doing something and hopefully they will do something. So this, what's, what's more embarrassing, I think, uh, Deputy Chair, is that they use this spontaneous community consultation to promote themselves again, of course, and every letter that went out, of course, featured photos of not just Councillor Allen, but the Lord Mayor as well, claiming that, that they, they were the, that's right. All of a sudden, the Lord Mayor's uh, involved in that as well. So you can't, I mean, you really can't make this stuff up, Deputy Chair. But the state government are sitting there with their funding ready to go uh, to get this project moving, but this LNP administration are sitting on their hands holding this process up uh, and now pretending to care about community consultation only well and truly after the fact, Deputy Chair. So this local LNP councillor, as I said, initially tried to save face with the community by claiming that he was in fact working with TMR and the state government on this proposal that uh, the state member has recently talked about. And he told 
He told his constituents that there was some vague arrangement between the Lord Mayor and the Transport Minister, but this is simply not true. And I have here a, minister, a letter from uh, minister, the Minister for Transport and Main Roads, uh, Mark Bailey, uh, which I'll table shortly. And this letter is to the State Member for Nudgee, Lee and Leno, and outlines there is no such agreement in place, uh, and in fact there never was. Uh, it says in here the Queensland Government continues to work with the Australian and local governments to prioritise critical level crossings, station and park and ride upgrades. Last year, this is the letter from Minister Bailey, he says, last year I wrote several letters to the Right Honourable the Lord Mayor of Brisbane, Councillor Adrian Schrinner, BCC, to invite BCC to jointly fund a feasibility study to undertake a strategic analysis of the Banyo Rail Station precinct, including the St Vincent's Road level crossing and to address community concerns about intersection safety and local road congestion. The study was estimated to cost $400,000, with the Queensland Government agreeing to contribute $200,000, subject to BCC matching the contribution. To date, my offer to the Lord Mayor in my most recent letter of 22 September 2020, seeking BCC support to equally contribute to the feasibility study, had not been agreed to by BCC. So they can confirm here that Councillor Allen has been telling Porkies out in the community that there is the council has not been working with the state government, and I will table that letter. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, that confirms that the state, that the, the Brisbane City Council, this this Schrinner administration here in council, has not been working with the state government to come up with a solution um, to this problem here. And in fact, all uh, that the local LNP councillor has been doing um, has been playing politics on this issue locally. So it's appalling that this local LNP councillor would first first spread mistruths then drum up fake community consultation at the 11th hour and continue, all the while, Deputy Chair, continuing to block any process, any progress rather, on this rail crossing upgrade. So this LNP, what we know now is this LNP Council is refusing to match the state government's funding of $200,000. Uh, they're refusing to cooperate in any way with this feasibility study where funding is sitting on the table. And they're running around somehow claiming uh, through their local LNP representative councillor, Adam Allen, uh, that they're doing their own, their own study on their own roads, which is in isolation, in complete isolation from the open level crossing, which is the real problem out there. So what this LNP Lord Mayor and this LNP councillor for Northgate need to do is to put up or shut up when it comes to the Banya open level crossing. There is a yes, really, yes, really. People are sick and tired. People are sick and tired of this LNP administration, which has been in for 20 long years, 20, 20 long years of doing nothing, doing absolutely nothing about upgrading and fixing that Banyo open level crossing. So what this LNP administration city hall needs to do is stop spending so much time and money on advertising themselves and advertising apps. Uh, and, and shoving living in Brisbane newsletters into people's letterboxes uh, and actually start getting on with the job at hand. Uh, residents of Brisbane deserve so much better than what this LNP administration is dishing up to them day in, day out, Deputy Chair. Yeah. Are there any further speakers? Thank you, Mr Deputy Chairman. I rise to speak against this motion. And firstly, big round of applause for Councillor Cassidy. <laughs> Wonderful fairy tale. Congrats. I was fully entertained for the almost 10 minutes that you spoke. I love that story. That work of fiction was so good, you should seriously take up writing because your time in this chamber is wasted. Look, Mr Deputy Chairman, before beginning, I have to say to Councillor Cassidy, I really feel very sorry for him. I really do. He's in a terrible position as leader of the opposition because last week, last week we were all talking about how potentially Councillor Cook was going to take over the leadership from him. This week, he's got to stand up. Point of order, Mr. Chair, <laughs> Mr. Deputy Chair. Point of order, Councillor Strunk. I don't think uh, what uh, Councillor Maddock is saying has anything to do with the motion. So, could you bring him back to the motion, please? Can we draw it back to the motion? I, I was just about to, but I thank Councillor Strunk for his comments. And this week, the poor, poor leader of the opposition have to stand here with his prepared speech with his letter from the minister, which was dated the 20th of November of this year, in preparation for last week, perhaps, when you were going to debate the whole thing? 
and then and have to put up this furphy. And the, the, the saddest part of all is that he knows it's a furphy. He knows that this whole thing is nothing more than just an ALP political stunt. Because, Mr Chairman, Mr Deputy Chairman, you have to actually look at the history of this entire matter, going back to 2004, with the then Lord Mayor Campbell Newman, the can-do man, over 2004 to 2008, invested so much of Council's resources into that level, into that Banyo Crossing precinct to try and solve the problem. He actually came forward with three different proposals at the time, over an overpass, road improvements. He threw literally everything and the kitchen sink at it, and it was knocked back by the community and politically supported, sorry, politically opposed by the then councillor, Kim Flesser. Good old Kim. Kim, who didn't want anything to, to ruin the local community. He supported the concerns of residents around the local shopping precinct and whatever else they were concerned about, but didn't actually come up with any solutions. He was Labor, yes, he was an ALP councillor who at the time decided that he'd rather play the politics than find the solution. And so he came into this chamber at various times. He wrote to his local community, Mr Chair, Mr Deputy Chair, with his own correspondence about the overpass, making it quite clear that he did not support what was then the $100 million proposal, $100 million of council funds at that time, to solve the Banyo, over, uh, the Banyo, Banyo precinct pro problem with an overpass. Not 200,000, not 400,000, but $100 million back in about 2008, 2009. And the answer was no from the local councillor who chose not to participate in that process. He brought a motion to this chamber on his own solution, which wasn't, couldn't have been supported by the officers. He, looked, he spoke about widening roads and doing other crazy things as he did. That, his solution was right up there with Gambusia. And I know that the <laughs> chairman is sitting outside. His favourite topic is Councillor Flesser and his solution to the mosquitoes in his ward by infesting the waterways with the pest fish. That's the brilliance of what Councillor Flesser spoke about. And then, because his particular proposal was, was not supported, which technically couldn't have been supported, we literally, from 2008, 2009, heard nothing from him on the Banyo Crossing right up to when he ran full term in 2016. And then Councillor Allen came in. So, so much for the ALP and their genuine concern for that area. So much for the local councillor and all his supposed efforts to find a solution between council and government. Everything that council could put towards this problem was put towards it. And the answer from the local councillor was no. He didn't even go out to fight for it. He didn't go out to even look for solutions. He didn't stand there with Campbell Newman and go, OK, we're on opposite sides, but let's agree on this. Let's find a solution. The answer was no. And it was 100 million, it wasn't 200,000, it wasn't 400,000, it wasn't a study, it was a solution. So then, Mr Chairman, we get to the 20th of March 2020, where we get a letter from the Minister to uh, Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner, and this is the fascinating part. So he offers $200,000, he sets the criteria, and then for that particular 200,000 plus the, alleged, the, the, the extra 200 he wants from Council, this is what he's going to do. I'm going to, he wants a proposal to look at providing an enormous study of all the precincts. This is how wide it's going to be. The study will deliver a thorough and strategic analysis of the Banyo Rail Station precinct, including the St Vincent's Road level crossing, local street network, traffic and pedestrian movements, precinct and rail station accessibility, so he wants the money for QR for the rail station, bus and rail operation, so he wants the money again for more work for QR active transport connections, park and ride facilities. So he wants the 400,000, he wants money from council, again for a state government asset, and get this, potential station improvements. I note a great separated rail overpass is not intended to be in the scope for this project. So the very problem, the rail, the rail crossing, the Banyo precinct, all of the very issues that are generating these problems are not on the table. Don't want to know about it. Let's just look for something else that's cheaper that council can carry. And on top of that, let's take council's money and put it into a QR asset. Let's have a look and see what other things we can do to improve the rail station. Oh, and by, by the way, we'll also look at the road network around the site. $400,000 for that. And he wouldn't even commit to it unless council suddenly put in two hundred. dollars So here's two hundred. dollars Oh, by the way, council, here's a gun to your head. Give me the other two hundred, dollars And if you don't, you're the bad guy. 
So they set the rules, they set the terms, they set what's in and out, and then they tell us that we'll do you a favour by taking you $200,000. And if you don't, it's your fault. So, what did the Lord Mayor do? He responded appropriately and informed the Minister of the background of the work that was undertaken between 2004 and 2008, of the unacceptable solution by Councillor Flesser. And then the Lord Mayor said, but let's move forward. We've done a substantial amount of work in this area. We've literally covered it every which way we possibly can. We will provide TMR with all the reports. We will give your officers a briefing on anything they need to assist you in this study. So we're doing the work for them already. And then the Lord Mayor makes the suggestion that we should include Queensland Rail. Because, get this, Mr Deputy Chairman, in March 2017, I understand QR confirmed that more trains would be travelling through the local Banyo community due to the, st to the stabling yard that QR constructed at the Banyo Rail Station. While Council does not have access to the feasibility and planning studies that Council assumes would have been done as part of this $116 million rail stabling program, you may like to consider QR assisting, both through participation and in co-funding of TMR's Banyo Rail Station feasibility study. Sounds perfectly reasonable. The answer from the Minister was no! He actually came back and said, oh, no, no, we're going to go with what we've got and we're waiting on your $200,000. And then nothing happened. So Minister Bailey sits there and again sets the terms, but cares so little that he doesn't actually do anything. Now, when you think about the feasibility study, and it's really important when he talks about accessibility and potential station improvements, because the then state member in September of 2020, Leanne Lennard, does a Facebook post where she says, in case you missed the news recently, Banyo Station is getting an accessibility makeover. Station is set to receive a new lift, raised platform sections, new security cameras and lighting to improve commuter accessibility. So at one point, the minister asks in April of 2020 for money, and then in September 2020, they actually deliver the accessibility there. So they want money to do an accessibility study as part of the overall strategy. And then, oh, by the way, here it is. So they've already done the work. It's a furphy, Mr Deputy Chairman. They talk about wanting to deliver these outcomes, but they don't really want to. And then we have the state member, Leanne Lennard, who says that since 2015, since she was elected, she's been very concerned about this local issue. And in recent budget, in 2020, she was able to get $200,000. So you're talking about a state government with literally billions of dollars within the budget. And congratulations, state member, you've worked so hard. It took you five years to get $200,000 and not to actually deliver anything, but to do a study. And again, Brisbane City Council, we want you to come along because she couldn't get the $400,000 for the study. No, 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 council's got to deliver. If council doesn't bring the $200,000, this thing's not on. And then she has the temerity to write to Councillor Allen saying to him, it's time to take the politics out of this and let the community's voice be heard. That's on the 1st of October of this year, Mr Chairman. So all the politics sitting right here, and she says it's time to take the politics out. And you know what? She's right. It is time to take the politics out. It's time to take the politics out by Minister Bailey. It's time to take the politics out by, by Leanne Lennard. It's time to take the politics out by Councillor Cassidy. It's actually time to come to the table and deal with this in a real way, like Councillor Allen is doing. The work that he and, and, the, and the Chair, Councillor Wines, were already preparing. The work that Councillor Wines spoke to you about in this chamber last week, which you chose to ignore. All of the work that's being done around the East Precinct, the West Precinct next Councilor week. Councillor Maddock, your time has expired. Oh. Any further speakers? Councillor Wines. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair, Mr Deputy Chair. I rise to also contribute to this, and I thank the contribution of uh, Councillor Maddock, uh, who made so many uh, accurate points about this proposal. Uh, he rightly recognises that Council is already doing a great deal of work in this neighbourhood, that the Royal Parade East Precinct will, be, will occur this year, the work at that intersection will occur this year. We're preparing work on Royal Parade West. There will be consultation both led by the Councillor and done by Council officers to prepare work going on in the future for that very intersection. I note with interest some of Councillor Cassidy's points, and um, I, I had uh, the deep sense that when this urgency motion was moved last week, there was a bit of a stitch up. But I didn't realise that the person being stitched up was Councillor Cassidy. <laughs> um, his argument today was that we should build an open level crossing. 
and, and every piece of correspondence from the state government rules that out. And the vast bulk of his contribution today was about an, an increase in improvement, a, a massive overpass, and they are explicitly rejected. Here, Leanne Linard, 1st of October, while residents have understandably previously rejected an overpass due to the resultant loss of the shopping precinct, resumption of local homes, likely increase in truck traffic, and for the people of Banyo, and indeed all ratepayers who use the road, want us to seek an alternate solution. The Minister. In his letter, dated the 12th of March 2020, I note a grade-separated rail overpass is not intended in the scope of this project. Yet that was fundamentally what Councillor Cassidy was arguing for for his whole presentation, was that, was that the people of Banyo deserve uh, this, this rail overpass to be addressed. Also, interestingly, the correspondence from, the minister, from Minister Linard speaks to traffic congestion. I'm writing again, she says, I'm, she says, I'm writing again to raise with you ongoing problems of traffic congestion in Banyo. And she explicitly rejects what Councillor Cassidy proposes. Now, I appreciate that Councillor Cassidy seeks to make this some sort of new beams road. I, I appreciate he's trying to make that link. But um, we are already doing work in this space. We did a study Councillor Maddock rightfully recognised that th this council did a study and proposed a huge solution to this and a number of options which did in fact include an open level crossing, uh, a, an overpass at the open level crossing and a number of other locations. This was actually last, no, two decades ago in the mid to late 2000s. That was campaigned against heavily by the Labor councillor, Councillor Flesser, for the objective I believe, undermining the then Lord Mayor Newman and promoting Councillor Flesser's position, a position he held tenuously for many years, but he did hold on by, the, by his fingernails across a number of elections till he gave up knowing that the wave was coming for him. Now, what that wave meant that, was, that would have taken out Councillor Flesser, with it, I have no doubt Councillor Allen would have beaten him, was the fact that we as an organisation, we as a council, are doers, are doers while the Labor, the Labor team, they want to do studies and they want to, do, uh, and they want to undermine proposals. That, that's effectively what a Minister Linard and Councillor Flesser did for many years. Uh, now, this proposal, the, the reality of the proposal that uh, Minister Linard puts forward to us is yet again another study, while we at Council are already doing the work. Um, I would argue that, that this proposal by the Minister is once again an attempt to postpone work for the community to, to, under, the, under the guise of a study and, as Councillor Maddock rightly identified, a threat to Council that if you don't cooperate, we'll embarrass you, that if we do not cooperate with their study, they will say that we don't uh, want to address traffic congestion in that particular neighbourhood while we actually are, right at this moment, doing work for them. So I just... I, I, that was an inter interesting interjection by Councillor Mackay, but why does the Labor Party work so hard to keep Banyo down? That's a serious question. Why do they work so hard to keep that community, which is a very, very nice Brisbane community, they have their own sort of um, uh, village out there, uh, their own little enclave, uh, that is a wonderful place, and, and many people move to Banyo as both first home buyers and will never leave because it is such a nice place to live. But why does Labor work so hard to keep them down? Why does the minister wish to postpone work that we're already doing? It's a fair question. And similarly, why does the Leader of the Opposition come to this place and put forward a proposal that none of the state, uh, none of the state figures that, that I imagine he's working as a surrogate for have proposed? It doesn't make any sense. Once again, I say this council is committed to doing things. And, and we have already committed, uh, completed studies in this area some decades ago. And as a result, I'm going to move an amendment as soon as I can. I would now be moving an amendment. I've not done this from this side before, so excuse me. I'm sending it, I'm sending it through. Let's see how we go. Now, that's been sent through to the team. Let me know when it comes through, but I will read it. The proposal is, the amendment would, the amendment would be to remove the words, commits $200,000 to a jointly funded, and adds the words, adds the words 
to support A after the words precinct study and removes the words engage in and, and fourth adds the words provide our reports from past before community consultation so that it will read Brisbane City Council commits to support a precinct study with the state government and provide our reports from past community consultation for the potential upgrade of the Banyo rail crossing and surrounding road networks. Second. So we have an amendment to the motion moved by Councillor Wines and seconded by Councillor Landers that Brisbane City Council commits to support a precinct study with the state government and provide our reports from past community consultation for the potential upgrade of Banyo Rail Crossing and surrounding road network. Council Wines. Thank you. To the amendment, I uh, propose this amendment to the council because I believe that it better reflects the true state of things. It better reflects our council's long-standing commitment to this community and the work we've already done, which is substantial. It has, in fact, been offered to the Department of Transport already. Uh, I'm reading from a letter from uh, the Lord Mayor to the Minister Bailey. And I'm quoting, I have asked for all of the 2004 to 2008 studies that Council undertook to be provided to your department. I've also asked for Council officers to offer a briefing to your department representatives on those studies so as to facilitate their understanding. Uh, close quotes. This Council is already proposing to work with the state. On this. We are providing, once again, just like Beams Road, we're coming in with our technical expertise to save the day. Yes. Um, you know, when you look at state projects, the amount of times that council is required to sort of be the cavalry that saves the day is too, too often. Uh, this, morning's, um, this morning's committee heard of our work on Lindham Rail Crossing, paid for by the federal government, completed by council. All of it should have been done by the state. Yeah. All of it should have been done by the state. But we, but we do it because it's the right thing to do. Um, but the problem is, is when you start, when, when other people start demanding the, the, what the limited, the comparatively limited ratepayer dollar that we receive to achieve an outcome for another level, that's when it becomes, in my opinion, wrong. So the work done by Lindham was a federally funded work done by the City Council. So Council can do the work, but why would the state choose to, in the words of Councillor Maddock, hold a gun to our head like this? Why would Councillor Cassidy frame it this way? We are always prepared. We've offered a whole range of things, whether it be reports from the last decade undermined by former Councillor Flesser, uh, uh, ongoing commitments, um, but even here, you know, you look at Leanne Linard, Minister Linard's uh, paperwork about Banyo Crossing in her November 2021 newsletter. Even there, she speaks to addressing traffic congestion created by her open level crossing, the Queensland Rail, Queensland Government open level crossing. Um, you know, uh, reading again from her newsletter, unfortunately there are no easy solutions. As a long-term resident, I, remem I remember the heated town hall meeting in 2007 when then Lord Mayor Newman put forward proposals to build an overpass and redu to reduce congestion. An idea rejected by the public at the time uh, went offered to them, yet once again the Leader of the Opposition either doesn't understand the issue or was badly informed by people who should have had his interests, had a better example, but better his, his interests at heart, rather than send him in uh, not understanding what it was that, that the minister was actually asking for. That's why, uh, once again, we will be, as I say, we, we often save state labour through our works. Beams Road is an example where we've saved them. Lindham's an example where we've saved them. And here today, I'm happy to move this, um, this proposal to assist Councillor Cassidy to once again save him from the lack of information provided to him by uh, his state colleagues. Um, we continue to support traffic congestion reduction initiatives in Banyo, no doubt, right? Uh, and we are working and we are more than happy, more than happy to provide our technical skill and historic uh, investigations, which are substantial to the department. That, that offer is actually 18 months old and still stands. So we want to see some action because that's what this group of people is all about. That's what the Brisbane City Council administration is all about. It's about action on combating traffic congestion, not studies. It's about doing something. And that's why we're going to put, put forward this proposal today. And one more point before I yield the microphone. Spending money is not an action, right? That argument will come in time later tonight. Spending money is not an action in itself. You have to actually do something for the public for the greater good to actually combat it and, and, and spending money on a study does not actually materially benefit the people of Banyo. Thank you, Councillor Wines. Further Just speakers a point to of the order, amendment? Chair. A point of order? Point of order or you're speaking to the amendment? No, I just said point of order, Chair. 
Uh, section 40 of the Meetings Local Law about amending a motion uh, says that amendment to a motion shall be in terms which retain the identity of the original motion. Uh, the original motion talks about a very specific um, jointly funded precinct study uh, and community consultation. Uh, that's what this motion is about. If the, if the LNP want um, uh, to move a separate motion, they can do that, Chair. Uh, but Council Wine's amendment doesn't retain um, the intent, uh, doesn't retain uh, the, the motion in terms which, sorry, retain the identity of the original motion, which talks specifically about a feasibility study. Uh, so this amendment shouldn't proceed. Councillor Wines. Point of order to you, um, Mr Chair. I would argue that... Sorry, 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 sorry. you have I to, deal to deal with, with the point, point of order, order first. first. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Um, I honestly believe, listening to the argument, that this motion is around participation, and this is what this amendment is offering. Given that there is substantial information that the Council is willing to facilitate to the State Government for that, I'm willing um, to agree that the intent of this motion stands. Councillor Wines? No further comment. Thank you. Councillor uh, Cassidy. Well, in that case, I'll speak on the amendment. Uh, and this is a do-nothing amendment, um, because uh, what Councillor Wines is talking about, he, he either knows um, what I'm about to say, or he is extremely ill-informed in his role. But all of those studies uh, are already in um, TMR's possession. That, that has already been done. Everything that Councillor Wines just talked about um, has already been done, and therein lies the problem. Uh, what we heard from um, Councillor Maddock over there, and I think they actually all made a mistake. You performed much better than uh, Councillor Schrinner. What did you get? Eight votes in the party room. You, they, you should have won that thing. He should have been mayor. To the, uh, he to absolutely the should have Councillor been mayor, Cassidy, deputy chair. To, That was so much better than anything I've seen from that bloke. Councillors, uh, Councillor Cassidy, so to the amendment, what he talked please. About, what Councillor Maddock talked about was, was 2004. He kept talking about the past. Uh, at a time when Brisbane had 500,000 less residents, he keeps harking back to the glory days when he was standing in the barricades with Campbell Newman. That's what he talked about. Uh, what Councillor Wines talked about, uh, he obviously wasn't listening to what I said, because I had no, at no point talked about a grade separated overpass at Banyo whatsoever. Yeah. No, absolutely yeah. not. No. Councillor Wines, we're going to let Councillor Cassidy speak in, in silence. Thank you. Yeah, I let, I let you go. I let you Cassidy, go, uh, with an through the chair, please. Uh, Councillor Wines, uh, what, what I talked about was the open level crossing. I didn't say overpass. I didn't say grade separated. I said there is an open level crossing. It has been there uh, since those. It's been there since the rail line went through those roads. It has been there uh, since 1880. There has always been an open level crossing. That is not in dispute. I didn't talk about building an overpass. You might have heard me say open level crossing and assumed I talked about an overpass, but I certainly didn't. But what, what Council Wines is talking about in this amendment chair is doing absolutely nothing because all that he talks about in the amendment uh, is. Uh, is providing some studies that have already been done. I presume through Councillor Allen's 11th hour a letterbox dropped to some local residents uh, saying from the 29th of November he was going to start some local consultation process uh, that maybe they intend, maybe we don't know, we haven't heard from Councillor Allen yet, maybe they intend on doing some consultation. Uh, but what this was specifically about, and what this amendment uh, now changes, was finding some solutions and taking some action uh, to remedy those problems around uh, the Banyo Open Level Crossing. Uh, listen to me carefully, around the Banyo Open Level Crossing. It exists. It's there. I'm not sure how many times you've been out there, Councillor Wines, through you, Deputy Chair. Thank you. Uh, but what, what we moved and what the LMP supported uh, last week to go to debate uh, was the motion that Brisbane City Council commits $200,000 to a joint funded precinct study with the State Government and engage in community consultation for the potential upgrade of the Banyo Rail Crossing and surrounding road network. It's a State Government train line that runs through Council roads. I don't understand why this LNP administration finds it so difficult uh, to engage uh, in that community consultation. That's what this is talking about. It's talking about finding those solutions. We know that the, open, uh, the overpass solution was rejected, that Campbell Newman's overpass solution was rejected by the community. It's not, it wasn't just rejected by Councillor Flesser. It was overwhelmingly rejected by that community. 
Uh, and that's why no one has been talking about an overpass in Banya. It would absolutely destroy that community. Uh, we all know that. Um, but where you've got an LNP council administration, even behind closed doors, and that's proof in all of the correspondence, even behind closed doors, is seeking to stymie this project, uh, and then out in the public, uh, out in the public puts out, Councillor Allen's got his um, flyer there on the desk, goes and puts out that and says they're doing something about it, uh, while, while trying, to, trying to stop a coordinated approach which takes all the council's previous studies, all the council's previous studies, uh, and works with TMR and Queensland Rail in identifying solutions to all those problems around that open level crossing, and then engages the community. Are we supposed to believe? So this this is the the Schrinner administration's idea of community consultation. We've just heard today was, you know, um, one one example is a Facebook poll on on Adrian Schrinner's LNP Lord Mayor page. That's their idea of co comprehensive community consultation. Uh, another one. Uh, is to, we've seen at the East Brisbane Bowls Club over at Mowbray Park, where they don't like what the community says, they go and alter. They go and alter the results of that and remove things from uh, the report on community consultation. So how can the, how can the people of the Northgate Ward and, and Banyo trust Councillor Allen's so-called community consultation won't do those things, won't ignore what that community wants? What this motion was about is bringing council together with the state government to find those solutions to fix that problem. And again, after all these years, after all these years, we see the LNP standing in the way once again. You know, Councillor Wine says Councillor Allen rode in on some great wave, uh, some great wave in the 2016 and 2020 election. I, from memory, it was a couple of hundred votes, a couple of hundred votes. And I don't recall him winning a single booth in the Banyo area. Uh, and I wonder why, when he stands in the way of uh, local upgrades like this. I think your time is coming, Councillor Allen, through you, Deputy Chair, uh, and, so, and so are the rest of yours as well, uh, because this is just more evidence that you continue to ignore the community. You don't really care about genuine community consultation, and you're not actually genuine about finding a solution to this. You'd rather tinker around. Uh, with motions and say, oh, well, we'll do something. We'll send you some reports that you have already got, and then and then the LNP can say that that box is ticked. We've done all we can uh, to fix this problem. Uh, it's not what the people of Brisbane deserve. It's not what the people of the Northgate Ward deserve. Uh, but unfortunately, until 2024, I'm pretty sure that's what they're going to get. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Further speakers on the amended motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. I rise to uh, to join the debate. <clears throat> Since being elected in March 2016, I have been aware that the Banyo rail crossing and the surrounding roads are a challenging location. There are opposing giveaway signs and traffic movements that cause confusion. Unfortunately, many of the challenges around the rail crossing are exacerbated by poor driver behaviour. They do not observe the road rules, particularly related to giveaway signs, and do not use their indicators. Additionally, there is congestion that occurs when trains are active at the station. This gives rise to long delays and exacerbates the issues I've already mentioned. Most of the challenges at the rail crossing have been in existence for decades and to some extent have been come, become more pronounced over time. A range of potential improvements have been considered in the past, though these have been rejected by the community or not supported by Council's traffic officers. One thing that is apparent is that the state rail crossing is a key contributor to a number of the issues at and around the rail crossing. And just tonight, Councillor Cassidy said, and I quote, the open level crossing is the real problem out there. How true that is. It is the key contributor to congestion and creates key safety issues with vehicles, pedestrians and trains at the same grade. It has been evident for many years that the best outcome is a grade-separated solution to remove the rail crossing. While an overpass has not been supported in the past, there are a number of options that could be considered to eliminate or relocate the rail crossing or deliver a grade-separated solution. Unfortunately, the state, despite holding the seat of Nudgee for the past four decades, or for most of the past four decades, has not committed to removal or relocation of the state rail crossing. This is despite progressing similar projects in um, Castledine and Coopers Plains. Accordingly, it has been left to Council to maintain and enhance the road environment 
where possible. We've improved the line markings and undertaken a review of the pedestrian crossing lo locations. I've been able to enhance some signage and installed larger giveaway signs to aid driver awareness and behaviour. We have made requests to the Department of Transport and Main Roads, seeking bespoke indicator signs and videos at the rail crossing to encourage better driver behaviour. However, these initiatives were not supported. Earlier this year, I requested that Council undertake traffic counts and video at intersections around the rail crossing and further afield to gather data and inform potential improvements around the rail crossing. One such improvement is the realignment and widening of the northbound lane on Royal Parade East near the intersection with Tufnell Road. This will make it easier for cars heading north on St Vincent's Road to continue through while vehicles are turning right onto Tufnell Road. This will improve safety and congestion at this intersection. Another improvement, which is currently the subject of, community feed, of a community feedback exercise, is the potential removal of the through movement from Royal Parade heading south to St Vincent's Road. Now, this is the uh, community consultation letter, and I'm, uh, I guess I'm uh, proud and delighted that uh, Councillor Cassidy thinks that I could gather the data that has informed this um, uh, particular uh, flyer. Sorry, yeah. Councillor Allen, we're debating the amendment to the motion. Okay. Um, so one such improvement is the uh, subject of a community feedback exercise. Um, this is one of the troublesome movements at the intersection. Removal, removement of this movement will improve safety as well as remove a confusing traffic flow and will also take traffic volumes away from the intersection. At this stage, we are seeking community feedback until the end of January and will consider the way forward when we have collated the feedback. Council will continue to look for reasonable improvements to the road network around the rail crossing, though that any change, it needs to be recognised that there are inevitably knock-on impacts that need to be considered. In finishing, I'd like to note that there have been, uh, been considerable debate about the state's proposal to have a jointly funded precinct study. The way forward with consideration of such a study has already been conveyed by the Lord Mayor to the Minister for Transport and Main Roads. The Lord Mayor has proposed that data studies and a briefing be provided to TMR officers by council officers. Now, I am aware that this is occurring. Um, I've never said that I would be involved in this particular deliberation. I've seen the letters between the Lord Mayor and the Minister. I've seen emails between council staff and TMR staff. So I can assure you that the engagement is there. I've never said that I would be engaged. And I think that once this briefing has taken place, we can determine the way forward with respect to any future study. And as Councillor Cassidy indicated tonight, any future study would have to focus on the real problem, which is the open level crossing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Any further speakers on the amendment of the motion? No. Councillor Wines, write a reply. Just briefly, I just wanted to make mention, um, in response to Councillor Cassidy's comments, he quite rightly recognised in his notes that uh, the Brisbane City Council is already cooperating, uh, which asks, which poses the question, why did he put that resolution forward last week if he already knew we were working together, if he already knew that we were doing work in that community? Uh, like, uh, an honest question, if he knew what he said in his earlier speech, why did he point move this order. resolution at all, point knowing order, full Councilor well that we were already... Councillor Wines, point of order, Councillor Cassidy? Claim to be misrepresented. Noted. Councillor Wines? When he knew full well we were already cooperating, and he also, after uh, questions without notice last week, was given uh, an explanation that we're doing quite a bit of work already. Not tinkering, the word he chose, but actual substantive work that will make a material improvement to the people, uh, to the lives, and to the traffic, and reduce the traffic congestion of the people of Banyo, not tinkering, something meaningful and material. Um, Councillor Cassidy knew we were doing that work. He knew that we were cooperating with the state. So the real question, why are we here? Thank you, Councillor Wines. Councillor Cassidy, your misrepresentation. Because it's your job to be here, Councillor Wines. Uh, uh, but what I well, said... That, that's, not a, that's not a point of misrepresentation. That's a misuse of, that, of this, Wines, of this Wines, facility. Councillor Wines, if, if Councillor Wines, Councillor Wines, Councillor Wines. Councillor Cassidy, if you're going to direct any comp, uh, comments to other councillors, please do it through the chair. You've been, uh, Deputy pretty chair good, what you've, I said, you've been pretty good tonight up until now. What I said, Deputy Chair, was that the State Government already had all of the old studies that were done by Council. 
Uh, I certainly didn't say they've been cooperating. Then, then why did you bring this to Council tonight? Lines, let him finish, please. Uh, Councillor well, Cassidy. Have. Council Cam has all of those old studies, uh, and that's not in dispute. Uh, what this motion was about was committing to a new jointly funded you're feasibility study. We're talking about the future, you're not the past, like the LNP. Councillor Cassidy, you, you, you don't debate misrepresentations. Just to the point, please. That's all we're asking. It's not much. Thank you. Now, we will put the new amendment to the vote. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against? No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Adams. Can we please ring the bell, please? As all councillors are in the chamber at the moment, uh, well, the ones that are here anyway, um, all those in favour say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Those against? No. Councillor Cook. Clarks, when you're ready, please read the result. Mr. Chair, Mr. Deputy Chair, the ayes have it. The vote being 15 in favour and four against. The ayes have it. The amended motion is now the substantive motion. Councillor Wines, would you like to speak on the substantive motion? No. No. no? Okay. Uh, Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will rise to speak briefly on the amended motion, and I think the amended motion um, reflects the uh, intent of the, uh, the Lord Mayor's offer to um, the, the Minister. Um, he did indicate that he was prepared to, uh, to share uh, information and reports with uh, TMR officers and that at that point would um, consider the way forward. So uh, I do think that, uh, the, that the motion uh, accurately reflects the, uh, the expectation and uh, I would support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Any further speakers? We will now put the substantive motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Councillors, as that's the last item on the agenda, I declare the meeting closed. <laughs>